Chapter Twenty Seven B of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter Twenty Seven B. Insects Continued. Aerial adaptation is so universal an insect characteristic that but few forms need to be mentioned as of particular interest in this regard. The powers of flight among insects vary astonishingly. Some are slow, bungling flyers, as certain of the Lepidoptera or flies. Others, like the larger dragonflies, are tirelessly on the wing, and the rapidity of their movement has given them a number of colloquial names, such as arrows, devil's darning needles, snake doctors, and spindles, and this, and their general conspicuousness, have given them a wholly undeserved disrepute. Certain flies are also immensely speedy, their compact thorax, powerful musculature, and single pair of very efficient wings, serving to drive them at a rate which, in proportion to their size, is truly remarkable. Thus the horsefly is able to outstrip the swiftest horse. The rate of vibration of the common housefly's wings, which produce approximately the sound of F, has been computed to be about 21,000 times a minute, or 335 times a second, and these figures have been confirmed graphically by Mary, who found that the fly actually makes 330 wing strokes a second, Packard. The wings of insects are never homologous with those of the several vertebrates which have attained flight, the pterosaurs, birds, and bats, for here the wing is always a modified forelimb, whereas in the insect it is merely an expanded and highly modified portion of the body wall. The wings of the ancient insects, such as the Paleozoic cockroaches, were more horny, and that is still true of the four wings of the lowlier orders, Orthoptera, Hemiptera, and Coleoptera. Secondarily they became membranous, and finally the complex organ in its venation and embellishment that we find in the higher types. Insects' wings also differ from those of the vertebrate in their flatness, for the upper and lower surface, with the exception of the beetle's horny forewings or elytra, are practically the same, whereas in the bird especially the upper surface is convex, and the lower one concave. The motion described by the wing also differs, for that of the insect moves in a figure eight, while the bird's motion is simpler. This may be due either to the form of the wing, which when vibrated bends in such a way as to describe that curve, or the motion may be due to the method of articulation of the wing with the body. In many heavier insects, like the beetle, the creature is like a biplane, the wings being quite separate, and in some instances the elytra are not vibrated at all, but are merely supporting planes the hinder membranous wings constituting the motive power. Again, as in the bees, the fore and hind wings are articulated together by a series of hooks, so that they move as one. It is notable that among the swiftest insects, the flies, the creatures are monoplanes, which is equally true of man-made flying machines. A theory proposed by the German savant Gegenbauer for the origin of wings derives them from the leaf-like tracheal gills of which we have spoken, and while certain objections have been raised to this idea, none of them have very serious weight. The only trouble is that there is no living insect known wherein such a gill may be seen in a transitional state of development into a wing, and between the largest and most efficient gill and the smallest structure which could possibly support the animal in flight, there is a material gap. It would seem, therefore, that some intermediate function between respiration and flight is necessary, for while we can readily imagine an overlapping of functions, we cannot conceive of the progressive development of a temporarily useless organ unless by the unproved theory of orthogenetic variation, and this seems inapplicable in the present instance. Such an intermediate function is supplied, however, in insects in which a portion of the gill is devoted to the function of protecting the remaining parts, permitting them to retain their most efficient gill structure, even under rather adverse conditions. Just such an organ may be seen in the gill cover of a species of mayfly common in Illinois, Rithogena manifesta, Eaton. 
This is not the most wing-like gill found in the family, but will show as well as any the tendency of its specialization toward the structure of a wing. Woodworth. In its general form, the character of its venation, the nature of its articulation, and its constant vibratory movement, this gill cover is very suggestive of a primitive wing, and yet it is quite clearly only a differentiated portion of the original tracheal gill. The next stage is represented by the mayfly canis, in which one pair of gill covers has greatly enlarged, nearly lost its own gills, and protects the otherwise naked gills of the following four segments. On the remaining abdominal segments the gills have entirely disappeared. An exactly similar process, but one resulting in two pairs of gillless covers and an entire suppression of all gills in the last molt, would give us the condition of the winged insect, Woodworth. The fact that leaf-like tracheal gills and gill covers are found today entirely upon the abdomen does not preclude the possibility of their former development upon the thorax. If such arose, then, through division of labor, they might shortly be transformed into wings, those upon the abdomen retaining their pristine function of respiration. The development of flight among insects implies, therefore, first, a departure from the old terrestrial habitat into the water. If this were done by a small insect, which was probably the case, the only adjustment necessary would be a reduction in the thickness and firmness of the cuticle, so that the entire body might subserve the respiratory function. The insect was doubtless one of those living in damp situations, such as the present-day Thysanura, Aptera. These forms have retained the ancient habitat and probably have persisted with little change from remote geologic time. With increase in size and consequent muscular development, however, came a thickening of the cuticle and a consequent localization of the respiratory function. Gills arose through a necessary increase of respiratory surface, resulting in outpushings of the thinner portions of the body wall. These, which may be called blood gills, serve to aerate the blood directly through their surface. Their subsequent invasion by tracheae, so that the blood merely acted as an intermediary between the tracheal air and that in the surrounding water, followed, and finally the tracheal gill was perfected. Next came the differentiation of the gill into a respiratory and a protective part, the latter becoming movably articulated with the body to aid in renewing the water over the respiratory gill. The subsequent enlargement of the gill cover to embrace several gills, the suppression of the latter when, at the last molt, the creature re-emerged on land as an adult, the use of gill covers as imperfect wings, and their final perfection as organs of flight complete the process. This implies, of course, a single evolution of flight on the part of a primitive insect, out of which all of the orders, except the Aptera, have subsequently arisen. Other theories of wing origin have been proposed, such as lateral expansions of the dorsal wall of the thorax, which served first as aeroplanes for a leaping form, and subsequently became hinged and muscled but the theory of the tracheal gill origin seems to have the weight of evidence in its favor. Geological History Ancestral Stock The researches of a celebrated Viennese savant, Anton Handlersch, have thrown great light upon the geological history of the insects, and as a result his statements have the weight of high authority. He has demonstrated the primitive character of the trilobites, Paleozoic arthropods, the true position of which was long in doubt and which he holds to have been the original stock out of which arose, as independent phyla, the various arthropodon classes. Out of the trilobites, the crustacea were first differentiated, and from this line arose, in the course of time, all of the gill-breathing shrimp and crab-like forms, together with hosts of lesser allied creatures whose descendants teem in the fresh and salt waters of today. Of the arachnoids, the scorpions also arose from the trilobites through an intermediate eurypteroid ancestry, of which a lone survivor, Limulus, yet lives, the only living gill-breathing representative of the class. The ancient eurypterids of the Ordovician and Silurian were also related to the limuloids, but like the vast majority of the latter, they have entirely ceased to be. Scorpions are especially noteworthy, 
for specimens of paleophonus found in the Silurian rocks of Scotland and England, and Proscorpius, from the Silurian of New York, are the first recorded relics of air-breathing animals. The myriapods are seemingly difficult of derivation from the trilobites, and yet there are certain carboniferous myriapod-like forms, which suggest relationships between the two groups even here. However, the insects may not have been derived out of the myriapods, as the latter, despite many insect-like features, are too highly specialized to be ancestral to them. Nor could any known group of true crustacea be considered ancestral. But as certain trilobites, such as Aeglina, have a head much like that of an insect, together with other likenesses, and no prohibitive differences, a relationship may be assumed. Thus Handlersch derives the primitive insects out of a trilobite of amphibious habits, and with a number of similar segments, of which the second and third thoracic ones bore extensions of the pleura, or side-pieces, which eventually developed into wings. Primal Insects Out of this trilobite stock arose the Paleodictyoptera, the most primitive, in fact the stem forms, of all existing insects. These appear first in the Carboniferous, and are thus described, Insects of primitive organization, with a relatively small head, bearing masticating mouth-parts. The three thoracic segments were similar, the second and third bearing nearly equivalent wings, the venation of which was primitive. These wings were apparently incapable of being folded backward over the abdomen, their motion being limited to the vertical plane. In addition to these wings, another pair, rudimentary in character, were sometimes born on the first thoracic segment. The abdomen consisted of ten similar segments, which often bore lateral lobes, sometimes serving as tracheal gills, in addition to which a pair of long circe were born on the terminal segment. The legs, of which there were the normal insect number of six, were similar and adapted for walking. These archaic insects were probably all carnivorous, their young being aquatic in habit, and developing into the adult state without a complete metamorphosis, that is, without a quiescent pupa stage. Transitional Orders The Carboniferous saw the rise and passing of this group, and also the origin from certain of its members of the varied transitional types, which were in turn to evolve into the modern orders. These were also comprehensive, or synthetic types, combining in certain instances the characteristics of the several orders to which they eventually gave rise. Such, for instance, were the protodonata, intermediate between the paleodictyoptera and the orthoptera, or dragonflies, the protephemerida, leading to the ephemerida, or mayflies, the protorthoptera, ancestral to the orthoptera, the grasshoppers, crickets, and the related phasmids, earwigs, and the like. Another of these transitional groups was the protoblatoidea, primitive roach-like forms ancestral to the cockroaches, termites, book lice, bird lice, and beetles. The other familiar orders, such as the hemiptera or bugs, the hymenoptera or bees and ants, the lepidoptera or moths and butterflies, and the diptera or flies, are of later origin, although from the same carboniferous paleodictyopteran stock. All of the Paleozoic insects were large, and this was especially true of those of the Carboniferous, for a cockroach of the middle Carboniferous was as long as one's finger, while certain dragonflies attained a wing spread of twenty-nine inches. Large size usually accompanies lack of other specialization, and so it was with these creatures, all of which were of relatively simple carnivorous habits, with adaptations showing as yet none of the intricate detail which characterizes the insects of today. All were voiceless, none had special larvae or pupa forms, but in the fern-like venation of the wings of the roaches, for instance, the first tendency towards protective mimicry is seen. All plant nature at this time was monotonous, and the insects reflect the aspect of the period. Not all, however, were amphibious, for in certain of the transitional orders, protothoptera, protoblatoidea, etc., the ancestral waters had already been forsaken even by the young. Thus the insects parallel the emergence and evolution of the contemporary vertebrates, the amphibians and reptiles. 
During Carboniferous time, the climate was mild and humid, with no dry seasons nor cold winters to cause periodical cessation of insect development. This climatic condition is attested by the fact that none of the trees of this time show annual rings of growth. Hence the insect activity was continuous and no adaptations to withstand periods of inclemency were necessary. With the Permian, however, came aridity of increasing severity and glacial conditions of an austerity even greater than that of the glacial period of the Pleistocene. This meant a profound alteration of the face of nature, not only of the plants but of the animals as well. Its influence on the vertebrates will be discussed later, but its effect on the insects was also profound in that it meant a large destruction of such of the primitive forms as were not adaptable, and the modification of such as were. It was probably only in the more favored localities that even such survivals could occur. Mesozoic Insects During the Permian and Lower Triassic, insects were relatively rare, as their great scarcity in the deposits of those times would imply. When they again appeared, the old transitional groups had given way to the modern orders, many of which had acquired the complete metamorphosis with an adaptive resting or pupal stage. This stage may well have arisen as a response to periodic inclemency, but it made possible the profound reorganization which the insects of complete metamorphosis undergo, and the consequent remarkable adaptations of so many of the modern adults. Thus it was in the Trias that the first insects with complete metamorphoses appeared, including the first true beetles, some of which forsook the universal carnivorous habits of their Paleozoic ancestry and fed upon wood. In the Lias, or Lower Jurassic, the remains of fossil insects again become abundant, many of them reminding one strongly of modern forms, and showing in some instances adaptation to a plant diet. In the Middle Jurassic, Dogger, occur the first Lepidoptera, and in the Malm, Upper Jurassic, the first Hymenoptera. These were probably plant feeders, but owing to the absence of flowers, none could have had the honey-feeding habits of their descendants. Higher Orders The Cretaceous, however, saw the great development of the dicotyledon flora, which before its close had become essentially modernized, so much so that the trees and flowers would probably have had a very familiar look even to our modern eyes. This change had a wonderful effect upon the insect hosts, for flower-feeding forms were now possible, and through mutual interdependence the insects must in turn have stimulated the rapid evolution of floral adaptation. Tertiary Insects With the coming of the tertiary, the entomological aspect of nature again changes, and there appear all of the higher orders in contrast with those of the lias. Now for the first time occur the social insects, termites, ants, bees, and wasps, as well as the insect parasites of warm-blooded animals. The development of insects during and since the tertiary has been along the lines of marvelous increase in the number of species, high specialization, small size, parasitism, and communal life. Summary Three great events of geologic history stand out as the impelling forces of insect evolution. The primal cause for the origin of insects from their trilobite ancestry was the great development of the land, flora, and fauna in the Silurian, and more especially in the Devonian. The Paleozoic insects of primitive or transitional types thus arose and flourished, but with conservativeness except for size, until the second profound event occurred. This second cause was the great climatic change in the Permian, which eliminated so many of the archaic forms, and introduced a new condition, that of complete metamorphosis, with its attendant chain of possibilities, into many of such as survived. The appearance of flowering plants in the Cretaceous completed the work, and there were consequently evolved into being the higher orders, which are so largely dependent upon flowers or flowering plants, either directly or indirectly, for their sustenance. Thus, as Handler says, through the study of the paleontology of insects, we again see clearly how great was the influence of the changes in the outer living conditions on the origin of new forms, and we see further that the environmental conditions 
led oft-times to a remarkably rapid differentiation. End of chapter 27b Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 28a of Organic Evolution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 28a. Origin of Vertebrates. We have in the two preceding chapters discussed the evolution of two of the three great lines of descent which the animal kingdom includes. The third line, that of the vertebrates, is to be the subject of our research from now on, to enable us to comprehend in full the place in nature held by mankind. Definition of a Vertebrate Notochord Vertebrates, or to use the more comprehensive term, chordates, have several diagnostic characters which are absolutely distinctive, separating them sharply from all other forms of life. Of these, the first is the possession of a notochord. This is an internal axial stiffening running lengthwise of the trunk, and serving to resist the bodily shortening which the contraction of the muscles would otherwise cause. In its most primitive form, the notochord is membranous, composed of cellular connective tissue, the cavities of which are so distended with fluid as to render the whole structure turgid, resistant to pressure, but highly elastic. Later the notochord becomes cartilaginous, to be replaced in higher forms by the bony vertebral column, consisting of a number of short but often complex vertebrae separated for mobility by cartilaginous intervertebral discs. Perforated pharynx The development of apertures known as gill slits through the walls of the pharynx or throat cavity is the second chordate character. These vary in number from a pair to more than a hundred amphioxus, and are always present, but by no means always retain their ancient respiratory function, for with ourselves and other mammals, the slits, of which there are several pairs in the embryo, are reduced in number until but one pair is left, and these form the eustachian tubes, which serve to equalize the air pressure on either side of the eardrum, by connecting the middle ear with the cavity of the throat. Neuroseal. The third diagnostic character is a hollow nerve cord, the so-called spinal cord, which lies immediately above the notochord or the vertebral column. This may be a very simple structure, or again its anterior portion may increase and develop until in its highest expression, the human brain, it has formed what is probably the most intricate thing in nature. In every case, however simple or complex it may be, the internal canal or neuroseal persists, though exceptions may be said to exist in the tunicates or sea squirts, which are striking examples of degeneracy resulting from sedentary life. Herein the active larva has a nervous system which conforms to our definition, but in the adult it is reduced to a single ganglion, or mass of nerve matter, with no trace of the neuroseal. Other Characters other distinctive features are usually shown by chordates. They are generally segmented, the segmentation showing in the nervous system, gill slits, vertebral column, ribs and breastbone, and in the muscles of the trunk. When paired limbs are present, their number never exceeds four, while in the invertebrate there is no such limitation. Finally, there is apparently a reversal of surfaces, for whereas in the invertebrate the bulk of the nervous system lies below the gut and the blood system above, in the chordate the reverse is true. In the invertebrate the body wall is equally thick throughout. In the vertebrate there is a remarkable thickening or concentration of the muscles along the dorsal side, within which lie the notochord and spinal cord. It is therefore this group of forms, comprising the degenerate tunicates, the unprogressive amphioxus, the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, the last of course including man, that we wish to consider, 
and our immediate problem is to learn, if possible, the time, place, and source of vertebrate beginnings. Time of Origin The chordates are a very ancient race, dating back probably to the beginning of Paleozoic time. Although the tangible record of their existence commences with the fragmentary remains of armoured fishes, ostracoderms, found in the middle Ordovician rocks near Canyon City, Colorado, in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming, and in the Black Hills of South Dakota. But these relics are those of creatures which had already travelled far along the evolutionary road, and, according to most authorities, do not represent the most primitive members of the chordate stem. Hence we may safely say that the time of origin was not later than the beginning of the Ordovician, and probably long before. There is, however, little chance of finding the geologic record of the ancestral forms if, as we may suppose, they were soft-bodied, delicate organisms without hard parts for fossilization. Place of Origin All of the most primitive chordates existing today, tunicates, amphioxus, etc., are marine, inhabiting for the most part the shoal waters of the cradle of evolution, the shallow sea zone where they lead a wholly or partially sedentary life. That this is therefore the ancestral habitat seems at first sight plausible, and yet within this area there is lacking the necessary physical or external stimulus to impel the evolution of the chordate characteristics. It was in view of this that Professor Chamberlain proposed his theory of ancestral habitat, which can best be stated in his own words. Chamberlain's Theory Chamberlain argues for flowing land waters as the place of origin because of the strenuous dynamic condition constantly impressed upon their fauna. He says, quote, Neglecting lakes, which are mere incidents, Land waters are distinguished by persistent and usually rather rapid motion in a fixed direction, and this is an insistent physical condition to which their fauna must adapt itself. Fortunately, this adaptation must take a tangible form, whereas adaptation to the freshness of the water is accomplished by obscure modifications which are not as yet detectable. In flowing water, the animal must maintain its position against the current, either by a contact of some resisting kind with the bottom of the stream, or must be provided with an effective mode of propulsion, competent to meet the constant force of the current, without undue draft on the vital resources. Otherwise, the animal would be swept out to sea, and its race be ended as a stream-dweller. It is different with ocean currents, for they return upon themselves, and an animal may yield to them without losing its marine habitat, and besides they are usually much feebler than river currents. A glance at the faunas of existing streams, which represent the outcome of ages of trial, shows only three prominent groups of animals that have accomplished the adaptation. The minor instances are negligible. The successful cases are, first and foremost, fish, second, certain mollusks that crawl on the bottom with firm contact, and third, certain crustaceans that are provided with numerous sharp claws that give them ready catch and hold upon the stream bed. The brachiopods that are free in youth, but sessile or pedicelled in later life, the cephalopods that are floating or swimming forms, the corals, the crinoids, the echinoids, and many other sea forms of ancient history and long opportunity, have not made an effective entrance into the streams during geologic time, and this is probably not wholly, and perhaps not chiefly, due to the sweetness of the waters. A compact form of body presents obvious advantages, except as environment or food or locomotion requires some departure from it, and the vast majority of animals are more or less rotund, and their locomotive devices are adjusted to this form. But the rotund form offers much resistance to rapid currents, and unfits the animal for effective stream life unless it persistently hugs the bottom. Neither the rotund floaters and swimmers like the ancient cephalopods, nor the ciliated spawn of the sessile forms, are adapted to resist the increasing pressure of a rapid stream, and these are practically absent from river faunas. 
there is only one conspicuous type that is facilely suited to free life independent of the bottom in swift streams and that is the fish form the form and the motion of the typical fish are a close imitation of the form and motion of wisps of water grass passively shaped and gracefully waved by the pulsations of the current the rhythmical undulations of the lamprey which perhaps best illustrates the primitive vertebrate form and is itself archaic in structure are an almost perfect embodiment in the active voice of the passive undulations of ropes of river confervae the movement of the fish is produced by alternate rhythmical contractions of the side muscles by which the pressure of the fish's body is brought to bear in successive waves against the water of the incurved sections in the movement of a rope of vegetation in a pulsating current it is the pressure of the pulses of water against the sides of the rope that give the incurvations the two phenomena are natural reciprocals in the active and passive voices the development in the fish of a rhythmical system of motion responsive to the rhythm impressed upon it by its persistent environment and duly adjusted to it in pulse and force is a natural mode of neutralizing the current force and securing stability of position or motion against the current as desired beyond question the form and the movement of the typical fish are admirably adapted to motion in static water and that has been thought a sufficient reason for the evolution of the form and so possibly it may be but fishes in static water have not as uniformly retained the attenuated spindle-like form and the extreme lateral flexibility as have those of running water among these latter it is rare that any great departure from the typical lines and from ample flexibility has taken place while it is not uncommon in sea fishes among the latter not a few have lost both the typical form and the flexibility the porcupine fish the seahorse the flounders and many others are examples of such retrogressive evolution which is doubtless advantageous to them within their special spheres in quiet waters but would quite unfit them for life in a swift stream and if the view be extended to include the low degenerate forms like the ascidians tunicates that are by some authors classed as chordates the statement finds further emphasis it is not difficult for the imagination to picture a lowly aggregate of animal cells still plastic and indeterminate in organization brought under the influence of a persistent current and caused to develop into determinate organization under its control and hence to acquire as its essential features a spindle-like form a lateral flexibility and a set of longitudinal side muscles adapted to rhythmical contractions since these are but expressions of conformity and responsiveness to the shape and movement normally impressed by the controlling environment upon plastic bodies immersed in it the necessity for a stiffened axial tract to resist the longitudinal contractions of the side muscles and thus to prevent shortening without seriously interfering with lateral flexibility is obvious and is supplied by a notochord thus by hypothesis the primitive chordate form may be regarded as a specific response to the special environment that dominated the evolution of a previously indeterminate ancestral form End of quote. add to this hypothetical argument the fact that the first faunas of fossil fishes appear abundantly in sediments of inland waters or of littoral zones or embayed arms of the sea and there is seen to be corroborative evidence that the place postulated by chamberlain as the ancestral habitat may be assumed as correct migratory fishes the return of migratory fishes to their natal place for the purpose of bringing forth their own young is interesting for the birthplace of the individual may also represent the ancestral home of the race thus shad sturgeon and salmon among the more familiar fishes are riverward migrants when each year the procreative instinct awakens the sea lamprey also goes into the rivers to spawn and that this is not altogether due to a desire to get into fresh water 
is attested by the fact that the freshwater lampreys, which inhabit Cayuga and other lakes in the northeastern United States, ascend the tributary brooks and streams every spring for the same purpose, leaving in each instance static for dynamic waters. The only seaward migrant with which we are familiar is the common eel, which is river inhabiting during the greater part of its life, but spawns in salt water. The eel, however, is a degenerate form whose young undergo a remarkable metamorphosis, and during the long larval state its swimming powers are such as would render its retention of a fluvial habitat very difficult. Hence, perhaps, the reversal of the ordinary conditions. As in those insects in which complete metamorphosis prevails, a larva may represent neither the form nor the life conditions of its ancestors. End of chapter 28a Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 28b of Organic Evolution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull Chapter 28b Ancestral Stocks Several theories have been advanced to set forth the claim of this or that invertebrate group to vertebrate ancestry, but none of them is at this time capable of adequate demonstration. Of these, three are based upon the assumption that a segmented ancestry is necessary to account for the segmentation seen in the vertebrate, an inference which is not necessarily true, as segmentation may readily have arisen anew in the chordate phylum, as a response to such conditions as those postulated by Chamberlain. Annelid Ancestry The hypothesis of annelid ancestry for the vertebrates derives the primitive chordate from the phylum annelida, typified by the earth and marine worms. In many of the principal organs there is a marked correspondence, with the exception of the general reversal of the relations of the various parts to one another. For, as we have seen, the relative position of blood and nervous systems is diametrically opposite in the vertebrate and invertebrate groups. But by postulating a physiological reversal of the animal, and we know that in the flounder and squid such a change from the morphologically normal posture can take place, the various organs of the worm may be brought into almost complete harmony with those of the vertebrate. Perhaps the greatest difficulty lies in the development of the notochord, but even this seems to have its annelid prototype in the Faserstrang, a bundle of fibers running along the nerve chain and serving as a support. This and the notochord lie in a precisely similar position in relation to the other organs, and in both cases they are enclosed with the nerve cord in a common sheath of connective tissue. Wilder. The reversible diagram shown in figure 130 shows quite clearly this correspondence of parts. In the annelid position we see the mouth, from which the esophagus arises, passing through the nervous system and connecting with the long straight gut, which terminates at the posterior end of the body at the anus. The nervous system consists of the large supraesophageal ganglion, or brain, from which nerve connectives run, one on either side of the esophagus, to the ventral nerve chain. The main blood vessel lies dorsal to the gut, and another lies beneath it. These are connected, in the anterior region, by semicircular pulsating vessels, or hearts, which cause the blood to flow forward in the dorsal vessel, and aft in the ventral one. Reverse our diagram, and the form becomes a vertebrate, the blood now flowing forward in the pulsating ventral aorta, which serves as a heart, the ancient semicircular hearts having relinquished their primal function for that of respiration, since the gill slits arising between them make them the branchial vessels. As in the annelid, the mouth is again on the ventral side, and this can only be brought about through the abandonment of the old and the formation of the new one by an impushing of the body wall, until communication with the gut is effected. This stomodium is balanced at the hinder end of the trunk 
by the new hindgut, the proctodeum, the ancient intestine in the tail region being aborted. The brain and nerve cord are the homologue of the supraesophageal ganglion and ventral nervous chain of the annelid. Indications of the ancient mouth are seen in several structures such as the neuropore in the embryo of Amphioxus, which forms in this place a direct communication between the cavity of the nerve cord, neuroceal, and the exterior, and is otherwise unaccounted for. Other indications of the early mouth and its esophagus are the fourth ventricle of the brain, a cavity which lies exactly in the place where in the diagram the annelid esophagus pierces the nervous system, and also the hypophysis, a structure attached to the lower side of the midbrain, part of which is pushed up from the alimentary canal, and for which there is as yet no satisfactory explanation. Add to all this the remarkable correspondence of the kidney tubes, or nephridia, of the annelids and vertebrates, and the evidence is presented. Wilder says in summation, quote, Convincing as these comparisons seem when taken by themselves, the influence of later investigation has tended rather away from the annelid hypothesis, and at present, although there are many investigators who seek the ancestor of vertebrates in some worm-like form, there are few who wish to definitely assert that this ancestor was an annelid, end quote. Arthropod Ancestry In addition to the annelid theory, recent authorities have tried to prove vertebrate descent from arthropoda, especially from the more primitive arachnoids, such as today are represented by the scorpion and the horseshoe crab Limulus, and formerly by the extinct Merostomata. By this hypothesis we must set aside as primitive such forms as Amphioxus and the Cyclostomes, and start with the highly specialized Ostracoderms, which lived in Ordovician and Devonian times, and thus were contemporaneous with, and in general appearance and probable habits, quite similar to the Meristomata. The soft parts of the Meristomata are of course unknown but it is reasonable to suppose that they were not unlike those of the related scorpion and limulus, and, as Patton has shown, especially in the brain and cranial nerves of vertebrates and the fused cephalothoracic ganglionic mass found in such arachnoids, there are many points of resemblance. Then, too, the sense organs, especially the eyes, are more or less comparable and there is in Limulus an internal skeletal piece known as the endocranium, or sternum, which serves to protect the central nerve complex, and which, in general form and in its relation to other parts, resembles the primordial vertebrate skull. Similarities also exist between the heart and arterial systems of each group, and the appendages may be compared. There are, again, the very arthropod-like jaws which Patton has demonstrated in the astracoderm bothriolepis, a type which, on the other hand, shows many vertebrate-like characteristics. And the general arrangement of the plates by which the cephalothorax is covered is also very similar in the astracoderms and contemporary arachnoids. But unfortunately for the argument, Bothriolepis is a highly specialized end form from the Upper Devonian. Nevertheless, while the arachnoid theory has been set forth by Gaskell, The Origin of Vertebrates, 1908, and by Patton, The Evolution of the Vertebrates and Their Kin, 1912, the main thesis has received thus far but little recognition, although the evidence, especially in Professor Patton's book, is based upon an admirably executed piece of research. Amphioxus Ancestry The theory of Amphioxus Ancestry places a special emphasis upon the notochord, the gill slits, and the dorsal position of the central nervous system, and by means of these has traced the line of vertebrate ancestry through a series of transitional forms, externally very unlike one another, and each somewhat isolated in its systematic position, Wilder. Of these, Amphioxus, the lancelet, stands nearest the true vertebrates. In fact, it is nearest the diagrammatic vertebrate of any living type, 
although, owing to certain specializations, it can hardly be considered a true stem form. The lancelet was first described in 1778 as a shell-less snail or slug, and was named Limax lanceolatus. It is an inhabitant of the shallow sea, being found off the coasts of all parts of the world. There are sixteen known species, most of which are recorded from tropical and subtropical shores, mainly between latitudes 40 degrees north and 40 degrees south. In habits they are very sedentary, living for the most part partly buried in the sand or mud, in a nearly erect posture, with the anterior end protruding. Aside from their primitive character, their worldwide distribution, coupled with sedentary habits, points to a very great antiquity. As fossils, however, they are thus far entirely unknown, and probably always will be. Description of Amphioxus The body is lanceolate, compressed, without a distinct head, but with an expansive hood-like structure surrounding the mouth which is situated beneath the snout. There are no paired fins, but a pair of longitudinal folds, the metapleurs, one on either side of the body along the ventral margin, suggests their possible origin. There is a slight median fin running along the back and supported by delicate skeletal elements membranous in character. Around the tail this fin expands into a caudal, which extends forward on the ventral side beyond the anal opening, thus displacing the latter to the left of the median line. A conspicuous feature is the regular segmentation of the muscular system, plainly visible through the transparent skin, the side muscles being divided into a large number, sixty-four or more, of V-shaped myomeres, each with the apex pointing forward. These do not precisely correspond on the two sides of the animal, and by their successive contraction and relaxation they produce the undulatory movement of the body by means of which locomotion is effected. The notochord has already been described, and also the fact of its continuation to the extreme end of the snout, instead of ceasing beneath the midbrain, as in all higher vertebrates, craniata. Lying along the dorsal side of this notochord and enclosed with it in a connective tissue sheath is the central nervous system, comparable to that of fishes except that it lacks an expanded brain other than a slight enlargement known as the arc encephalon. The only definite sense organs are an olfactory pit on the left side and a single median pigment spot which serves for the perception of light transmitted through the transparent body. The alimentary canal lies beneath the notochord, and consists of the mouth and a large pharynx that extends more than half the length of the body, and is pierced by numerous gill slits, sixty to eighty or more pairs, running obliquely and stiffened by a complex of skeletal bars. These bars are formed of a material which resembles chitin, and are thus more invertebrate than vertebrate-like in character. Along the ventral wall of the pharynx lies the endostyle, a groove-like organ composed of ciliated cells and others secreting a viscous material which serves to entangle minute particles of nutrient matter that are carried into the mouth with the respiratory water current. The adhesive material with its contained food is swept into the intestine by the movement of the cilia, and thus the endostyle subserves a very important nutritive function. The intestine runs directly backward, terminating in the laterally situated anus. There also arises from it ventrally a hollow outpushing known as the liver. The circulatory system is comparable to that of other vertebrates, but is much simpler, and the heart is represented by a pulsatory ventral aorta lying beneath the pharynx. The blood, however, is colorless. It will thus be seen that Amphioxus is a very simple vertebrate, specialized a little along certain lines, but with several structures of such fundamental importance that they must be borne in mind in our search for yet more primitive forms. These structures are the notochord, the dorsally situated nerve cord, 
and the pharynx perforated by gill slits and provided with an endostyle. The only other creatures, except Balanoglossus, now existent which possess these structures during any part of their career, are the tunicates, some of which are planktonic, others meroplanktonic, in that while they have active larvae, they soon settle down and become wholly sedentary in their habits. These sedentary forms, curiously enough, have retained more of their primitive characters than those which are planktonic, as their larvae are comparatively undifferentiated. The free-swimming forms, on the other hand, are often modified in a remarkable way, and may have so complex a life history that the old-time chordate characteristics have almost entirely disappeared. They always, however, possess the gill slits and endostyle, except in certain locomotive individuals among the colonial types, which, like the swimming bells, nectocalices, of the siphonophora, have lost all organs except those of propulsion, that is, the muscles, nerves, and sense organs. The sedentary tunicates, ascidians, are sac-like forms, with two apertures, one terminal and inhalant, the other somewhat removed and exhalant. The inhalant orifice functions as a mouth through which water for respiration and bearing nutrient particles enters the spacious pharynx. The latter possesses innumerable gill slits, the ventral endostyle, and a corresponding groove on the dorsal wall, the dorsal lamina, which, however, possesses no gland cells, but only the ciliated ones. Surrounding the pharynx, as in Amphioxus, is the atrium or cloacal cavity, wherein the water which penetrates through the gill slits collects to be passed out through the exhalant orifice, or atriopore. The cloaca also receives the rejectamenta from the simple intestine, and the reproductive and waste products. There are no sense organs, and the nervous system is reduced to a single ganglion, lying between the inhalant and exhalant apertures, while the notochord is not represented at all. The name tunicate comes from the test or tunic, which surrounds the entire animal, and is comparable to the shell of a mollusk, in that it is formed by the body wall or mantle. This test is unique in that it is made up of a substance closely comparable to the cellulose of the plant. Hence, while the adult tunicate shows certain amphioxus-like characteristics, it is the larva in which these are particularly emphasized, for in this stage the creature, which is tadpole-like, possesses a well-developed notochord, segmented muscles, and a prolonged nerve tube with a brain-like vesicle forward which contains a pigment spot and another organ, possibly for balancing. The gill slits are much fewer in number than in the adult, and the endostyle lies in its normal position. The heart also lies ventrally and just behind the esophagus. But this comparatively high organization is retained for a very brief time, a few hours only. Then the creature settles down on a pair of adhesive papillae and undergoes a marked retrogressive metamorphosis, during which it loses tail, notochord, and segmented muscles. The nerve tube is reduced to a single ganglion. The sense organs disappear. The gill slits increase in number, and the animal, after relinquishing practically all of the organs that serve to link it with the vertebrates, degenerates into what is virtually an invertebrate form. It is, however, evident that the tunicates represent a group more or less closely allied to Amphioxus, and hence to the other vertebrates, but that since the time of the common ancestor they have taken a divergent road, resulting in a type of degenerate adult whose real affinities are masked by its specializations. Thus, as Wilder says, quote, the ancestor that we here seek is better seen in the larva than in the adult, and we may believe that there once existed an adult animal with attributes like that of the tunicate larva of the present day, and that this animal was the direct ancestor of that group of which Amphioxus is now the only living representative. End quote. Back of the tunicate ancestor there is but one known form which may or may not be near the main ancestral line. This creature is Balanoglossus, 
a marine worm that lives between high and low water marks in fragile tubes of cemented sand. Balanoglossus is elongated without internal segmentation, but the body is divided into four regions, the burrowing proboscis, a collar with a free anterior edge, a flattened gill region, and a posterior trunk. The mouth is situated just beneath the edge of the collar on the ventral side, and receives sand with its contained organic debris. There is a large pharynx communicating with the exterior by two lateral rows of gill slits, supported by a skeletal structure comparable to that seen in Amphioxus. Owing to the fact that nowhere except among the chordates do such structures occur, naturalists have sought in this animal for the other two chordate characteristics, the notochord and dorsal nervous system. The latter is apparently represented by a very generalized system of nerve fibers and cords somewhat emphasized on the dorsal side, but there is no evidence of the neuroceal. The notochord is supposed to be represented by a small outgrowth arising from the dorsal wall of the pharynx and extending forward into the proboscis. As Wilder says, this supposition has been greatly strengthened through the recent discovery of an allied form belonging to a new genus, Heromania, in which the outgrowth is much larger, and, in its mode of origin, strikingly similar to the true vertebrate notochord, and thus without much doubt homologous with that organ. Wilder further says, Quote, from the testimony afforded by the structure of Balanoglossus and its allied genera, the group Enteropneusta, it may be quite confidently asserted that these forms lie nearly in the line of vertebrate descent and represent an earlier stage than that of the tunicates. But here the chain seems to end, for Balanoglossus is itself unusually isolated and shows no close affinity to any other invertebrate types. End quote. There is but a single rather slender clue to the ancestry of Balanoglossus, and that is again afforded by its embryology, for here there is a peculiar ciliated larva, the so-called tornaria, which shows a very marked resemblance to the larvae of the echinoderms, and the universal occurrence of this larva within the latter group shows that, whereas they are all today, with rare exceptions, either sedentary or vagrant benthos, as their radial symmetry implies, they are descended from a pelagic bilaterally symmetrical ancestry. Thus, according to this belief, we may, quote, except as a very ancient common ancestor of both echinoderms and vertebrates, the form which all these larvae may be said to copy, a form having the characteristics common to all, including bilaterality, minute size, transparency, locomotion by bands of cilia, and pelagic life. The lineal descendants of this hypothetical ancestor chose two paths, the one leading to the echinodermata, the other to Balanoglossus, the tunicata, amphioxus, and eventually the vertebrata. End quote. Wilder. While this theory is incomplete in many details, it has strength where the other hypotheses are weakest in that it is based not alone upon adult structure, but upon ontogeny as well. The weakest link in the chain of evidence is that which binds Balanoglossus to the echinoderms, the tornaria larva, because the adult structures are so remote and the echinoderms give not the slightest clue to their bodily makeup to chordate affinities. However, the majority of workers hold to the reasonableness of this theory. Thus it will be seen that this most interesting problem, the origin of vertebrates, is still far from solution. Nevertheless, the hypothesis here presented, the record of which has almost vanished, seems to indicate the course of evolution. End of chapter 28b Recording by Lisa Reichert Part 3, Section 3, Chapter 29a of Organic Evolution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull Chapter 29 Emergence of Terrestrial Vertebrates Part 1 Next to the origin of the vertebrates from their ancient ancestry, the greatest and most dramatic event in all their history is the emergence from the old limiting aquatic environment and the subsequent adaptation to sub aerial existence. The sea is so changeless and the range of its conditions so small that evolution within it is not stimulated as it is on land. Adaptive radiation of submarine creatures can accomplish but little. We have seen, on the other hand, what it means on the part of air-breathing forms. Place of Emergence The three problems which come to mind are the place, the impelling cause, and the time of this important event, and of these the first has been established. For while certain creatures have forsaken the sea, and crossing the strand, become adapted to sub aerial life, such instances are rare, and in no case do they embrace all of the members of a class or phylum, but isolated genera, or even species only. Such, for example, are the land crabs, Burgus latro, etc., several species of which live in damp woods, far from all water, and as they are found on islands, which, like the dry tortugas, are bereft of any permanent terrestrial waters, must in the main have had their initial air-breathing adaptation along the strand. The terrestrial vertebrates, however, apparently did not so emerge, but rather were descendants of inhabitants of land waters, for in such a habitat alone can we find a sufficiently great impelling cause for an evolution so far-reaching and radical in its ultimate results. Furthermore, as we shall see, the ancestral habitat could not have been within the limits of the tidal zone, but was beyond the influence of the sea. Impelling Cause Enemies in the Water Barrel has discussed the probability of several possible causes which may have led to the emergence of the vertebrates. Of these the first is enemies in the water, which he deems inoperative, for among land-going fishes of today, those few which crawl on the land do not do so to escape their enemies. He also emphasizes the balance which always obtains between carnivorous and herbivorous creatures of a given habitat, and the fact that the amphibia go back to the waters to bring forth their young, and the youngest and therefore the most helpless stages are spent in the waters. Add to this the fact that the earliest amphibia, which are known from their skeletons, the stegocephalia, are in many instances powerful armed carnivores themselves, and their forsaking of the ancient habitat for personal safety seems hardly adequate. Food on the Lands Food on the Lands is further considered an inadequate cause. Here the argument lies in the rarity of the passage of crustaceans, gastropods and vertebrates, from a truly marine to a truly terrestrial mode of life, through the ever-present path of the tidal zone, which seems to prove that the unused though increasingly abundant food of the land realm cannot operate as a sufficient cause for this change. Nor so far as this factor is concerned do the river faunas, have a clear advantage over those of the tidal zone. The Lore of Atmospheric Oxygen That the lore of atmospheric oxygen is also inoperative is proved by the small direct use made of air for respiration by pelagic marine fishes, even when they, the flying fishes for instance, live an active life near the surface and in frequent contact with the air. It is especially in freshwater fishes that accessory, respiratory organs are employed, and their use is in the direct relation to the varying impurity of the waters in which they live. This varying impurity, which often means a paucity of respirable oxygen in the water, is literally impossible in marine waters. Streams may locally contaminate the adjacent waters by their load of sediment or other impurities, but they cannot seriously lessen the degree of aeration. Then, too, marine fishes are never confined to such localities, but can migrate should conditions become unsuitable. 
while with freshwater fishes this may not be true. Recurrence of unfavorable environment. The real cause, therefore, seems to be not the need of safety or food, nor the desire to breathe atmospheric oxygen, but rather an adaptation which has been forced repeatedly to a greater or less degree upon fishes by the recurrence of an unfavorable environment, instead of one assumed within a constant environment merely because of inherent advantages. Hence it appears, as though the emergence were compelled by oscillations in the environment as measured by the varying content of dissolved oxygen in the land waters, and the question arises whether such oscillations occur, and if so, under what climatic conditions. The climate postulated does occur in various parts of the world, but is, as Beryl has shown, neither arid nor humid, but semi-arid, conditions which are found in the tropics especially, where, instead of the fourfold change of seasons, whose determining factor is temperature, there are alternate seasons of drought and copious rain occurring in definite cycles. In such a region, during the rainy season, the streams would be high and fully aerated, but when the rains ceased, the waters would gradually lack in their current, until, instead of a flowing river of pure water, there would be a succession of stagnant water pools in which the concentrated plant and animal life would die, and by its decay, charge the waters with impurities and exhaust their free oxygen. Thus we would get a great fluctuation of oxygen content, and so a very variable environment in its ability to support water-breathing life. Under such conditions, if life existed, a high premium would be placed upon powers of estivation or torpidity induced by summer heat and dryness, or of breathing the atmosphere, or both combined and a rapid elimination of the unfit, that is, of such as did not possess even the rudiment of this power, would occur. Air-breathing fishes. There are among existing fishes a number possessing supplementary respiratory organs, which may be one or two structures, either one, spongy outgrowths of the gills, which can retain moisture, and as long as it is retained, utilize the free oxygen of the air for the aeration of the blood or two a modified swim bladder which may have one or several functions but whose principal purpose is a hydrostatic one to maintain the fish at a given level in the water teleosts the first of these structures that of the accessory organ connected with the gills is found exclusively in teleostean fishes a group in which the air bladder never subserves a respiratory function Several such teleosts exist, among them the climbing perch, Anabis scandens, and the mud skippers, Periophthalmus and Boliophthalmus. But they are generally fishes which voluntarily leave the waters for migration or in pursuit of food, and rarely is their evolution the result of adaptation to the environmental conditions postulated above. The swim bladder, on the other hand, is entirely absent in the two groups known as cyclostomes and elasmobronchs, and, as we have seen, is never of respiratory value in the teleosts, so that its function in this direction lies in the groups between, in other words, among ganoids and dipnoans, or true lungfishes, and these fishes are today all denizens of semi-arid tropical climates living under conditions of varied water aeration arising in the way we have described. These air-breathing fishes are of such importance to our argument, and are so few, and represent so ancient a group of groups withal, that some account of the individual species is worthy of record. It should be borne in mind, however, that these are relic forms, representative of Devonian time, when all fresh-water fishes belonged to one or the other of these two groups. Ganoids The ganoids of a special note are specifically of the order Crossopterygii, or the fringe-finned ganoids, and include but two related genera, Polyopterus and Calimoichthys, both African in distribution. Of them the better known is Polyopterus, of which there are several species, 
polyopterous pitcher haunts the deeper holes and depressions of the muddy bed of the nile although it is not essentially a bottom liver or mudfish it is most active at night when in search of food and then it may readily be taken by trawl lines the lobate pectoral fins are used for progression but their primary function is to act as balancers and they exhibit the characteristic trembling movements so often seen in the balancing fins of teleosts polyopterus does not readily live out of water rarely longer than three to four hours and then only when covered with the damp grass or weeds Peleopterus bitcher is said to feed on small teleosts which it swallows whole and to these there may be added in other species batrachians and crustaceans the observations of budget show that in captivity polyopterus often remains motionless for a long time at the bottom of the water the interior part of the body resting upon the tips of the pectoral fins according to the same observer the air bladder is an accessory respiratory organ supplementary to the gills rather than a hydrostatic organ bridge this air bladder is a diverticulum or outpushing of the gut and in the crossopterygii arises from the ventral side of the gullet and is a paired structure exactly as in the amphibian lung it is not however cellular and is thus a very inefficient respiratory organ in the genus calamoichthys the body is elongate and eel-like in shape the pelvic fins are entirely lacking but the pectorals in the series of dorsal finlets are comparable to those of polyopterus except that the latter are relatively fewer calamoichthys has a more restricted distribution than polyopterus being confined to certain rivers in west africa such as old calabar river and those of the delta of the niger on the coast of cameroon it is a very agile fish swimming like a snake and subsisting on insects and crustaceans the name signifies palm fish from its frequenting the roots of the palm trees neither polyopterus nor calimorchthys is known fossil but the group crossopterygii to which they belong once included a large number of important fishes of these Iloptychius of the Devonian is interesting because of the intricate and folded structure of the teeth, which has a striking parallel in those of certain amphibia, labyrinthodonts. Undina, another form from the upper Jurassic, exhibits a well developed air bladder in the fossil specimen. Dipnoans of the Dipnoans or true lung fishes. Of the Dipnoans or true lung fishes, three genera only are extant but they never were as numerous as the crossopterygii the living forms are first the australian genus ceratodus or to be more accurate neoceratodus fosteri the barramunda which is now confined to the mary and burnett rivers in queensland this form frequents the comparatively stagnant pools or water holes which alternate with shallow runs and are usually full of water all the year round in these pools filled with a rich growth of aquatic vegetation and often the favorite haunt of the platypus orinthorhynchus the fish is fairly abundant inactive and sluggish in its habits usually lying motionless on the bottom the fish is easily captured by the natives with hand nets or baited hooks neoceratodus lives on freshwater crustaceans worms and mollusks and to obtain them it crops the luxuriant vegetation of the water holes much in the same way that a polycate worm or a holythurian sea cucumber swallows sand for the sake of the included nutrient particles apparently the air bladder is a functional lung at all times acting in conjunction with the gills at irregular intervals the fish rises to the surface and protrudes its snout in order to empty its lung and take in fresh air while doing so the animal makes a peculiar grunting noise spouting as the local fishermen call it which may be heard at night for some distance and is probably caused by the forcible expulsion of air through the mouth useful as the lung is as a breathing organ under normal conditions there can be little doubt that its value as such is much greater whenever the gill breathing becomes difficult or impossible 
this seems to be the case during the hot season when the water becomes foul from the presence of decomposing animal or vegetable matter simon records a striking instance of this in the case of a partially dried up water hole in which the water had become so foul that it was full of dead fishes of various kinds fatal as these conditions were to ordinary fishes neoceratodus not only survived but seemed to be quite healthy and fresh such observations are of exceptional interest not only do they afford a clue to the conditions of life which in the course of time probably led to lung breathing in neoceratodus but they also suggest the possibility that a similar environment has been conducive to the evolution of air-breathing vertebrates from gill-breathing and fish-like progenitors in spite of its pulmonary respiration neoceratodus more closely resembles the typical fishes in its habits than any other dipneustae it lives all the year round in the water there is no evidence that it ever becomes dried up in the mud or passes into a summer sleep in a cocoon and the well-developed condition of its gills suggests that these organs play a more important role in breathing than in either protopterus or lepidosiren the fish is not known to leave the water and the paired fins useful no doubt as paddles are quite incapable of supporting the bulky body on terra firma in fact when neoceratodus is taken out of its natural element it seems to be more helpless than most other fishes and in spite of its capacity for lung breathing soon dies unless kept moist by artificial means bridge neoceratodus grows to a length of five to six feet ceratodus a fossil ally mesozoic in age was very widespread compared with the limited distribution of its living congener its very characteristic crushing teeth occur in the trias of england germany india and south africa and also more rarely in the upper jurassic in comanchian strata of england and in colorado and wyoming morrison formation its remains are often found associated with those of carnivorous dinosaurs but the significance of this is not clear protopterus and lepidosiren which represent a separate family of lung fishes the lepidosirenidae differ from neoceratodus in that the air bladder is a double organ while in the latter it is a single protopterus is the african lungfish and has a wide distribution ranging from the river senegal and the white nile on the north to the congo basin lake tanganyika and the zambesi on the south the three known species live in marshes in the vicinity of rivers they are carnivorous their food consisting mainly of frogs worms insects and crustaceans but when confined together they are very apt to display cannibalistic traits the tail is the chief locomotor organ and they are remarkably agile and quick in these movements the limbs are useless for swimming but are used for crawling over the bottom then they show a definite elbow or knee-like flexure at about mid-length protopterus ascends to the surface from time to time to breathe air into its lungs in the dry season however it burrows into the mud to a depth of about eighteen inches where it forms a lining to the cavity in which it lies in the form of a capsule of hardened mucus secreted by skin glands this capsule has an aperture the margins of which are pulled inward to form a short tube that is inserted between the fish's lips the fish within the capsule is surrounded by a soft slimy mucus which keeps the skin moist while respiration is effected by drawing the outer air through burrow and tube into the mouth and thence to the lungs the lungs are therefore the sole means of respiration during the period of estivation while the body fat and muscle tissues of the fish as in the case of hibernating mammals supply it with the necessary food the dry season varies but lasts in general from august to december nearly half the year when with the advent of the rainy season the marshes once more become flooded the capsule is dissolved protopterus emerges from its burrow resuming its active life very soon begins to provide for its coming young the larvae have much the appearance of a young salamander 
with four pairs of external cutaneous gills and two pairs of simultaneously developed limbs it also has chromatophores in the skin whereby its color may be changed as in the salamander the assumption of lung breathing is marked by a reduction of the cutaneous gills which takes place about seven weeks after the eggs are deposited protopterus attains a length of about six feet lepidosiren the mudfish with but a single species to its credit is a south american form occurring along the course of the main amazon entering some of its larger tributaries and also the chaco boreal to the west of the upper paraguay river the home of the lepidosiren or lolach as the natives call the fish of the chaco country is to be found in the wide-spreading marshes and swamps which for a greater part of the year are almost choked by a luxuriant growth of their own peculiar vegetation and covered by a floating carpet of surface weeds with here and there deeper and clearer water and slow flowing streams in the dry season the water gradually shrinks and the swamps eventually become dried up of sluggish habits the fish wriggles slowly about at the bottom of the swamp like an eel using its hind limbs in an irregular bipedal fashion as it wends its way through the dense network of subaqueous plants lepidosiren is not exclusively carnivorous the large freshwater snail ampullaria which lives in the swamps in enormous numbers seems to be its favorite food but masses of confervoid algae are also eaten and in its earlier stages it is probable that the fish is more herbivorous than carnivorous bridge lepidosiren rises to the surface at intervals to breathe the rate varying with the degree of impurity of the water it feeds voraciously during the rainy season storing up a supply of fat against the period of estivation which is passed in a deep tubular burrow much as the protopterus the entrance to the burrow in this case however is closed by a plug of clay perforated by several holes on the coming of the waters the plug is pushed out and the fish escapes development is quite similar to that of protopterus and in each case parallels the amphibia very closely there are many other parallelisms of structure and habits between the two groups so many in fact that as dean says it is almost impossible to look upon them as of no greater significance than convergences lepidosirenidae are as yet unknown as fossils but there is reason to believe that their evolution from the older dipneustae has been in a manner retrogressive dipterus the most ancient of lungfishes may be taken as a starting point and dolo has selected a remarkable series of genera scomenacea phaneropleuron euronemus ceratotus neoceratotus protopterus and lepidosiren in which the evolutionary sequence agrees perfectly with their succession in time back of dipterus lies an unknown ancestry but one which probably falls within the group of crossopterygian ganoids of which polypterus and calamoichthes are the living representatives the trend of evolution among the dipneustae if one may judge from the lepidosiren is leading to an elongated eel-like type which will be both limb and scaleless all of which features are indications of racial senescence these two interesting groups of air-breathing fishes the crossopterygii and the dipneustae are both on the eve of their racial passing the lesson which they teach however is of great significance and brings us back once more to the theme of our discussion that of the most momentous emergence in prehistory and our inquiry now leads us to a consideration of the probable time of emergence end of chapter twenty nine a recording by amy graymore maine two thousand and twelve part three section three chapter twenty nine b of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org organic evolution by richard swan lull 
Chapter Twenty Nine B, The Emergence of Terrestrial Vertebrates, Time of Emergence. The evidence here is twofold: first, the fossil record, and second, the geological evidence of climatic conditions such as we have assumed. The fossil evidence, which will be reviewed in greater detail later, points to a time earlier than Upper Devonian, for it is upon sediment referable to that period that the earliest known footprint of a terrestrial vertebrate has been impressed. The time of emergence, therefore, cannot be later than the age of this footprint, and from the nature of things must somewhat antedate it, although how much we have no means of knowing as it was a time of accelerated evolutionary change. The climatic evidence points to the same result, for as Barrel has shown by a careful study of the sediments and of other phenomena connected with the rocks of Devonian age, these were times of warmth and seasonal rainfall tending toward more marked semi-aridity of climate in the upper Devonian. There is, moreover, found to be a concurrent elimination of sharks from fresh waters, with a consequent dominance of dipnoans crossopterygians in the fish fauna. Of these fishes, certain could and did adapt themselves after the manner of their living descendants to the increasingly long dry seasons, until the latter became so long that the period of activity was not commensurate with the creature's life needs. Then came the emergence, for instead of estivation the animal must adopt some other mode of life which would prolong the time of its activity in spite of the climatic restrictions thus the more ambitious among the lung breathers not content with the limitations imposed upon their lives emerged from the age-long aquatic home and ventured into the new and untried habitat many may have essayed the emergence but it is probable that relentless nature weeding out the less fit for so valorous an undertaking destroyed all but a single sort for there is no evidence that the ancestry of the amphibia is to be found in more than one evolutionary lineage ancestry in spite of the many similarities which exist between the dipneusti and the amphibiae there are few authorities who hold to a possible direct derivation of the one from the other for very serious anatomical difficulties stand in the way one of which is the very peculiar and specialized type of limb, the Archatigyrium, which this group of fishes possess, and out of which it is seemingly impossible to construct the terrestrial hand or foot. The Crossoptergi, on the other hand, exhibit few of these obstacles. In fact, there are practically none which evolution cannot overcome. The general consensus of opinion, therefore, would derive the land-dwelling forms either from Crossoptergi as such, or possibly from some, as yet undiscovered, related group. Changes upon emergence. Partial loss of armor. The essential changes undergone by the emerging form were first partial loss of armor, for while the earliest amphibians, the stegocephalia, from the Greek to cover and head, are armored, the armor is confined mainly to the head, as the name signifies, to the breast girdle and to oblique rows of small scales chiefly on the underside of the trunk and tail there is no evidence of their having possessed the heavy enameled scales of the ganoid ancestor loss of unpaired fins the unpaired fins are of course strictly of aquatic use and their loss upon emergence is to be expected they do however recur in forms which filled with hymwa have returned to their ancestral habitat Thus certain salamanders show a rather well-developed caudal web of skin, which in the crested newt extends forward along the back, and many aquatic larvae, those of frogs and toads, also have well-developed unpaired fins. But these are new structures which have arisen in response to immediate need and bear no genetic relationship to the equivalent fins of fishes, the principal proof thereof lying in the fact that there is no trace in the amphibian of supporting fin rays such as all fish fins show development of terrestrial limb one of the most essential changes upon emergence was the modification of the paired fins of the fish ancestor to support the body on the mud a function to which they were clearly inadapted in their original condition the paired fins of the dipneusti are as we have seen architerygia 
that is, having a long jointed bony axis, on one or both sides of which arose a series of parallel rays to support the fin membrane. Such a type of limb, while it may be used as a prop, or for slow crawling propulsion in a water-borne form, is in no known instance of suitable strength to support the entire weight of the animal when out of water, nor is it of sufficient surficial area to carry its owner over soft mud, for here a broad member is necessary. Then, too, the skeletal elements are such that one cannot see the slightest prophecy therein of the standard framework of the terrestrial foot. With the crossopterygians, on the other hand, this is not true, for here the limb is different, having a broad basal lobe containing several bones and a fringe-like expansion, so arranged that a much more adequate support is already present, even in the fish stage of evolution. It is particularly in the pectoral fin of the fish, Soripterus tylori, from the upper Devonian, that the terrestrial limb is foreshadowed, the shoulder bones corresponding bone for bone, the single proximal bone of the fin to the humerus, the next two to the radius and ulna, and the remainder of some of them to the bones of wrist, palm, and digits. Certain bones have naturally been lost and others added, and the entire fin-rayed portion of the limb abandoned, with the relinquishment of the swimming function, but the whole metamorphosis requires no undue tension of the imagination. The actual transitional limb is as yet unknown to us, but the most ancient footprint, Thinopus, is certainly not that of a completely evolved foot, and may thus throw light upon the process of evolution. This footprint, while giving no clue to the skeleton of the upper and lower arm and wrist, does give a very adequate idea of the digital structure, which is highly peculiar. There are but two completely formed fingers, probably the first and second, the cleft between them extending deep into the sole of the foot. The phalangeal pads in a rounded terminal claw-like portion are already developed, and there appears on the outer side of digit, too, the rudiment of a third, as though it arose there as a lateral bud, and below this on the outside of the foot the possible enlage of digit four. If this is a normal footprint, as we suppose it to be, it seems to prove that the terrestrial foot, instead of being five-toed from the beginning, and that is certainly the standard, undifferentiated type today, began as a two-toed organ on the outer side of which the remaining digits arose in orderly succession until the typical number was acquired and the member became standardized. That this may have been the case is not only evidenced by the unique footprint which we have discussed, but the arrangement of the nerves and muscles in the major and minor axes of the foot and limb are corroborative. The ontogeny of the salamander's foot, as figured by Rabel, shows the same budding of the lateral digits as the thinopus track implies so that without having seen the footprint professor wilder as a result of his embryological studies postulated an ancestral foot striking like that of thinopus loss of gills the ancient fish gills borne on the gill arches were also lost upon emergence for in every instance where permanent gills are seen in living amphibia they are external dermal structures of later origin, and not, strictly homologous, with the internal gills of the fishes. Some amphibian gills, it is true, seem to be internal, as they are occasionally covered by a fold of skin, the operculum, so that they thus come to lie in a gill chamber. But they develop, before the gill clefts open, are restricted to the outer side of the bronchial arches, and are always covered by an ectoderm, all of which goes to prove them new organs which have assumed the old lost function of aquatic respiration. Fossil Record Footprints The earliest record of a terrestrial vertebrate is the single footprint of Thinopus antiquus mentioned above. This is impressed upon a slab of sandstone and is from the uppermost Devonian, Chimung. It was found in 1896 by the late Professor Beecher of Yale, and by him presented to the museum where it is now treasured. 
these same beds contain ripple marks mud cracks and impressions of raindrops and land plants also come from the same general horizon a characteristic marine mollusk nuculana is preserved in the footprint slab the associated strata show dominant delta conditions on the outer margin of which the sea had contributed to the material for in the wide oscillations of the strand line characteristic of delta fronts deposition under shore conditions and deposition under river conditions alternate barrel this devonian is directly overlain by lower carboniferous coal measures represented in nova scotia and new brunswick by the horton series these contain the remains of plants and crustaceans and the footprints of amphibians no bones have been found in these beds but the footprints indicate at the beginning of the carboniferous period and before the deposition of the lower carboniferous limestones the presence of both large and small species similar to those of the coal formation dawson one interesting type hylopus hardingi found in the lower carboniferous shales of parsborough shows a stride five times the length of the foot and twice the width of the trackway as though the creature which made it stood high on its legs like an ordinary mammal this looks very much like a cursorial adaptation if so it is the earliest on record the next higher level to record the passing feet of these primal terrestrial forms is the mock chunk series of pennsylvania assigned by geologists to the upper half of the lower carboniferous here has been recorded paleosauropus primovis a five-toed track of considerable size as these early forms run and more careful search of these same beds at pottsville has brought to light several other species some very small and delicately impressed other tracks have come from virginia and are referred to the same general age hinton formation first skeletal remains the first amphibian bones are from the edinburgh coal measures of scotland which have been referred to the lower carboniferous and they are therefore of equivalent geological age to the nova scotian footprints the oldest known skeletons are ascribed to the genera loxoma and philidogaster these are in no sense transitional forms but are fully developed amphibians above the lower carboniferous coal measures we have red shales and sandstones in which bones are invariably rare and footprints abundant and so it is with the scottish record this has been explained by barrel as follows quote, red shales and sandstones are markedly barren of organic remains yet footprints and plant impressions are present the sediments were characteristically deposited under conditions where they were subjected to drying and atmospheric oxidation the recurrent drying out implies a fall of level of the groundwater such changes in groundwater through the induced circulation favor solution of slightly soluble materials such as the mineral matter of bones in the zone above even large and resistant bones are speedily destroyed if alternately wet and dried in the presence of oxygen and seeping waters such conditions are present in the delta soils of seasonally arid climates but not in wind-formed desert deposits nor in the swamps wherein organic matter accumulates the wetter and cooler the climate the more favorable become the conditions for the spread of swamp conditions resulting in the accumulation of coal and permitting also the preservation of fossils End quote. it was during the permo carboniferous times between that especially that the great deployment of amphibia occurred and we have the various places notably in europe and in nova scotia and the united states the remains of a varied assemblage of forms some small others huge heavily armored types with complex vertebrae others with complexly infolded teeth some with well-developed crawling limbs yet others limbless elongate indicating that already racial old age with its attendant degeneracy was upon them what and all were alike in this way they went presumably back to the waters to lay their eggs and their young were therefore aquatic and breathed by means of gills but there are among them 
many of which this cannot be proved, and some may actually have been transitional, not between amphibians and fishes, but between amphibians and the succeeding class, the reptilia. Certain of the forms, such as cacops, discovered in the Permo Carboniferous of Texas by Professor Williston, show such a combination of characters pertaining both to the amphibia and reptiles, that as the distinguished discoverer says, it may become necessary to revise our definition of the former group. Summary The nature of the geological record of amphibians indicates that they evolved under climates marked by seasonal dryness and inhabited river plains far from the sea. The abruptness of appearance of well-developed sustaining legs and feet points to an origin perhaps as far back as the lower Devonian, but a rapid expansion and evolution in the upper Devonian. They survived the change to more generally wet conditions in the lower Mississippian, but showed more convincingly their adaptation to semi-arid continental conditions through the footprint record they have left in the mock chunk shales. The impressions of plants indicate that over the broad river plains of eastern Pennsylvania there flourished each season an herbaceous vegetation of acrogens following the withdrawal of the river floods until the advancing seasonal dryness caused it to wither. No traces of an arboreal vegetation have been found, and this, taken in conjunction with other facts, suggests that in the dry season the streams completely vanished, or at least were reduced to rivulets and water-holes unable to afford sufficient underground water to support an arboreal vegetation on the banks. Barrel. Circumstances such as these were not conducive to piscine life, but were just the conditions under which amphibians would thrive. With further increase in aridity, however, such that no seasonal return of the waters occurred to make aquatic egg-laying possible, came the restriction of the amphibia and the evolution of reptiles. Aside from the certain anatomical characteristics, which we need not enumerate, two features stand out sharply in the reptiles in contrast to the amphibians. They are first the loss of gill-breathing forever. The reptiles and their descendants, the mammals and the birds, depending solely upon their lungs for oxygen, and second, the development of certain embryonic envelopes known as the amnion and allantois. The true significance of both loss of gills and gain of allantois is the same air-breathing young. Embryonic Membranes The reptilian egg is a complex structure consisting not only of the male and female germplasm, but of a considerate amount of nutritive yolk sufficient to carry the creature well along toward perfection of body in obviating the necessity of a larval stage and a metamorphosis such as so many amphibians possess. This complex egg is surrounded by a protective envelope, the shell, and is invariably laid, if laid at all, on land. It is because of this last feature that the amnion and allantois have arisen. The amnion is a two-layered membrane growing out of the ventral wall of the embryo and entirely enveloping it. Between the layers is the amniotic fluid, which not only guards the creature against mechanical jars, but also serves to resist sudden changes of temperature, which might be fatal to the growing young. In other words, the amnion is protective in its function. The allantois, on the other hand, is respiratory. It, too, is a double-layered or sac-like membrane, arising in much the same way, an outgrowth, in fact, of the urinary bladder of the amphibian. It is abundantly supplied with blood vessels, directly continuous with those of the embryo. The allantois lies, in its full development, immediately beneath the porous shell, through which oxygen can enter, and, passing by osmosis through the allantoic membrane, oxygenate the included blood. Carbonic acid gas is given off at the same time. The bloodstream now carries the oxygen to the embryo and brings out more waste, and the process is continued. Thus it will be seen that the allantois has a function comparable to a lung and not to a gill, and it is to be doubted whether any reptilian egg could be placed in the water without drowning the embryo within. 
at all events no reptile bird nor mammal egg each of which possesses an allantois is ever laid in the water but always on land or else provision is made for its retention within the maternal body as in certain snakes the ichthyosaurs and all mammals above monotremata from this it will be seen that reptiles may survive under conditions of aridity many are true desert forms where amphibia might perhaps live as adults but could not pass on their life to future generations it is logical therefore to believe that whereas semi-aridity with seasonally recurring rains impelled amphibian evolution true aridity with undependable rains or none at all making amphibian economy impossible stimulated the evolution of the reptiles end of chapter twenty nine b recording by amy graymore two thousand and twelve amy's mind to your mind dot com chapter thirty of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines organic evolution by richard swan lull chapter thirty part a rise of reptiles and dominance of dinosaurs origin of reptiles the origin of reptiles from their ancient stegocephalian lineage took place in all probability in carboniferous time and before the close of the permian many of the principal lines of evolution had become established the evidence for this belief is partly direct through the permian paleontological record and partly indirect based upon the appearance in the trias of groups which must have had a long antecedent evolution the permian strata record the actual presence of no fewer than five out of the fifteen orders of reptiles which are recognized by williston and while most of them are primitive forms as one would be led to expect one group the progansaria represented by mesosaurus from brazil and south africa is noteworthy in being the first instance of the many which occur of the return of reptiles to the aquatic habitat yet more remarkable is the order theromorpha particularly the so-called polycosaurs among which certain genera have developed riotous growth especially in spinous processes of the vertebra some of which are extraordinarily long while others have lateral processes developed on the spines like the yard arms of a square rigged ship these fin-backed forms can be viewed in but one light they are racially senile and their utter absence from overlying strata points to their speedy extinction in addition to the five recorded orders there is reason to believe on the grounds mentioned above that at least six possibly seven others had permian representatives these are the shellonia or turtles the sarapterygia or plesiosaurs the ichthyosauria or fish lizards the squamata lizards only the rhynchocephalia or beaked reptiles the parasuchia or ancient crocodiles and possibly the dinosaurs among these several are aquatically inclined others terrestrial the former have been discussed in part in the chapter on aquatic adaptation chapter twenty the latter especially the dinosaurs will constitute the main theme of the present chapter and the next adaptive radiation of reptiles the mesozoic era has been called the age of reptiles for while higher forms the birds and mammals make their appearance during its course arising in all probability when the era was yet young they never seriously dispute with the reptilian horde their right to a place in the sun in fact to all places wherein an animal could live thus osborne's law of adaptive radiation which was applied by its distinguished author solely to the mammals is equally applicable to these cold-blooded forms for climactic zones were non-existent or but slightly differentiated and hence did not limit their poleward distribution as they do now and as a consequence of the various habitats which the wide world displays each had its admirably adapted reptilian denizens 
just as the world was later filled with mammalian hosts central form the central form was doubtless a short-legged crawling cotylosaur such as limnocellus a slow-moving primitive probably swamp-dwelling type but potent in evolutionary possibilities from the cotylosaurs there arose in the course of time other more strictly terrestrial creatures such as the lizards many of which have attained high adaptation to speed requirements yet another ancient reptile cadaliosaurus from the lower permian of germany was a long-limbed doubtless cursorial form the cursorial adaptation par excellence however lay with the dinosaurs as their bones and footprints show arboreal habitat arboreal habitat is difficult to prove on the part of any mesozoic or older reptiles for if any arboreal forms existed their remains in common with those of other forest-dwelling types would have had little chance of natural entombment and subsequent preservation but to-day the arboreal reptiles are numerous and varied to realize this one has but to recall the geckos with their adhesive padded feet or the chameleons with syndactyl grasping hands and feet and prehensile tail described in chapter twenty one there are authorities moreover whose belief in an arboreal ancestry for the birds is so firmly established that the presence of climbing reptiles even in the triassic or earlier while having no documentary evidence to its support nevertheless is by them assumed a priori atrial adaptation aerial or volant reptiles such as the pterodactyls were finely adapted to their habitat ranging as they did from the size of a sparrow to the largest of nature's flying mechanisms with ample powers both of varied and sustained flight but their origin is lost through the imperfection of the record of triassic life amphibious forms of the amphibious forms there were many for increasing humidity and we have ample evidence of the waxing and waning of moisture brought with it extensive areas the peopling of which awakened the water-dwelling instinct that had long been dormant in the reptilian blood thus we have as partially aquatic forms the turtles ancestral plesiosaurs parasuchia crocodilia and certain dinosaurs the sauropods and trachodontidae or duckbills aquatic adaptation truly aquatic life claimed in the course of time certain turtles the great marine ones of today and still greater ones archelon of the cretaceous the plesiosaurs proganosaurs ichthyosaurs sea lizards mosasaurs and thalatosaurs and sea crocodiles or the latisuchians in all seven orders either in their entirety or a large proportion thereof fossorial adaptation fossorial animals are rare as fossils for while burial is a prime requisite to fossilization self inhumation rarely carries with it the necessary imperviousness to error to ensure preservation hence we cannot point to a single ancient reptilian group as of extensive fossorial habits although in the cotylosaurs and pelicosaurs there are certain forms whose powerful implied musculature of arm and leg points to digging powers of no mean degree that any were wholly fossorial like certain living snakes tiflops and limbless lizards amphisbena we have no proof adaptive radiation of squamata thus it will be seen that during pre-tertiary times the reptilian adaptations were ample and varied with the dawn of the tertiary however came the final extinction of all but four reptilian orders one of which is represented by but a single relic form sphenodon found today only in remote new zealand this widespread extinction necessarily restricted the range of adaptation though within the group squamata which embraces the lizards and snakes we have a latter-day radiation comparable in a very modest way to the great reptilian radiation of the mesozoic for example we may enumerate ambulatory terrestrial many lizards horned toad cursorial 
Chlamydosaurus, the Australian frilled lizard, Arboreal, Chameleon, geckos, Aerial, Draco, the flying dragon, Fossorial, Tipclops, Euromoslex, Amphisbians, Legless, Amphibious, many serpents, some of the monitors, Varanus, which is a living relative of the ancient Mosasaurs, the Galapagus, Sea Iguana, Amblorhynchus, and others. Aquatic, the sea snakes, or Hydrophinae, all of which except one landlocked form in Lake Tall at Luzon, Philippine Islands, are marine and are found many miles from land. In fact, Matthew has said of the lizards, if some vast catastrophe should today blot out all the mammalian races including man and the birds, but leave the lizards and other reptiles still surviving, with the lower animals and plants, we might well expect the lizards in the course of geologic periods to evolve into a great and varied land fauna like the dinosaurs of the Mesozoic era. The age of reptiles may well be called the age of dinosaurs, for so far as terrestrial creatures go, they were the all-important forms, the other reptiles individually and collectively forming but the supporting cast to these stars in the great drama of medieval life. Place in Nature That the dinosaurs were reptiles goes without saying, although their appearance, at any rate in the eyes of those who would restore them in the flesh, was sometimes so very similar to that of certain great mammals of today that the uninitiated often confuse relationships and think of triceratops, for instance, as merely a very huge and somewhat better armed sort of rhinoceros. As reptiles they were exclusively lung-breathing and had a large egg, which they may or may not have laid before hatching. This, which is often merely a matter of family convenience, as among certain snakes, cannot be decided until actual eggs or unborn young are found, a very remote possibility. They were scaly or armored, this we know, whether they were cold-blooded or not is a debated question. Such activity as they must have shown seems to hint at a possibility of warm blood, and such a belief has met with some support. But in the tropical climate which their known habitat implies, there was little more need of a heat-maintaining mechanism than there is in modern cursorial lizards, the Australian frilled lizard Clantonidosaurus, for instance. There is no evidence on the part of dinosaurs of a heat-retaining clothing such as the birds and mammals possess. Living Relatives Of the forms now living, the crocodiles on the one hand and the birds on the other stand nearest the dinosaurs, and this may be a truer statement than it seems, for, as we shall see, the dinosaurs were diphyletic, the two races running separate, though in part parallel, evolutionary courses and the one group seems nearer the crocodiles and the other nearer the birds. When one comes to work out a concise technical description of a crocodile and place it beside that of a dinosaur, he will see at once the similarity of the two groups. For instance, Williston thus defines the order crocodilia. Two temporary vacuities, teeth, thecodont, that is, socketed, a false palate, Cubus excluded from acetabulum, hip socket, single coracoid, ribs double-headed, diapophysial, arising from the transverse processes of the vertebra, subaquatic or aquatic. And of the dinosaurs, he says, ambulatory reptiles with two temporary vacuities, no false palate, pubis entering acetabulum, ribs double-headed, diapophysial, to which he might have added single coracoid, teeth thecodont, subaquatic, and for both orders, phalangeal formula 23453 and an intertarsal joint. In other words, the only characters which are not common to both orders are the presence in the crocodile of a false palate, merely a device for eating under water, and found elsewhere and the exclusion of the pubic element of the pelvis from the hip socket. Ancestral Stock Dinosaurs, as befits their high estate, were of ancient lineage. One of our best authorities on dinosaurian phylogeny 
Dr. Friedrich von Huny, derives from them the primitive Cotylosaurian stock, which arose in Carboniferous time and continued until the Trias. During Permian time there arose from the Cotylosaurs the group Protorosauria, of which Protorosaurus is the type, and out of these in turn the Triassic Parasuchia. Huny derives all dinosaurs from the same stock, but considers them diphyletic from their origin, that is, that the Ornithischia and Saurischia are unrelated save through a common ancestry. Duration The known record of dinosaurs extends from the Middle Triassic, Muschelkalk, to the very close of Cretaceous time. This is particularly true of the carnivorous dinosaurs. The plant-feeding Ornithischia, on the other hand, do not appear in the fossil record until late Triassic, Raetic, but are doubtless older, their subsequent duration being coexistive with that of the carnivores. The sauropoda, or amphibious dinosaurs, are shorter-lived as a race, and they do not appear before the Middle Jurassic, Bathonian, and become extinct in the early Cretaceous, Comanchian. It is highly probable that the recorded beginnings of all of these forms are not so remote as their actual inception. Of their survival into the tertiary, however, as certain authorities have held, there is grave doubt. Distribution. Dinosaurs first appear in Germany at Gogolin, Upper Silesia, but this does not necessarily imply that that was their original radiation center. On the contrary, the belief has been expressed that one must go further west, where a great continent is thought by some paleontologists to have extended across what is now the North Atlantic Basin, thus connecting Europe and North America, and that somewhere within the confines of this continent the dinosaurs arose and began their worldwide march of conquest. For they extend the world over, across the United States and into Canada, in Brazil, in Patagonia, from England, Belgium, France, and Portugal, to Germany and Austria, in faraway India, even to Australia, and in Africa, in its central, eastern, and extreme southern part. We have no record of their occurrence in Asia, north of the Oriental realm, nor yet in New Zealand, and there is reason to believe that this absence of record is significant. It may, however, be due to lack of discovery. Habitat. Their habitat was varied, but in all probability their initial evolution, that for speed, took place under stress of semi-aridity of climate, and their main lines were eminently terrestrial forms. With the changing climatic cycles which came with the passage of time, came dinosaurian adaptation to humid conditions, so that at least two groups, Sauropoda and Trachodontidae, give indubitable evidence of an amphibious habitat. Habits. In habits, the dinosaurs were nearly as varied as the mammals are today. Carnivorous, some small, preying upon such feeble folk as they might overcome, others giant, the most terrible terrestrial devourers of flesh the world has ever seen. Again, others were herbivorous, some with feeble dentition, the food being drawn unmasticated down a most capacious throat others with a dental apparatus for the reduction of the most resistant herbage, such as would offer little promise of satisfaction to the living herbivores. In certain instances, the teeth are greatly reduced, as in Diplodocus and Stegosaurus, the reduction accompanying other signs of racial senility. Yet others, like Strutcomomimus of the North American Cretaceous, were utterly bereft of teeth, the dietary of such forms it is difficult to conjecture with any degree of certainty. Size. The minimum recorded size, that of Camposagnacus, was about two feet, with the bulk of a domestic cat. The footprints of the Connecticut Valley, however, record the existence of feet half as long as those of Compsognacus. Hardly terrible lizards, as the term dinosaur implies. The other extreme was reached by Brachiosaurus of East Africa and Western North America, whose overall length has been variously estimated by its Teutonic discoverers to be upward of 120 feet, but by Matthew not to exceed 80 feet. 
Nevertheless, it was an animal of such robust proportions that its weight must have been about forty tons, greater than that of any living being except the larger of the modern whales. Classification The latest classification of dinosaurs is that of Matthew, 1915, which is somewhat more conservative than the one proposed by von Huene in 1914. An adaptation of Matthew's classification with characteristic genera is as follows. Cohort, Dinosauria, Order, Saurichia, Suborder, Celoisauria, Compsognatha, Podocasaurus, Triassic, Massachusetts, genera to be described below, Sedurus, Jurassic, North America, Compsognathus, Jurassic, Bavaria, Suborder, Pachypodosauria, Ancosaurus, Triassic, Connecticut, Xandodon, Triassic, Europe, Platyosaurus, Triassic, Europe, Suborder, Theropoda, Megalosaurus, Jurassic to Cretaceous, Europe, Allosaurus, Comanchian, North America, Ceratosaurus, Comanchian, North America, Tyrannosaurus, Cretaceous, North America, Ornithodetus, Comanchian, North America, Ornithomimus, Cretaceous, North America, Suborder Sauropoda, Brontosaurus, Comanchian, United States, Brachiosaurus, Gigantosaurus, Comanchian, United States and Africa, Diplodocus, Comanchian, United States, Order Ornithischia, Predentata, Suborder Ornithopoda, Unarmored, Camptosaurus, Comanchian, United States, Iguanodon, Comanchian, Europe, Trachodon, Cretaceous, North America, Corythosaurus, Cretaceous, North America, Suborder Stegosauria, Armored, Scoditosaurus, Jurassic, Europe, Stegosaurus, Jurassic and Comanchian, Europe and United States, Ankylosaurus, Cretaceous, North America, Suborder Ceratopsia, Horned, Monoclonius, Cretaceous, North America, Styracosaurus, Cretaceous, North America, Triceratops, Cretaceous, North America, Tarasaurus, Cretaceous, North America. Contrast of phyla. There are two main phyla of dinosaurs to which the rather unwieldy names of Saurischia and Ornithischia have been given, while undergoing in many ways a remarkable parallelism of evolutionary change show notwithstanding some very constant contrasting features these two orders may be thus briefly defined saurischia generally carnivorous except the sauropoda with teeth in the anterior portion of the mouth compressed slightly curved crowns with serrated margins or spoon or pencil-shaped teeth without predentary bone connecting the two halves of the lower jaw with powerful sharp pointed curved claws and dense hollow bones with well finished articulations except in the sauropoda pelvis triradiate with a hip bone or ilium elongated fore and aft a simple pubis directed downward and forward and an ischium directed downward and backward includes the bipedal carnivores and the quadrupedal amphibious herbivorous sauropods ornithischia predentata teeth in rear of jaws only, sometimes forming a wonderful magazine of successional teeth, and a toothless, predentary bone in front, which opposed the equally toothless, except in hypsilophodon, premaxillary bones above, premaxillary bones sheathed with horny skin or a turtle-like beak for the prehension of food, limb bones less compact and less well-finished at their extremities, than in the carnivores, claws depressed, sometimes hoof-like, pelvis tetraradiate, in that the pubis consists of two branches, one of which, the prepubis, extends downward and forward, while the pubis proper lies parallel with the ischium. The ornithischian pelvis is quite suggestive of that of a bird. The saurischian, on the other hand, is more crocodilian. End of chapter 30, part A. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah.
Chapter Thirty of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gimes. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter Thirty, Part B. Saurischia. The earliest known dinosaurs belong to the Saurischia, and they exist with conservative changes to the close of the Mesozoic. The principal evolutionary changes which they show are a gradual increase in size of body and a proportionate decrease in that of the forelimbs, the function of which is never support nor locomotion, but solely prehension. These creatures, therefore, walked or ran entirely on the hind legs, the anterior part of the body being balanced by the weight of the long slender tail. When they ran, the limbs were well under the body, and the stride was alternate like that of an ostrich or bipedal lizard. As their numerous bird-like footprints impressed upon the sands of the Connecticut Valley imply, some of the better-known carnivorous dinosaurs are Cholerosauria. Representatives of this group are Podocasaurus, an extremely slender, agile, carnivorous dinosaur from the Triassic sandstones of the Connecticut Valley, south hadley massachusetts the body tail and limbs are preserved in the one specimen known and indicate an animal about four feet in length of which the tail includes more than half many footprints described under the name of grolator he who walks on stilts were undoubtedly made by creatures similar to this coderous with bones so delicate that the walls of the vertebra for instance are of paper-like thinness it was a small form from the Morrison Formation of Wyoming and the Potomac Formation of Maryland, and is incompletely known. Comsignathus, known from a very perfect skeleton from the Jurassic of Eichstatt, Bavaria, and coming from the famous Stolenhofen Quarry, which also produced Archaeopteryx, the earliest known bird. Comsignathus, as has already been stated, is the smallest recorded dinosaur. Pachypodosauria. The most notable genus here is Anchisaurus, which, together with the allied Amosaurus, is known from several more or less complete skeletons from the Connecticut Trias. The three most perfect skeletons come from the town of Manchester, and range in size from perhaps five to eight feet. The hand was large compared with that of later forms, and bore one large and two smaller grasping claws. The teeth were not so perfectly adapted to a flesh diet as were those of the theropoda. These skeletons are preserved at Yale. Zanclodon and Placosaurus, larger old-world forms, out of the latter of which von Huny would derive not only the latter megalosaurs, but the amphibious dinosaur Sauropoda as well. Theropoda. This group includes Allosaurus, one of the best known of carnivorous dinosaurs, for there is in the American Museum of Natural History, New York City, a practically complete skeleton mounted in a most lifelike pose. This creature is of gigantic size, being 34 feet 2 inches in length by 8 feet 3 inches high in its present almost quadrupedal posture. It was collected from Como Bluff, near Medicine Bow, Wyoming, whence came so many of the wonderful dinosaurian and contemporaneous mammalian species which the Yale Museum possesses. Allosaurus had a comparatively inflexible, though deep body, and a tail which could undergo but little movement as compared with that of a modern lizard or a snake, since its principal use, that of a counterpoi, was best subserved by its being held out rather stiffly behind. The jaws were loosely hung, and evidently could be opened very widely, and there is evidence of some movement of the upper jaw upon the cranium as though the chunks of the prey which the creature tore off were at times of considerable size, or possibly the victim was swallowed whole. The teeth are powerful, recurved, and admirably adapted to the owner's implied habits. Both hands and feet were armed with powerful curved claws, doubtless sheathed with talons like those of a huge eagle. Ceratosaurus, 
which is known from a single well-preserved skeleton in the united states national museum and is a contemporary of allosaurus though not so large the remarkable thing about ceralosaurus as the name implies is the presence of a compressed horn-like process upon the nose which must have borne a horny sheath this is one of the extremely rare associations of the primarily defensive horns and carnivorous habits for among the mammals and indeed the later dinosaurs as well it is the herbivores only which are thus endowed the culminating form of this race has been most appropriately named tyrannosaurus rex the king of tyrant saurians by professor osborne and was as matthew says the climax of evolution of the giant flesh-eating dinosaurs it reached a length of forty-seven feet and in bulk must have equaled the mammoth or the mastodon or the largest living elephants the massive hind limbs supporting the whole weight of the body exceeded the limbs of the great proboscideans in bulk and in a standing position the animal was eighteen to twenty feet high as against twelve for the largest african elephants or the southern mammoth the head is four feet three inches long three feet four inches wide and three feet four inches deep and two feet nine inches wide the long deep powerful jaws set with teeth from three to six inches long and an inch wide to this powerful armament were added the great sharp claws of the hind feet and probably the fore feet curved like those of eagles but six or eight inches in length the exact reconstruction of the fore feet is the only doubtful part the forelimb is very small relatively to the huge size of the animal but probably was constructed much as in the allosaurus with two or three large curved claws the inner claw opposing the others this animal probably reached the maximum of size and of development of teeth and claws of which its type of animal mechanism was capable its bulk precluded quickness and agility it must have been designed to attack and prey upon the ponderous and slow-moving horned and armored dinosaurs with which its remains are found and whose massive cuirass and weapons of defense are well matched with its teeth and claws the momentum of its huge body involved a seemingly slow and lumbering action an inertia of its movements difficult to start and difficult to shift or to stop such movements are widely different from the agile swiftness which we naturally associate with a beast of prey but an animal which exceeds an average elephant in bulk no matter what its habits is compelled by the laws of mechanics to the ponderous movements appropriate to its gigantic size these movements directed and controlled by a reptilian brain must needs be largely automatic and instinctive we cannot doubt indeed that the carnivorous dinosaurs developed along with their elaborately perfect mechanism for attack an equally elaborate series of instincts guiding their action to effective purpose and a complex series of automatic responses to the stimulus afforded by the sight and action of their prey might very well mimic intelligent pursuit and attack always with certain limits set by the inflexible character of such automatic adjustments but no animal as large as tyrannosaurus could leap or spring upon another and its slow stride quickening into a swift resistless rush might well end in unavoidable impalement upon the great horns of triceratops feudal weapons against a small and active enemy but designed no doubt to meet just such attacks as these a true picture of these combats of titans of the ancient world we cannot draw perhaps we will never be able to reconstruct it but the above considerations may serve to show how widely it would differ from the pictures based upon any modern analogies one may well inquire why it is that no such gigantic carnivores have evolved among the mammalian land animals the largest predaceous mammals living today are the lion and tiger the bears although some of them are much larger are not generally carnivorous except for the polar bear which is partly aquatic preying chiefly upon seals and fish there are indeed carnivorous whales of gigantic size but no very large land carnivore 
There were, it is true, during the tertiary and Pleistocene, lions and other carnivores considerably larger than the living species, but none of them attained the size of their largest herbivorous contemporaries, or even approached it. Among the dinosaurs, on the other hand, we find that, setting aside Brontosaurus and its allies as aquatic, the predaceous kinds equaled or exceeded the largest of the herbivorous sorts. The difference is striking, and it does not seem likely that it is merely accidental. The explanation lies probably in the fact that the large herbivorous mammals are much more intelligent and active, and would be able to use their weapons of defense so as to defy the attacks of relatively slow-moving giant beasts of prey, as they do also the more active but less powerful assaults of smaller ones. The elephant or the rhinoceros is in fact practically immune from the attacks of carnivores, and would still be so were the carnivores to increase in size. The large modern carnivores prey upon herbivores of medium or smaller size, which they are active enough to surprise or run down. Carnivores of much larger size would be too slow and heavy in movements to catch small prey, while the larger herbivores, by intelligent use of their defensive weapons, could still fend them off successfully. In consequence, giant carnivores would mid no field for action in the Cenozoic world, and hence they have not been evolved. But not all carnivorous dinosaurs, even of the Mesozoic, were so huge, for as we have small forms in the Triassic and Jurassic, so we find them in more or less intimate association with their larger cousins to the end of the dinosaurian career. Out of the famous bone cabin quarry in eastern Wyoming, where the author was initiated into the mysteries of bone digging, and which has produced Allosaurus, comes Ornitholestes, an extremely slender form whose total length was not more than seven feet, and whose bulk could not have exceeded that of a setter dog. This form had long slender fingers, none of which were armed with the cruel curved claws of the megalosaurs. This suggested to Professor Osborne the idea that perhaps it may have preyed upon contemporary birds, so the name Ornitholestes, the bird robber, was given to it. Another student suggested that it may have preyed upon fish, and its association with amphibious dinosaurs lends color to the proposition. Be that as it may, the contrast between the marked agility of the present form and the more ponderous character of Allosaurus must have been reflected in the prey. A successor to the Comanchian Ornitholestes was Ornithomimus of late Cretaceous time, a form long known from its slender, very bird-like feet and a few other elements of its frame. The entire skeleton of an intermediate form, Struthiot menace, has only just come to light, having been discovered in Alberta in 1914. In its general proportions, it is what one would be led to expect from the character of the feet, but the surprise came in the fact that its jaws are entirely toothless, the skull reminding one quite forcibly of that of a large cursorial bird. In Europe and elsewhere than in North America, the remains of carnivorous dinosaurs are far less complete, and as a consequence, except for some very marvelously preserved Triassic types, we know but little of them. The generic name of Megalosaurus is applied to most of the later forms from the Jurassic to the final extinction, but doubtless covers as varied an assemblage of larger dinosaurs as lived in the New World. Sauropoda. To this group various names have been given. They were called Cetiosauria by Steely, in allusion to their whale-like bulk, and Opsithocelia by Owen, because their neck vertebrae, which have a ball and socket articulation, have the hollow facet behind and the convex one in front. According to the law of priority, this latter term takes precedence over the others, but Professor Marsh's term sauropoda is the one in most common use. These creatures were all quadrupedal, although there is reason to believe that when waterborne, they may have reared up on the hind feet. Their backbone is a marvel of complexity and has been described in some detail in Chapter 12. The greatest economy of material is manifest in its structure, 
giving maximum strength with a minimum of bone substance. The limb bones, on the other hand, are extremely massive with very rugose ends, as though the joints were formed very largely of cartilage, in sharp contrast with their bony perfection in the carnivorous forms. This imperfection of the joints in the sauropoda admits of but one interpretation, that of aquatic life, when the weight, largely water-borne, did not subject the ends of the limb bones to the mechanical impact, as it would were the animal wholly terrestrial. Matthew has directed attention to the fact that a line drawn from shoulder to hip separated the lighter portion of the animal's frame from the weightier, as though it represented the water line. Extreme lightness, especially of the neck, is necessary that it be not unwieldy in the creature's search for food, while weighty limbs were also necessary to enable their owner to wade into comparatively deep water, for these forms were doubtless more wading than swimming in their habits. In order to support their huge weight, the limbs had become more or less pillar-like, as the straight limb bones imply, and the sprawling gait of most living reptiles is unthinkable with so ponderous a form. All of our ideas of reptilian locomotion have been colored by observation upon living forms, often under unnatural conditions. For a crocodile just emerging from the water walks high on its legs, more like a mammal, and does not sprawl until it has come to rest. Then the limbs, one after another, are lifted and brought into the recumbent position. The teeth of the sauropods are clearly derived from those of carnivores, as they occupy the same place and arise in a similar way. They have, however, lost their sharp point and serrated margins and have become more or less spoon-shaped. As a rule, they are large, but in Diplodocus they are reduced to the size of a lead pencil and are confined to the extreme anterior part of the jaws. Claws also are clearly derived from those of carnivores, and they are laterally compressed, but not so curved, and give no evidence of grasping powers. The foot bore at least three such claws, while the hand evidently possessed but one. The food must have consisted of some abundant and easily obtainable aquatic plants, which were probably dislodged by the claws and rake-like teeth, and swallowed without mastication. The occasional presence within the ribs of highly polished siliceous pebbles of a material foreign to the matrix in which the specimens were found points to some sort of muscular gizzard-like structure which, aided by the stones, would reduce the otherwise inert mass of food to a proper condition for subsequent digestion. Such a thing is not without modern or ancient parallel. Among the notable sauropod genera is Brontosaurus, of which the very complete original specimen is preserved at Yale. A mounted specimen of similar proportion in the American Museum of Natural History measures 66 feet 8 inches long and had an estimated living weight of 38 tons. This specimen is from the Comanchean near Medicine Bow, Wyoming, and Yale specimen from Como Bluff, half a dozen miles away. Diplodocus, another sauropod, differs from Brontosaurus in the more slender form, so that even with a length of 87 feet, it was by no means so weighty as the latter. All of these creatures had most of their length in the extremely slender neck and tail, the body being comparatively short and compact, quite elephantine, in fact, especially when viewed in connection with the limbs. In Diplodocus, possibly also in Brontosaurus, the terminal ten feet of the tail was like a whiplash, as the contained vertebra did not decrease further in size. This may have proved a very efficient weapon of defense, if its use was analogous to that of certain modern lizards in which the tail has much of the effectiveness of a black snake whip. Aside from this caudal whiplash, the sauropoda were apparently weaponless, relying entirely upon their huge bulk or upon submergence for immunity from attack. An essentially complete skeleton of Diplodocus from Sheep Creek, Wyoming, about 15 miles from Bone Cabin Quarry, is now mounted in the Carnegie Museum at Pittsburgh. By far the most gigantic of sauropods has been made known to us in its entirety from East Africa, whence with characteristic effectiveness the German government 
has secured a large amount of material upon which its savants were at work at the outbreak of the great war this creature to which the appropriate name of gigantosaurus has been given is evidently the same as that described by the american briggs as brachiosaurus out of deference to its mighty forelimbs which contrary to dinosaurian custom exceeded the hind ones in length if its proportions were those of diplodocus as the german authorities at first imagined a hundred and twenty feet for its total length would not be far from right but the tail proves to be short which brings the length down to eighty feet or more matthew therefore regards the creature as somewhat exceeding brontosaurus and diplodocus in total bulk but distinguished by much larger forelimbs and an extremely long neck a giraffe-like wader adapted to take refuge in deeper waters more out of reach of the fierce carnivores of the land not all sauropoda however were large for the author has restored from the potomac beds comanchian of maryland an adult form pleurocelets whose total length did not exceed twelve or thirteen feet the sauropoda judging from their huge bulk were evidently senile forms and one would hardly expect their survival over a long period of geologic time so that while their more conservative relatives the carnivores persisted these forms were early released from the extensive burden of the flesh and suffered racial death early in comanchean time some millions of years before the passing of the dinosaurian dynasty we know of no reason other than racial old age or a restriction of their particular habitat for their extinction End of chapter 30. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Chapter 31A of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 31. Beaked Dinosaurs and Origin of Birds Ornithischia. The general characters of Ornithischia, the predentate or beaked dinosaurs, have already been given. They were derived, in common with the Saurischia from the Parasuchian stock, and the Ornithopoda, the more conservative of them, underwent an evolution which very closely paralleled that of carnivores. Like the Saurischia, they too gave rise to aberrant races, which, however, did not, as in the Sauropoda, emphasise bodily bulk, so much as arms and armour. And among the later of them were those whose grotesque bizarrery exceeded that of any known terrestrial forms. None of the Ornithischia was very large, compared even with the carnivores, and their bulk was vastly less than that of Brontosaurus. First Record the first known record of Ornithischia is that of their fossil tracks upon the Connecticut Valley Late Triassic rocks, for with some of the footprints are seen the impressions of smaller hands, whose five fingers were armed with rounded claws, like those of known predentates, but totally dissimilar to the grasping claws of a carnivore. And in contemporaneous rocks from far off Colorado has been found Nanosaurus, which has been recognised as pertaining to this order. Doubtless the Ornithischia antedated the close of Triassic time, but there is little evidence that their antiquity is as great as that of the Saurischia. Ornithopoda As we have seen from the classification, three suborders of Ornithischia are recognised. Of these, the first is Ornithopoda, which includes bird-footed forms, unarmoured and bipedal in gait, though, unlike the carnivores, they occasionally assumed quadrupedal posture while resting or feeding. Two of the more notable genera are the Connecticut Valley Anamurpus and Sauropus, known only from the footprints, and with an estimated length varying from two to eight feet. The Colorado Nanosaurus mentioned earlier is another small form, as yet imperfectly known. These are all Triassic. Jurassic Ornithopoda are unknown in America, though they presumably lived in some part of the continent, the absence of a fossil record corresponding to the absence of strata suitable for their preservation. The Comanchian is characterised by two American genera, Laosaurus, 
a slender type not exceeding six and a half feet in length, and Camptosaurus, several more or less complete skeletons of which are known from Wyoming. The latter are conservative in character and in size, ranging from seven to seventeen feet. A related form is Iguanodon from Europe, known from no fewer than seventeen remarkably preserved skeletons found in a coal mine at Bernissart in Belgium. These creatures had evidently fallen into an open fissure in the ancient Carboniferous strata, and there, unable to extricate themselves, they died, were buried, and were subsequently preserved together with the remains of other reptiles. Their skeletons, ten of which are mounted erect, the others prone on the rock, are to be seen in the Brussels Museum of Natural History. Iguanodon was about thirty-four feet in length, and bore upon the hand, by way of a weapon, a peculiar spike-like thumb. Remains of the genus have also been found on the Isle of Wight, whence it was described by Sir Richard Owen long before the fortunate Belgian discovery. The English Wealden, a Comanchean strata, besides yielding Iguanodon, has produced a smaller form, Hypsilophodon, peculiar in having teeth in the anterior part of the mouth, a characteristic which distinguishes it from every other beaked dinosaur of which our knowledge is sufficiently complete to make a comparison, and in this regard it must be a persistently primitive form. Possibly the Triassic forms also possess these teeth, and this may yet be proved. Both Camptosaurus and Iguanodon are known from the European Middle Jurassic on. The Comanchean of Tendaguru, East Africa, whence came the Brachiosaurus, has also produced an iguanodon-like form, but the details of its structure are not yet announced from Berlin. Cretaceous time produced several genera of ornithopoda, which may collectively be called duck-billed dinosaurs, from the peculiar character of their mouth, the anterior part of which was broad and flat as the name implies, while the hinder portion of the jaws contained the wonderful dental battery of which we have spoken. No creature of whatever sort is known to possess more teeth than Trachodon, the terminal member of the race. Trachodon is the best known genus, as mounted species from Wyoming and Montana may be seen at the Yale, American and United States National Museums. Its length did not exceed thirty feet but it was a fine cursorial type. It also possessed a powerful tail, which, judging from the vertical expansion which the bones imply, was admirably adapted for swimming. For Trachodon was the contemporary of Tyrannosaurus, and the swimming tail must have been most effectively used when, hard-pressed, it took to the water for safety. Several mummied specimens of Trachodon have come to light, one of which, from Wyoming, preserved in the American Museum, is truly marvellous in the degree of its perfection, for not only is the skeleton entirely articulated except for its hind feet and tail, but the skin, shrunken down on the bones by the heat of the sun immediately after death, is also perfectly preserved, together with traces of muscles and tendons. The skin was utterly without defensive armour, for, as now preserved, it is very thin and is covered with small, tubercle-like scales. The hands, which possessed four fingers, were webbed, but whether or not the feet were webbed is not known. They were, however, in other related types, Corythosaurus, for example. Trachodon comes from the close of the Cretaceous, the so-called Lance Formation. In rocks of a preceding age, Judith River and Edmonton, there have been discovered some curiously grotesque allied forms. Saurolophus, with a backward extending crest on the skull, and Corythosaurus, with a remarkable helmet-like heightening of the cranium. Both of these are known from articulated specimens collected in the Red Deer region of Alberta, Canada, by Mr. Barnum Brown, who, by his discoveries, has brought us to a clearer understanding of so many of the formerly ill-known Cretaceous forms. These creatures, however, were not confined to the West, for the New Jersey Cretaceous marlbeds have produced Hadrosaurus, an ally of Trachodon, and a form which has been known to science for many years. Stegosauria The Stegosauria, or armoured dinosaurs, were all quadrupedal, doubtless owing to the great weight of their armament. The armour took the form of high crested plates or spines, or massive armour plates, sometimes welded into a broad cuirass over the hips, 
evidently the most vulnerable portion of the creature's anatomy. They may well have evolved from the iguanodont-like dinosaurs, developing the armour and consequent modifications of the frame as a defence against their carnivorous enemies. The degree of perfection of the armour in some of the later forms is such as to render them practically invulnerable to any form of animal attack. The oldest known stegosaurian is Skeledosaurus, from the English Lias formation of Lower Jurassic Age, where the single known specimen was entombed, strangely enough, in marine strata, due probably to its floating carcass having drifted out to sea from some ancient river besides which it had lived. As preserved in the British Museum of Natural History, Skeledosaurus is only twelve and a half feet long, and its armour consists of two rows of oval bony scutes, each with a low fore and aft keel, not unlike similar elements in a modern crocodile. In addition to these, there are a pair of large spines on the shoulder. In late Jurassic and early Comanchean time, we have recorded several armoured dinosaurs in England and the adjacent continent, known as Polacanthus and Omosaurus. Of these, the former is small, not over 12 feet in length by 3 in height, with a broad rump shield formed of coalesced plates and sundry spine-like plates, which have been arranged by the restorer in two rows along the neck, back and tail. Their precise position, however, is not assured. Omosaurus is another heavily armoured form, some species of which are very large, it is as yet incompletely known. Stegosaurus was a late Jurassic and early Comanchean type, but in spite of the fact that it has given its name to the group of armoured dinosaurs, it was not typical, being a highly spinescent senile side branch which died out without issue. In many ways it was the most grotesque of dinosaurs, an awkward angular brute, very high at the rump and low at the withers, with the back ornamented by two rows of huge upstanding plates, and the end of the tail armed with fearful horn-like spines twenty-five inches or more in length. The huge plates which ran along the back culminated in ones over the pelvis or the base of the tail, beyond which they diminished. A study of the skeleton mounted at Yale and another articulated specimen at Washington betrays a great muscular power, especially in the tail and hind limbs. The inference is therefore that the plates served as passive, the spines for active defence, possibly offence. But the nervous system of Stegosaurus is the most remarkable feature, for its brain was very diminutive, the entire cranial cavity having a volume of but 56 cc. Thus the estimated weight of the brain could not have exceeded two and a half ounces, while the total weight of the animal must have been greater than that of the largest living elephant whose brain averages at least eight pounds, fifty times that of the dinosaur. In comparing the relative potential intelligence of the two, one has also to bear in mind the great preponderance of the cerebrum, the seat of intellect, over the other parts of the elephantine brain, while in Stegosaurus the cerebrum constituted hardly more than a third of the entire brain weight, or, as Professor Williston has expressed it, the seat of Stegosaur's intelligence is no greater in volume than that of a three-week-old kitten. In contrast with the diminutive brain case, however, the neural canal in the sacrum is of startling dimensions, for a cast thereof displaces no less than 1200 cc of water, this giving it a mass more than twenty times that of the brain. This was the seat of the reflex and coordinating control of the huge hind limb and caudal muscles, and is further evidence of their very frequent and effective use. The life of Stegosaurus was not psychological, but essentially physiological, an animated, largely automatic machine. The Cretaceous rocks of North America have produced other, more conservative armoured dinosaurs, Nadosaurus, Stegopelia, and Ankylosaurus, of which the last, again owing to the success of Barnum Brown, is best known. Ankylosaurus was a contemporary of Tyrannosaurus and the duck-billed dinosaurs, and was, as Matthew says, more effectively, though less grotesquely armoured, than its more ancient relative, Stegosaurus. The body is covered with massive bony plates, set close together and lying flat over the surface from head to tip of tail. 
While the stegosaur's body was narrow and compressed, in this animal it is exceptionally broad and wide. Spreading ribs are coossified with the vertebrae, making a very solid support for the traverse rows of armor plates. The head is broad, triangular, flat-topped and solidly armored, the plates consolidated with the surface of the skull and overhanging sides and front, the nostrils and eyes overhung by plates and bosses of bone, and the tail ended in a blunt, heavy club of massive plates consolidated to each other and to the tip of the tail vertebrae. The legs were short, massive and straight, ending probably in elephant-like feet. The animal has well been called the most ponderous animated citadel the world has ever seen, and we may suppose that when it tucked in its legs and settled down on the surface, it would be proof even against the attacks of the terrible Tyrannosaur. Ankylosaurus is a remarkable reptilian prototype of the armoured mammalian glyptodonts of the Pleistocene, the similarity even extending to a club-like fusion of armour on the tail, especially in the genus Doedicarus. In Doedicarus' time, it was the great saber-toothed cat Smilodon, against whose attacks the creature may have guarded itself in much the same way as the ankylosaur met those of Tyrannosaurus. End of chapter 31a Chapter 31 of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francis Wicks. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Part 3 The Evidences of Evolution. Section 3 Paleontology. Chapter 31b Beak Dinosaurs and Origin of Birds. Ceratopsia. The horned dinosaurs, or Ceratopsia, are as far as we know exclusively North American, and more than that their remains come entirely from the eastern uplift of the Rocky Mountain region, from Alberta to New Mexico. That they lived within these narrow limits, however, is hardly to be supposed, but their source and origin are alike unknown. Their geologic range is also brief in extent, as they are confined exclusively to the Upper Cretaceous period. The degree of their evolution, when they first appear, is, however, indicative of an origin not later than the Comanchian. Triceratops is a late Cretaceous member of the group, but is the best known and may be taken as typical. It was a huge creature of rhinoceron aspect from 20 to 25 feet in length, of which from one quarter to one third consisted of the great head, for whereas in all other dinosaurs the head is small, here the reverse is true. This is due partly to the great expansion of the cranial roof for the support of the horns, but particularly to the backward extension of the rear of the skull into a widely expanded frill or crest for the protection of the neck and also for the attachment of the powerful muscles of the back of the neck, giving this group of animals tremendous prowess, correlated with their armament and the great bulk and power of the enemies which they were called upon to withstand. One triceratops skull in the Yale collection measures eight feet overall and that of the allied Taurosaurus eight and a half feet making the latter the largest known skull of a land animal. The skeleton of Triceratops mounted in the United States National Museum gives evidence of enormous strength, especially in the great forelimbs and shoulders. But the armament was the most striking thing, for the mouth was armed anteriorly with a sharp cutting beak like that of a turtle, and the nose and portion of the skull above the eyes bore huge horns, three in number, hence the name Triceratops, three-horned face. Ceratopsia are known from three geologic levels, the Judith River, Belly River, then the Edmonton, and finally the Lance. In the Judith River forms, the nasal horn was always the dominant one, straight or curved, either forward or backward, while the frontal horns above the eyes range from mere rudiments to fairly well-developed organs. The principal Judith River genera were Monoclonius and Ceratops. Another was Styracosaurus, which was marvelously spinescent, having a huge straight nasal horn, and at least eight more horn-like processes around the margin of the frill. The crest in all of these earlier types was incomplete in that it was penetrated by two large apertures, one on either side. In lance forms, the frontal horns were predominant and were very long in the latter types, while the nasal tended to reduce, becoming entirely obsolete in one genus, Diceratops. Triceratops and Diceratops both had a completely bony frill with no trace of the ancestral apertures. In Taurosaurus, on the other hand, while the horns were like those of Triceratops, 
the two apertures still persisted in the immensely expanded crest. That these horns and the defense of frill were put to actual use is highly evident, for broken and healed horns, broken jaws, and punctured crests are not unusual with these skulls. And these are the deep grievous wounds, doubtless few compared with the many superficial injuries which the creatures must have suffered in the combats of rival males or in defense against their arch enemy, the tyrant Saurian. Summary As in the history of nations, the members of various human races intermingle, so the dinosaurs are interwoven not alone with the various types of their own stock, but with the other kinds of animals and plants, which together with physical conditions go to make up the environing complex. A summary of the changing life conditions with their influence on the success of dinosaurian societies is necessary to an understanding of their evolution. The first relics of dinosaurian life are found in the early Mesozoic, mid-Triassic rocks of Central Europe, though as they appear shortly after in those of North America, one is led to infer that the initial evolution occurred in what may have been an inectant landmass lying across the North Atlantic. Ancestrally, the dinosaurs were quadrupeds, remotely related to the crocodiles, but the increasing aridity of climate, clearly indicated by the character of the geologic sediments, placed a high premium on ability to travel rapidly and far in search of food and drink, and may well have been the impelling force that raised these creatures erect from the prone gait and posture of their progenitors, and stimulated their rapid evolution into the several types. The so-called continental rocks include such as are formed by stream-borne and lake-borne sediment, or by sands and volcanic ash carried by the winds. In contrast to marine deposits, these are extremely scarce, and yet they alone, with rare exceptions, contain the remains of terrestrial animals. We are given, however, aside from scattered records, three or four vivid pictures of the environment, both physical and organic, wherein the dinosaurs dwelt. Fortunately for us, these glimpses are given in the early stages, in the middle, and at the close of the dinosaurian career, showing the race in the period of its youth, its full maturity, and in its extreme old age. Triassic. The first of these pictures is of great interest, for the scene is laid in what is now the Connecticut Valley, the time late Triassic. Here one must image a broad valley rimmed by environing uplands of older rocks, in its climate and sparse vegetation similar to the conditions to be seen today by the traveler through the semi-arid regions of the great southwest. The plant life is somber, huge scouring rushes, ferns, and pines, with no flowering plant to break the monotony of the dull, dust-covered greens. Here and there are dry stream beds, carrying at times great floods, while occasionally there are formed extensive bodies of water with characteristic insects and other invertebrates, fishes, and crocodile-like reptiles. In the Connecticut Valley deposits, skeletons are extremely rare, and the few which have been found are largely those of dinosaurs, and in but three or four localities. The footprints, however, for which this region is justly famous, are numberless, and indicate hosts of creatures of more than a hundred kinds, a fuller record of vertebrate life than in any other time and place in the geologic past. The dinosaurs are mainly carnivorous, though impressions of the feet of herbivores give indubitable evidence of their presence at this time. Comanchian. During the Long Jurassic period, the second division of the reptilian age, the known fossil-bearing rocks are so largely of marine origin that except for rare instances where the animal has accidentally been carried into the sea, the record of terrestrial life is almost a blank. At the close of the Jurassic, however, at the time when the long-drawn-out Cretaceous, Comanchian plus Cretaceous, had its beginning, we have another glimpse of well-nigh the entire assemblage of dinosaurian life. The scenes are laid along the eastern United States from Maryland southward, but more notably in Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, and in the Old World in southern England and northern France and Belgium. In contrast with the aridity of the former scene, the climate is now moist, and the eye ranges over an extensive low-lying country with misty bayous in which the huge Sarapoda, now in the flower of their evolution, find retreat. In Europe and Western America, the vegetation, though far from luxuriant, is of the same monotonous type as that of the Trias, but in Central and Eastern America appear representatives of the flowering plants, the dominant flora of today. Here are predentate dinosaurs, armored and unarmored, and while the former are still relatively few, Stegosaurus already shows the senile grotesqueness which heralds its extinction. Carnivores, small and large, now in their millennium of numbers and differentiation, 
ceaselessly seek their prey. Late Cretaceous time ushers in the third and last scene of much the same geographic extent as before, but with the sharp contrast of an essentially modernized flora, for the forests now contain many familiar trees and plants, though often in unfamiliar combinations. Again, our record is of low-lying country, stretches of everglade and swamplands with higher areas between. But the denizens have changed, for while the carnivores are now in their maximum of size, the sauropoda have run their course and died without issue. Unarmored dinosaurs are in their prime, only in rare cases showing indications of degeneracy, while the relatively few heavily armed types are represented by the most impregnable of their race. The horned dinosaurs, apparently exclusively American, begin and end their brief evolutionary career. Thus it will be seen that the law of the balance of nature was as operative during the Mesozoic as it is today, and that as the carnivores grew and waxed mighty, the herbivores were forced to meet the menace of their aggression in several ways, either by increase in numbers, for the remains of carnivores are very rare compared with those of the herbivorous orders, or by speed, or by increase of bulk, which also meant a partial forsaking of the territorial habitat, as with the Sarapoda and the Trachodontae. Or it meant the development of armament, either of defensive armor, as in the Stegosaurs, or of aggressive armor and weapons, as in the Ceratopsians. The lack of brain power placed a premium upon brutality, and never, perhaps, before nor since has the animal world felt to so great an extent the burden of preparedness. Extinction. One of the most inexplicable of events is the dramatic extinction of this mighty race, for in the rocks of undoubted tertiary age, not a single trace of them remains. One student has argued internecine warfare among the dinosaurs themselves, another the destructive slaughter, not of adults but of the young, possibly while yet in the egg, by small bloodthirsty mammals. Yet another change of climate, either by the diminution of the necessary heat, without which no reptilian race may thrive, or of the moisture with an accompanying change of vegetation. These are all conjectural causes of extinction, but this we know, that with the extensive changes in the elevation of land areas which marked the close of the Mesozoic, came the draining of the great inland Cretaceous seas along the low-lying shores of which the dinosaurs had their home, and with the consequent restriction of old haunts came the blotting out of a heroic race. Their career was not a brief one, for the duration of their recorded evolution was thrice that of the entire mammalian age. They do not represent a futile attempt on the part of nature to people the world with creatures of insignificant moment, but are comparable in majestic rise, slow culmination, and dramatic fall to the greatest nations of antiquity. End of chapter 31b. Recording by Francis Wicks. Chapter 31C of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francis Wicks. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Part 3 The Evidences of Evolution. Section 3 Paleontology. Chapter 31C Beaked Dinosaurs and Origin of Birds. Origin of Birds. Von Heuwen, in his classification of 1914, derives the birds from the same stock that gave rise to the Ornithesian dinosaurs, and Huxley, years ago, recognized the very close reptilian affinities of the birds by calling them glorified reptiles. Avian distinctions. The principal points of contrast between birds and the Ornithesian dinosaurs of the more generalized type lie not in the character of the pelvis or of the foot, nor in the presence of ossified tendons along the vertebral column, nor in the presence of teeth, for these are all likenesses, and only a few out of many such. The main distinctions are due almost without exception to the assumption on the part of the bird of aerial life, and hence the birds may be considered simply the volant branch of a group of which the ornithopod dinosaurs were the terrestrial members. As a result of their flying adaptation, birds have the four limbs transformed into wings, and the scales, except for those on the feet, altered into feathers for warmth and to increase the alar extent. The blood becomes warm with an adaptation to maintain it at a given temperature, which may, however, have been true possibly to a limited extent of the dinosaurs. The birds also have developed new manacity of the skeleton for lightness and an extensive system of air cells throughout the body. 
Their organs of nutrition are highly developed because of the great expenditure of energy which flight necessitates, and their circulation is very perfect, which again may have been true of dinosaurs, but this we have no means of knowing. The loss of teeth is foreshadowed in the dinosaurs, the dental battery of Stegosaurus being a very inadequate thing, not so efficient in fact as that of the Cretaceous birds, while in Struthiomimus teeth were entirely lacking. Origin of Flight Several hypotheses have been advanced to account for the origin of flight, one group of authorities postulating an antecedent arboreal life, while others would derive flying forms from those of cursorial habits, and yet others, Lucas see page 360, believe that birds are diphyletic, the carinate or flying birds having an arboreal ancestry, while the ratite or cursorial birds were of terrestrial stock. Cursorial origin of flight has been advocated mainly by the Hungarian paleontologist Francis Baron Nopsha. A discussion of his theory follows. Nopsha does not believe that the flight of bats and pterodactyls, which fly by means of patagia, and birds, which fly by means of feathers, could possibly have arisen in the same way, for the patagium flyer must always adapt both fore and hind limbs and tail to the support of the membrane, whereas in a generalized feathered animal, only the feather supporting elements need become affected by volant specialization. The development of the posterior limb in such an animal is but little if at all affected by the development of flight. The hind limbs of birds are so similar in structure to those of the cursorial dinosaurs, in which so far as we know no flying powers were ever developed, that the type of modification which they both represent can only be interpreted in the light of a function possessed by each. The inference is therefore that birds arose from bipedal, long-tailed cursorial reptiles, which, during running, oared along in the air by flapping their free anterior extremities. These would, of course, be more effective if their breadth could in some way be increased to give them a greater bearing surface, and the increasing size of the scales along the arm margin would be a ready means to this end. Similar scales might develop along the margins of the tail for the same reason that lateral hairs have developed on the tail of certain bipedal mammals. These scales would extend, lighten, and ultimately evolve into feathers, which would not only subserve the function of flight, but acting as clothing, retain and aid in the increase of temperature, which in turn would help to improve both the physical and mental activity of these forms. And this is a sufficient reason for the dominance of the birds over all other aerial rivals, and for their survival after the extinction of their dinosaurian kindred. Arboreal origin of flight is urged by Osborne and others, and only recently a close student of birds, Mr. C. William Beebe, has brought forth a theory of the origin of flight consistent with this belief, which has several novel features. Beebe advances the idea that Archaeopteryx had not yet attained the power of true flight, believing that the forelimbs, as well as the hind, were rigidly extended at right angles to the sides of the body and not flapped. Beebe's theory of the origin of flight in birds is novel and is based upon the presence of series of sprouting quills, not clothing feathers, found in newly hatched birds running from the outer upper part of the hind leg just below the knee nearly to the base of the tail. These quills are placed just where, if developed, they would form a sort of winglet on either side, which combined with the tail would afford excellent support for the hind part of the body. Just such tufts of feathers are known to have occurred in Archaeopteryx Berlin specimen, and Mr. Beebe concludes that like the back fins of the flying fish, they serve to support the hinder part of the body as the creatures sail through the air. A most striking bit of evidence is the fact that just as overlapping coverts are found above the secondaries of the bird's wing, and alternately with them, so the bristle-like quills on the thigh of the pigeon are surmounted by a series of quills placed precisely like the wing coverts. Beebe's theory, based upon this evidence, and that offered by Archaeopteryx, is that, quote, Somewhere near the lower Jurassic, about seven million years ago, both fore and hind limbs bore feathers, but neither pair of limbs took an active part in aerial locomotion, their function being that of planes, purely passive." Unquote. This phase of the development Beebe terms the tetrateryx, or four-wing stage. See figure 169. At this stage, to quote from Beebe, quote, flight was merely gliding, the fingers were too free, the arm bones too delicate, the sternum small or absent, and these facts considered in connection with the small, weak pelvis make it impossible to picture the creature flying skillfully about. In succeeding generations, the pelvic wings would become more and more reduced. Having arisen from among the surrounding scales, they had for a time volplane through the air of early ages, a structure passive, and as future centuries would show, of merely transitory function. 
yet they were of tremendous importance in allowing the pectoral scales to develop, to become feathers, and then to assume an importance which was to make the class of birds supreme in the air. Millions of years after they were of use, the feathers of the pelvic wing are still reproduced in embryo and nestling. And for some unknown reason, nature makes each squab pass through this tetrateric stage. The line of feathers along the leg of the young bird reproduces in this diminutive, useless way the glory that once was theirs. No fossil bird of the ages prior to Archaeopteryx may come to light, but the memory of tetrateryx lingers in every dove quote. Unquote. Lucas. Gregory's theory. Dr. W. K. Gregory, after weighing the hypothesis advanced above, presents a compromise theory. He says, quote, the pro aves were surely quick runners, both on the ground and in the trees, but it is not yet clear whether the upright position was first attained upon the ground or in the trees. They very early acquired the habit of perching upright on the branches, as shown by the consolidated instep bones, grasping first digit, and strong claws of Archaeopteryx, see plate 14. Their slender arms ended in three long fingers provided with large claws, which were at first doubtless used in climbing. Quote, these active pro aves contrasted widely in habits with their sluggish remote reptilian forebears. In pursuit of their prey, they jumped lightly from branch to branch and finally from tree to tree, partly sustained by the folds of skin on their arms and legs, and later by the long scale feathers of the pectoral and pelvic wings and tail. That they held the arms perfectly still throughout the gliding leap still appears doubtful, for all recent animals that do that have never attained true flight. I cannot avoid the impression that a vigorous downward flap of the arms, even before they became efficient wings, would assist in the takeoff for the leap, and that another flap just before landing would check the speed and assist in landing." Unquote. The time of avian evolution was certainly not later than the early Jurassic, for Jurassic birds are recorded in the rocks. In all probability, it was Triassic, or even earlier, but the more conservative estimate is safer. See, however, epilogue. Geologic record. Upper Jurassic. Archaeopteryx, the earliest recorded bird, is known from two well-preserved specimens, one headless, now in the British Museum in London, the other which bears a head in Berlin. They are both from the lithographic quarry at Solenhof in Bavaria, and were contemporaries with Compsognathus, not as we have seen the earliest, but the smallest known dinosaur. Archaeopteryx was about the size of a crow, feathered and with fair powers of flight. There were, however, several characteristics wherein it was more reptile-like than our modern birds. These are the presence of teeth in both jaws, the free clawed fingers of the hand which were not yet fused into the form of the modern wing, the feebly developed sternum, and especially the possession of a long tail on either side of which the rectrices or steering feathers were arranged. In all subsequent birds, the tail is shortened and the feathers are disposed fan-wise. Cretaceous. The Cretaceous chalk Neobrera of Kansas has produced the next recorded avian remains in geologic time. These strata are marine, for besides invertebrates and sharks and other sea fishes, they contain mosasaurs, sea turtles, plesiosaurs, and the fish-eating pterodactyls Nyctosaurus and Tyrannodon. The birds belong to two main sorts, both of which were doubtless aquatic, but the larger of them, Hesperonus, was especially so since it had lost the power of flight. The other, Ichnothornis, was a small tern or gull-like bird well endowed with flying powers and essentially modern, except that, like Hesperonis, its jaws still bore teeth. It is interesting to note, however, that in common with the pre-dentate dinosaurs, except Hypsilophodon, the teeth in both of these genera were confined to the maxillary and dentary bones, the premaxillary, which forms the forward part of the upper jaw, being toothless. Hesperornis was a splendid bird, measuring over four and a half feet in length, with powerful hind limbs, which, while rendering the bird awkward on land, must have been very adequate swimming organs. Also flight is indicated by the reduction of the shoulder girdle, and especially of the wing, which is represented by a long slender humerus, the forearm and hand being entirely lacking. The breastbone also is devoid of a keel for muscular attachment, resembling that of an ostrich. On the whole, Hesperornis finds its recent analogy in the loons or great divers, and except for its flightless condition, may have had quite similar habits of life. Other Cretaceous genera are known, though very imperfectly, but, so far as our knowledge goes, they all agreed in the possession of teeth, although in other respects they were essentially modernized. Two wonderful mounted skeletons of Hesperonis and two of Ichthyornis, the latter unique, are preserved at Yale. Tertiary birds leave but little to the imagination, 
as they are essentially those of today. It is interesting to note, however, that the loss of flight occurred apparently several times among tertiary forms, for even from the Eocene formation in most parts of the world, numerous big ratites, i.e. cursorial birds, are known, which can only have originated from badly flying ground birds, whereas in modern times the ratites are apparently vanishing from the Earth's surface. Nopsha. The birds as a class are a very compact group and do not begin to show the range of size and adaptation of the reptiles as a whole. In fact, in this respect, they hardly rank with the dinosaurs. With them, it is perfection and multiplication of detail, and the most essentially modern among them are the small tree or perching birds of the order of Pathiers. End of chapter 31. Recording by Francis Wicks, Canada. Chapter 32, Part 1 of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 32, Part 1 Origin of Mammals and Rise of Archaic Mammals. Definition of Mammals. Mammals may be defined as warm-blooded creatures whose body is more or less clothed with hair, whose young are produced alive, except in the egg-laying monotremes, and are nourished for a while after birth by the secretions of milk, mammary glands. The skeleton shows several important distinctions from those of reptiles and birds, having a double occipital condyle, the articular facets which unite the skull with the first cervical vertebra, and having a simple lower jaw. In reptiles and birds, on the other hand, the condyle is single and the jaw is composed of a bony complex. There is also an intervening bone, the quadrate, between the jaw and the skull, which is lacking in the mammal. A further mammalian distinction lies in the fact that the vertebrae and limb bones ossify from three separate bone-forming centers, the body or shaft, as the case may be, and the articular ends or epiphyses. All bone consists first of cartilage, the actual bony material, lime phosphate, etc., being formed therein in a definite way by the activity of certain cells, the bone corpuscles. This is known as ossification. The mammalian dentition is peculiar in its local differentiation of the teeth, heterodonty, into incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, and also in that there are but two sets in series, the milk or lacteal teeth, and the permanent ones. Never does one see anything comparable to the amazing successional teeth of the predentate dinosaurs, for instance. Secondarily, acquired simplicity of the teeth may occur as in the toothed whales, and the number of successional teeth may be reduced. The mammals are certainly the highest class of vertebrates from many standpoints. In some ways, however, this place may be disputed by the birds, but the latter represent the culmination of one line of ascent and the mammals another. Origin of Mammals Stock At least two views have been held as to the origin of mammals. The older one, that advocated by Huxley in 1880, would derive them from the amphibia. For, as he says, the submammalian stage of evolution, already indicated by Hackel under the name Promammaly, would be separated from the seropsida, reptiles and birds, by its two condyles, and by the retention of the left as the principal aortic arch, amphibia and reptiles have two, the birds one, the right, while it would probably be no less differentiated from the amphibia by the presence of an amnion and the absence of brachii, gills, at any period of life. I propose to term the representatives of this stage hypotheria, from the Greek under and beast, and I do not doubt that when we have a fuller knowledge of the terrestrial vertebrata of the later Paleozoic epochs, forms belonging to this stage will be found among them. Now, if we take away from the hypotheria, the amnion and the corpus callosum, callous body, the great commissure uniting the hemispheres of the cerebrum and peculiar to mammals, and add the functional branchiae, the existence of which in the ancestors of the mammalia is clearly indicated by their visceral arches, seen in the hyoid bone which supports the tongue and in the cartilages of the voice-box or larynx and clefts the hypotheria thus reduced at once take their place among the amphibia for the presence of branchiae implies that of an incompletely divided ventricle of the heart and of numerous aortic arches 
such as exist in the mammalian embryo, but are more or less completely suppressed in the course of its development. Thus I regard the amphibian type as the representative of the next lower stage of vertebrate evolution. Much in Huxley's theory is undoubtedly correct, except that authorities do not now believe that the amphibia represent the next lower stage, but that there was an intervening condition, one in which gill breathing had been lost, but truly mammalian characters had not yet appeared, although some of them were already foreshadowed. There are found in Triassic rocks in South Africa a group of reptiles known as the Cynodontia, in allusion to their dog-like teeth, and there seems to be a large body of evidence in favor of the view that out of this group, although from no known member of it, the mammals have been derived. The cynodonts resemble the mammals in the possession of a heterodont dentition, in that the teeth are clearly divisible into incisors, canines, and molars, and in the paired occipital condyles, in addition to which there are similarities of construction. Structurally, the cynodonts bridge the gap between reptiles and mammals, because while the dentary, the single bone of the mammalian lower jaw, is large and important, the jaw is nevertheless complex in that it possesses the several bones typical of the reptile. There are other reptilian characters as well, all of which may reasonably be expected in the remote ancestors of the mammalia. These cynodont reptiles Williston would include under the order Therapsida, according to his definition, although the former name is not specifically mentioned. This order he places low in the reptilian scale, far removed from the dinosaurs and birds with which we have been concerned, although capable of as high a degree of specialization along other lines. Place of Origin While we find members of this order, the Rhapsida, in both North America and Africa, although they must have been much more widely diffused, it was apparently in the latter place that the mammals arose, probably due not so much to the potentiality possessed by the reptiles of one place over the other as to a happy combination in Africa of a potent stock and an impelling cause cause the cause for the origin of the mammals has been mentioned in chapter nineteen under the caption significance of cursorial adaption therein is emphasized the statement made by broom that all of the characters wherein a mammal differs from a reptile are the result of increased activity for he says that when the therapsidin took to walking with feet beneath and body off the ground it first became possible for it to become a warm-blooded animal but back of this lay impelling geologic causes which Broom does not even hint at. These were, first, increasing aridity of climate, which from Permian time well into the Jurassic seems to have been characteristic of all lands, as the extensive series of red sediments imply. And aridity has been found to be a great stimulative to speed. Add to this the evidence, especially in the southern hemisphere, between latitudes 20 degrees and 35 degrees, of extensive glaciation, greater even than in the more familiar Pleistocene glacial period, and we have a high incentive to the retention of bodily heat. For it is well known that cold, more than any other factor, limits the activity of reptiles, and effectively prevents their distribution into the higher latitudes. For a while, perhaps, there were recurring warm seasons, sufficiently long and frequent, so that a normal reptilian life could still be led, the creature hibernating when the weather became too severe but as in the case of the estivating lung-breathing fishes sufficient time must still be had for the active portion of the creature's career so that although in the origin of terrestrial forms premium would be placed upon the capability of atmospheric respiration here it would be upon ability to withstand the cold and yet remain active and the acquisition of warm blood and a heat retentive clothing is the only possible means to this end hence as immediate geologic causes of mammalian evolution, we have, first, aridity, the incentive for speed, rendering possible the development of warm blood, and second, the increasing cold to place a premium upon such as did develop it, and to eliminate those which did not. Time. The time of mammalian evolution can only be fixed within certain limits. Geological evidence, if we have read the cause aright, points to its inception in early Permian time. For, as Schuchert says, the evidence is now unmistakable that early in Permian times all of the lands of the southern hemisphere were under the influence of a glacial climate as severe as the polar one of recent times, and that, like the latter, the Permian one also had warmer interglacial periods. 
for coal beds occur associated with glacial deposits in Australia, South Africa, and Brazil. On the other hand, the geologic record seems to point to the Triassic, at any rate as the time of the culmination of the evolutionary movement, for here are found, for the first time, the cynodont reptiles and the actual relics of the mammals themselves. But the cause must always precede the effect, and it may be that the known cynodonts were persistent reptilian survivors of the group out of which the mammals actually sprang, and that the earliest known mammals themselves had already had a long transitional period. It seems reasonable to believe, therefore, that the time of mammalian origin was not later than Middle Triassic or earlier than Lower Permian, and that transitional forms began to appear during the period of devastating cold, early in the Permian time. Mesozoic Mammals Deployment as with the dinosaurs, three important vistas are open to our scientific vision. So it is with the Mesozoic mammals. We see them in late Triassic time in Germany and the eastern United States, in early Comanchean in eastern Wyoming, and in late Cretaceous in the same general region. Again, as in the dinosaurs, there are other occurrences of less importance, but the three mentioned above are so placed in time that their interest is thereby greatly increased for they may be considered roughly to mark the stage of evolution of this all-important class at the close of each of the three great periods of the Mesozoic, the Trias, the Jura, and the Cretaceous. General Characteristics The general characteristics of Mesozoic mammals are, first, their small size, for the largest known among them could hardly have succeeded the stature of a rat. Their habits were doubtless varied some had sharp pointed teeth comparable to those of living insectivores and like them adapted to a varied animal diet insects worms young birds and reptiles in other words such creatures as they overcame for in all probability the gratification of their appetite was limited largely by their lack of prowess others had teeth better fitted for an herbivorous than an animal diet with sharp cutting incisors almost like those of a rodent in front shearing premolars and many cussed multi-tuberculate broad-crowned grinding teeth behind in certain instances their teeth are quite suggestive in general form of those of the rat kangaroos of australia and tasmania all of which are small animals hardly exceeding a rabbit in size nocturnal and feeding on the leaves of various kinds of grasses and other plants as well as roots and bulbs which they dig up with their forepaws there is little doubt of the herbivorous character of these mesozoic forms, although in trying to fix upon a precise dietary from analogy, the possibilities of the contemporaneous vegetation must always be borne in mind. It is interesting to note, too, that these were the forms which, as Cope supposed, may have attacked the dinosaurs in the egg, their sharp incisors being especially adapted to piercing the shell. Habitat Matthew has discussed in some detail the implied habitat of the Mesozoic mammals and has come to the conclusion that they were largely arboreal, his conviction being based chiefly upon the skeletal characteristics displayed by their descendants. He says, The Cretaceous ancestors of the tertiary mammals were small arboreal animals of very uniform skeletal characters, but probably somewhat differentiated in dentition according as fruit, seeds, and nuts or insects form the staple of their diet. At the beginning of the Mesozoic, the available modes of life for land vertebrates were chiefly the amphibious aquatic, the arboreal, and the aerial, the terrestrial habitat being subordinate because the upland flora was largely undeveloped or inedible as compared with its present condition. The three available provinces were occupied by reptiles, mammals, and birds, respectively. In the later Cretaceous, the spread of a great and varied upland flora vastly extended the terrestrial province and opened a new and constantly widening field for the expansion of the mammalia. The little that is known of the Mesozoic mammalia fits in with our hypothesis of their arboreal habitat, but adds little to the evidence in its favor. Practically nothing is known of their skeletal structure. They are all of small or minute size, with teeth of insectivorous or granivorous type. Their minute size and association in strata of fresh or brackish water origin with large amphibious and aquatic reptiles, and with abundance of fossil wood, suggest that the deposits in which they occur were laid down in extensive forest-clad river deltas and coastal swamps, and that the minute mammalia represent the arboreal fauna of these forests. Classification 
the order protodonta is known from two small jaws called respectively microconodon and dromatherium they were discovered in a coal mine at egypt north carolina and are of upper triassic age contemporaneous with the far-famed Connecticut Valley beds. The dentition is more like that of the cynodont reptiles than of the later Mesozoic mammals, and the principal evidence of their mammalian affinity lies in the simple jaw, which consists of but a single bone. In the order Triconodonta, the teeth are more perfectly formed, but the molars are characterized by having but three cusps, arranged in a single longitudinal row. Of these, the middle cusp is usually dominant, the others being much smaller. At times, however, the latter may equal the median cusp in height. Certain characters of jaw and tooth succession have caused the inclusion of this order with the marsupials. Triconodonts first appear in the lower Jurassic, Stonesfield Slate of England, in the genus Amphilestes. Triconodon itself comes from the upper Jurassic of England, while a related, possibly equivalent genus comes from the Comanchian of Como Bluff, Wyoming, which is the upper limit of their range. The Allotheria, or multituberculata, are among the oldest mammals, for their characteristic molar teeth are found in Upper Triassic rocks of Germany, and they range into basal Eocene time. Geographically, they are very widespread, as they have been reported from Europe and Africa, and from North and South America. Little is known of the skeleton, but jaws and teeth are more or less abundant, and at least one skull has been found. They had a single pair of rodent-like incisors above and below, while the molars bore two or three longitudinal rows of tubercles, hence the name multi-tuberculata. The premolars were either like the molars, except for a greater simplicity, or were compressed, sharp-edged, cutting teeth. The most notable forms are Tritilodon, a large type from the Karoo beds, Lower Jurassic of South Africa, Microlestes of the Lower Trias of Europe, Pragiolax from the Comanchian of Europe and North America, Tilidus and Polymastodon from the Basal Eocene of North America, the former being also Upper Cretaceous. The Allotheria have also been included under the Marsupialia, but there is not the least likelihood, according to Scott, that any existing mammals were derived from them. In the next order, Pantotheria, Trituberculata, the dentition, while simpler, suggests that of the insectivores to such an extent that they have been considered by good authority as the actual forerunners of that group. The molars are three-cusped, but instead of being arranged in lineal series as in the trichodonts, the cusps are in the form of a triangle or trigon, the principal cusp being on the inner side of the teeth in the lower jaw and on the outer side in the upper jaw. In habits, the trituberculates were probably insectivorous, and they have been classed with the placental mammals as primitive insectivora. Their time ranges from lower Jurassic to the close of the Mesozoic, and although they then became extinct as an order, they may still survive in their descendants, possibly the true insectivores among other orders. Amphitherium, one of the oldest genera, is from the Lower Triassic, Stonesfield Slate of England. Amblotheria is from the English Purbeck, Upper Jurassic, while the more familiar American forms are Dryolestes and Diplocynodon, from the Comanchian of Coma, Wyoming, and Didelphodon, Simolestes, and others from the Upper Cretaceous lance formation of the same state. Check on Mesozoic Mammalian Life Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Mesozoic mammals is their apparent stagnation or conservatism as regards evolution, for we find so little recorded change compared with that of the reptiles during their long drawn-out career that we look instinctively for some inhibiting cause. After the establishment of the mammals in late Triassic time, there are no great geologic or climatic changes of a revolutionary character to quicken their evolution until the close of the Cretaceous and while reptilian dynasties wax and wane, the trend of their evolution seems pretty well established after the early Jurassic, the remarkable types which appear later being largely the fluorescence which characterizes racial old age. But with the close of the age of reptiles came a most momentous change in mammalian evolution, when the sluggish stream of their existence was quickened into life and their remarkable radiation began. This may have been due in part to the expansion of the upland flora, which, as Matthew believes, was either restricted in its development 
or of a sort not suitable to mammalian dietary during the Mesozoic. But it seems reasonable to suppose that the inhibition of mammalian evolution was due not so much to a lack of a suitable physical and floral environment as to an overwhelming check against which these small creatures could not contend. There is in the Yale Museum a remarkable series of mammal jaws and teeth from what is known as Quarry 9 at Como Bluff, Wyoming, which lies in strata of Comanchean age. Associated with them, among other reptilian remains, was a single tooth of a carnivorous dinosaur, perhaps Allosaurus, a tooth keen-pointed and terrible, like a curved dagger with serrated margins, and many, many times the bulk, not only of the teeth, but of the entire jaws of the associated higher forms. This tooth, suspended like the sword of Damocles, over the head of these actually associated mammals, brings before the mind's eye broad vistas of low-lying, well-watered woodland, with ever alert furry forms taking such refuge as the trees or shrubbery or occasional hiding holes could offer, in the midst of stalking terrors such as the world never saw before nor since. That the mammals manage to maintain themselves is not surprising, for there is a teeming horde of small mammalian folk in the tiger haunted jungles of India today, and that they did not dispute with the dinosaurs the realms of greater opportunity is but a logical assumption. The release. If our premise be true, the great tertiary expansion of mammals, therefore, is only in part the direct outcome of changing geologic conditions, the primal incentive being the removal of the check. For, as Osborne says, there is little doubt that the extinction of the large terrestrial and aquatic reptiles, which survived to the very close of the Cretaceous, prepared the way for the evolution of the mammals. Nature began afresh with the small, unspecialized members of the warm blooded, quadrupedal class to slowly build up out of the mammal stock the great animals which were again to dominate land and sea one of the most dramatic moments in the life history of the world is the extinction of the reptilian dynasties which occurred with apparent suddenness at the close of the cretaceous the very last chapter in the age of reptiles we have no conception as to what worldwide cause occurred whether there was a sudden or a gradual change of conditions at the close of the cretaceous we can only observe that the worldwide effect was the same. The giant reptiles, both of land and sea, disappeared. Reptiles are so sensitive to temperature that it is natural to attribute this extinction to a general lowering of temperature or refrigeration, but the flora shows no evidence of this either in Europe or America, nor is there evidence of any great geographic cataclysm on the surface of the earth, for the plant life transition from one age to the other in the Rocky Mountain region is altogether gradual and gentle. End of Part 1 of Chapter 32 of Organic Evolution Chapter 32, Part 2 of Organic Evolution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull Chapter 32, Part 2 The Archaic Mammals This is the name given to the creatures which, in early tertiary time, supplanted the great reptiles in their vacated habitats. They constitute the first mammalian adaptive radiation, but one of short duration, for they were soon to be displaced in their turn by creatures of a higher sort, the so-called modernized mammals. For a while these archaic types served very well, and doubtless, had it not been for a competition which they could not meet, they might have survived for a longer period. But there was written over against them the memorable indictment, Thou art weighed in the balances, and found wanting. Defects There are two prime essentials to every creature's adaptation to its environment. It must have safety and food. Hence two principal structures are of paramount importance. Locomotor organs, that it may flee from its enemy or overtake its prey, and efficient teeth that it may utilize such food as is available. In other words, the two organs whose contact with the environment is most intimate are the feet and the teeth, and these are seen to suffer the most profound changes with the passage of time and the consequent changing of the environment. Not only must these organs be adapted to immediate need, but adaptable to the inevitable changes of conditions which time will bring. Thus it is that by a study of feet and teeth, so much of an animal's life conditions and consequent habits can be deduced. 
Add to this a structure of which the dinosaurs made but little, but which in mammalian evolution became increasingly important, the brain, and the tale of the requisites for future evolutionary success is complete. It was specifically in these three things that the archaic mammals were deficient. For while size, strength, and physical prowess, arms and armament were theirs in full measure, their feet and grinding teeth were conservative, inelastic, and incapable of meeting new conditions as they arose. Their brain, too, was singularly old-fashioned, generally small, but always relatively undeveloped in comparison with that of modernized mammals of equivalent bulk, especially in the part wherein the intelligence lay. Hence it is not surprising that the career of these forms was brief, and that with rare exceptions they have suffered racial death and vanished as utterly as did the dinosaurs before them. Classification Nature, as Osborne says, deals in transitions rather than in sharp lines. We cannot circumscribe the archaic mammals sharply, nor be sure as yet that some of them did not give direct descent to certain of the modernized mammals. Yet the mammals of the basal Eocene of both Europe and North America are altogether of very ancient type. They exhibit many primitive characters, such as extremely small brains, simple triangular teeth, five digits on the hands and feet, prevailing plantigradism. They are to be collectively regarded as the first grand attempts of nature to establish insectivorous, carnivorous, and herbivorous groups, or ungulates, clawed forms, and ungulates, hoofed forms. The ancestors or centers of these adaptive radiations date far back in the age of reptiles. At the beginning of the Eocene we find the lines all separated from each other, but not as yet very highly specialized. The specialization and divergence of these archaic mammals continue through the Eocene period and reach a climax near the top, although many branches of this archaic stock become extinct in the lower Eocene. The orders which may be provisionally placed in this archaic group are the following. Marsupialia, Multituberculata, Plagia luacidae, Placentalia, Insectivora, insectivores not as yet positively identified in the basal Eocene, Teneodonta, Edontates with enamel banded teeth, Creodonta, archaic families of carnivores, Condylartha, primitive light-limbed cursorial ungulates, Amblypoda, archaic, typically heavy-limbed, slow-moving ungulates. This group is full of analogies, but is without ancestral affinities to the higher placentals and marsupials. There are forms imitating in one or more features the modern Tasmanian wolf, thylacinus, the bears, cats, hyenas, civets, and rodents of today, but no true members of the orders primates, rodentia, carnivora, parasodactyla, artiodactyla have been discovered. Of the archaic mammals, the multituberculata have already been sufficiently described, the insectivora are unknown, and the teneodonta unnecessary for our purposes. We will therefore turn our attention to the three remaining groups, of which the first is the creodonta, from the Greek for flesh and tooth. These forms resemble in many details the hoofed condylarthra next to be described, but differ from them chiefly in the skull and teeth, in that they have more the aspect of a true carnivore than the condylarths, which were of vegetarian diet. The terminal phalanges, unguals, are also more claw-like, although there are exceptions to this rule, notably in the dog-like dromocyon. The skull of a creodont differs from that of a true carnivore, for while it is always large for the size of the animal, there is a much smaller brain case, thus necessitating a high crest of bone along the midline of the cranium, sagittal crest, to obtain sufficient surface for muscular attachment. There are widely expanded temporal or zygomatic arches for the same purpose. The teeth also differ in not being so perfectly adapted for a flesh diet as in the true carnivores. In the latter, certain cheek teeth are almost always enlarged and modified to form a wonderful shearing device, and these so-called carnassial teeth, from the Latin for flesh, are, when present, invariably the fourth upper premolar and first lower molar, expressed thus. P4 over M1. With the creodonts, the carnassials may not be developed at all, and if they are, are variable and not necessarily, indeed rarely, P4 over M1, 
and in addition they are rarely confined to a single pair of teeth, but are two or more in number. The creodonts have been divided into at least six distinct families, of which but one probably gave rise to true carnivores, the rest dying out one after another until by upper oligocene time none were in existence. The creodonts foreshadow the true carnivores in a number of ways, in that certain of them were bear-like, arctocyon, others dog-like, dromocyon, or otter-like, oxyena, patriophilus. Some, like the minks, sunopa, others cat-like, disacus, or resembling hyenas, hyemodon. The last genus is of a special interest, because together with its old-world ally, pterodon, it is the last creodont survivor, existing until the middle oligocene. Wortman saw, in Patriophilus, a form which might have given rise to the modern sea lions, Otteridia, but of this there is some doubt. The condylarthra, from the Greek knuckle and joint, were a group of very primitive ungulates, which, aside from the implied differences in diet, paralleled the creodonta closely. For in both groups there was the same generalized type of body, with a long, heavy tail, and rather stocky, more or less cursorial limbs. There were, however, relatively few of the condylarths, but two families being recognized as against six for the creodonts. They range in time from basal and lower Eocene, but very little is known as yet of their geographical extent. They are not supposed to have given rise to any higher groups of ungulates, but to represent an abortive attempt on the part of nature to produce cursorial hoofed forms. One of them, however, Phenocotus, was hailed by its discoverer, Professor Cope, as the five-toed ancestor of the horse, but this is now known to be impossible, as it is too large and too highly specialized in certain directions, although very primitive in others, and also too late in time to be the founder of the great equine lineage. This genus, from the Wasatch beds, ranged in size from a fox to a small sheep. While the canines were tusk-like, they were not large, and the grinding teeth were low-crowned and of simple pattern, suited undoubtedly to a rather succulent herbage. The skull was long and low, with a well-developed sagittal crest, and while that portion of the cranium behind the orbits was relatively long, as with most primitive skulls, the brain case was of very small capacity. The feet are five-toed, semi-plantigrade, and built on a very primitive plan, in that the wrist and ankle bones are serial, that is, placed one above the other rather than alternating, as in all feet subject to splitting strains. Phenocotus and the earlier Euprologonia represent the family Phenocodontidae, while the other family, Menus Cotheriidae, embraces but a single genus, Menus Cotherium. These forms, while contemporaneous with the Phenocodonts, were more advanced in both tooth structure, for the cuffs of the grinders have begun to assume a crescent shape, such as one finds in the higher odd and even toed ungulates. The body and tail were long, and the limbs, while long, resemble so much those of the Hyrocoidea of Africa as to cause the inclusion of Meniscotherium in that group by certain authorities. Others have considered the Hyrocoidea to be surviving condylars. There are, however, no very good grounds for such an assumption. The condylarthra are of interest in this way, that they represent or were very similar to what was probably a very widespread group of primitive ungulates, out of which, possibly, all the other orders of ungulates arose. The genera which we know could not have been the direct ancestors, but they show us the nature of the ungulate ancestry. The amblypoda, from the Greek blunt and foot, or short-footed ungulates, are another group of hoofed forms, among which were some that attained a huge, almost elephantine size, and in spite of a basic primitiveness developed a superficial specialization of a very remarkable sort. Their geologic range is from the basal Eocene throughout the Eocene period, when they, in their turn, suffered extinction. Four families are recognized, of which the two most primitive are the Periptychidae and the Pantolambdidae, both basal Eocene in distribution. Pantolambda, the type of the second family, while undoubtedly an ungulate, shows many points of similarity with the creodonts. It is described as having a head and body somewhat smaller than those of a sheep, and much shorter legs. 
the body and tail had somewhat the proportions of the larger cats and the skull as with the condylarths was long and low with small brain capacity and prominent sagittal crest the limbs were very short and relatively heavy with five spreading toes on each foot Charypridon represents the third family and is in many ways a remarkable beast the different species vary in size from a tapir to an ox and thus are the largest forms we have so far considered they were heavy unwieldy animals whose short powerful limbs and spreading feet point to swamp dwelling if not aquatic habits the skull was large and flattened in such a way that no median crest is visible nor are there any indications of horns such as the next genus possessed the canine teeth were developed into huge flaring tusks suggesting those of the swine altogether it was a heavy sluggish brute whose very small brain gives evidence of great stupidity Dinoceros, unilitherium represents the last family of amblypods and in many ways size up to seven feet in height dentition and horns was by far the most specialized in fact grotesquely so its limbs were pillar-like quite like those of the proboscidea see chapter thirty four and like them an adaptation to carry the creature's great weight the elephant-like characteristics extended also to the body but there the resemblance ceased for the skull was totally dissimilar in that it was extended upward into a series of horn-like prominences these consisted of a pair upon the nose which from their appearance may have borne dermal horns like those of rhinoceroses the second pair were higher with bluntly rounded ends and were probably not sheathed with horn but covered with skin as in the giraffe there was also a third pair massive structures eight to ten inches high which again could not have borne horny sheaths there was a high transverse occipital crest at the hinder end of the skull connecting the posterior pair of horns and giving together with the prominences a unique basin-shaped character to the top of the skull another remarkable feature lay in the greatly developed canine teeth which were curved sabres in some genera and spear-shaped in others and were doubtless important weapons both the tusks and horn prominences were apparently better developed in the male than in the female for their variation constitutes about the only difference seen in certain skulls there is no indication of a proboscis as the nasal bones which are long and prominent in dinoceros are invariably shortened whenever that useful organ develops the molar teeth of dinoceros were very conservative for while one might trace a very marked evolution in the skull and tusks these important organs hardly change at all the brain also was absurdly small for so large a creature the armament of dinoceros may have served a useful purpose but one is constrained to believe that together with a relatively great size it indicates racial senility the extreme of over specialization attained by a primitive stock fate of the archaic mammals the archaic mammals as such have long since vanished from the earth and were it not for their remains entombed in the eocene rocks we would be unaware that they ever existed theirs was a brief span compared with that of the reptilian hordes and also with that of their mammalian successors but for a while they throve mightily until competition with creatures of a better sort became too great for them to bear that they strove to meet this competition is evident for certain of the later creodonts notably patriophilus and the powerful harpagolestes increased materially in bodily size while the hyenodonts actually increased the bulk of the brain and as a consequence were the sole survivors of the group after the close of the eocene for as long ago as eighteen seventy four professor marsh pointed out that the brains of the surviving races are upon the average larger than those of declining races competition was doubtless therefore a prime cause which led to the extinction of these forms we have argued racial old age in dinoceros but if that be deemed insufficient in itself we have the noteworthy fact that where evolution of an animal runs to the development of tusks and horns probably favored by sexual selection the grinding teeth are apparently neglected and are apt to show arrested development and bulk is fatal where correlated with inadequate feeding mechanism and with brain power not adequate to enable the females to defend and care for the young as well as to meet new conditions of life osborne thus the fate of the archaic mammals was first extinction and secondly 
transmutation of a few, a very few, into higher types. There remains a third possibility, and that is emigration, not of the later but of the earlier sorts, across the southern land bridge into South America, where together with a certain admixture of other stock, possibly African, they may have given origin to the remarkable South American fauna which rose and flourished during the long period of Neogean isolation. Others, passing beyond the limits of South America, may have crossed the Antarctic land bridge into Australia, where as marsupials they still persist. But this cannot be true if we adhere to our premise that the multituberculates only of the marsupials are to be included among the archaic mammals, and further, that they died in basal Eocene time without issue. If, on the contrary, the entire marsupial order is to be considered archaic, the conclusion that they may still be surviving in these remote forms and in the American opossums is tenable. There is a further possibility that the American edentata, sloths, armadillos, and their allies, may have been derived from the teniodonts. If so, the latter also have in a sense survived, although in a much altered state and only because they likewise found asylum in isolated South America. End of chapter 32。First half of chapter 33 of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Blow. Chapter 33. Incursion of Modernized Mammals and Evolution of Carnivores. We have spoken of the modernized mammals in contradistinction to the archaic forms. It is necessary now to define the former more precisely. They include practically all existing mammals and some which have become extinct, together with their forebears, such as Carnivora vera, true officipid carnivores, Rodentia, gnawing animals, Perissodactyla, odd toed ungulates, Arteodactyla, even toed ungulates, Proboscidea, elephants and mastodons, primates, lemuroids and monkeys, Insectivora, insectivores, included by some authorities among the archaic mammals, Cetacea and Cyrenia, whales and sea cows. In contrast with the archaic forms, the modernized types are all creatures of high potentiality, and, where they became extinct, were rather the victims of circumstance than creatures which died because of lack of adaptability, although certain groups seem to have run a natural course and their extinction was heralded by evidences of racial senility. As the archaic forms were characterized by lack of progressive brain and feet and teeth, so the modernized races were distinguished by the possession sometimes of one, as in primate, sometimes of two, as in elephants, again by all three, as in horses, of these destiny-controlling organs. But, in general, the modernized animals were progressive, highly adaptable forms. Place of Origin of the Modernized Mammals The simultaneous appearance of the earliest of the modernized mammals in Europe, latitude 50 degrees north, and North America, latitude 40 degrees north, points to some contiguous landmass of the original home of these creatures. Hence, in 1903, Wartman, as a result of his studies of the Eocene mammalia in the Yale collection, assumed the existence of a grand northern common center of evolution and dispersal, both for plants and animals. A glance at the map drawn on the north polar projection will show how logical such an assumption is, and, with the evidence very clearly before us of the repeated recurrence of a land bridge across what is now Bering Strait, how readily migrants from a circumpolar land could follow the three great continental radii to the south, arriving synchronously in widely separated lands. Of course, the theory of circumpolar origin of these mammals assumes a climate far different from that which now characterizes this region, but that it was formerly warm and equable is abundantly proved by the finding on the coast of Greenland of the remains of a subtropical flora, Thus he describes cycads and associated species of plants in the Lower Cretaceous Comanchian as indicating a mean temperature of 70 degrees to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature equal to that of Cuba, and the same flora existing in Spitsbergen and in Alaska proves that this temperature was widely distributed. Deployment 
There is always a tendency on the part of every group of animals, as their numbers increase, to spread from their ancient home along lines of least resistance, provided no climatic or other insuperable barriers are to be overcome, and that may well have been one very potent cause for the southward migration of the modernized hordes. But there was an additional incentive, for throughout the early tertiary there is evidence of climatic variation and of a very gradual cooling of the northern climate and the consequent southward retreat of the higher plants and mammals which occurred as a succession of migratory waves. In this way, there came first the least hardy like the insectivores and the primates, the latter especially depending so largely upon the tropical forests for their sustenance that any change either in extent or character of their habitat would be reflected in their distribution at once. Perissodactyls, horse and tapir-like forms, also came speedily, and the true carnivores, primitive dog-like forms, likewise soon appeared. There is reason to believe, however, that throughout the whole pre-Pleistocene Cenozoic period, the northerly region Holarctica was highly favorable to the evolution and migration of the higher forms of the mammalia. It must be remembered, however, that the actual center from which these animals suddenly spread into Europe and North America is still hypothetical and will not be determined until the basal Eocene fossil mammal beds in the unknown portions of America and Asia shall have been discovered. Whatever the exact place of origin, the result of the incursion of the progressive forms was their speedy usurpation of the habitat of the unprogressives, and, as we have seen, the gradual elimination of the latter, largely through an unbearable competition. It is of these modernized mammals that we shall now speak, turning our attention to the following well-known and highly interesting groups, some of which, notably the horses, played no little part in the worldwide acceptance of the evolutionary hypothesis. These groups are 1. Carnivora, especially the felines, 2. Proboscidea, mastodons and elephants, 3. Horses, 4. Camels, 5. Primate, with especial reference to mankind. Carnivora. The division of the flesh-eating mammals into creodonts and true carnivores has been discussed and the main distinctions emphasized. The modernized forms are also divisible into two groups. The physopidia, Latin physis meaning cloven and pes meaning foot, or land carnivores, and the pinnipedia, Latin pinna meaning feather or fin, or seals and sea lions. The latter do not possess the carnassial tooth, and their derivation from any known physipid stock is doubtful. They may well represent an independent line of descent from the creodonts. It will be remembered that Waterman thought he saw, in Patriophilus, the ancestor of the sea lions. The physipid carnivores, or carnassidentia, to use an alternative term, show the following diagnostic characters. 1. Good brain moderately large and well convoluted. 2. Carnassial tooth, P4 by M1. Premolars in front more or less sharp, pointed and compressed. Molars behind tuberculated for crushing. 3. Clavicle, collarbone, vestigial or absent. 4. Limbs mobile, with the radius and ulna of the forearm and the tibia and fibula of the lower leg, complete and separate. 5. Digits clawed, never fewer than four. The principal families are Canidae. These embrace the foxes, dogs, and wolves, the most primitive of existing carnivores, cosmopolitan in their distribution, even having attained Australia, though doubtless by the agency of man. They appear first in the upper Eocene of Europe, are abundant in the Miocene fauna of Europe and North America, and reach India and South America by early Pliocene time. At present, at least 104 species of canids are extant and more than 160 fossil species have been described. Ursidae. The bears are omnivorous rather than strictly carnivorous and lack the carnassial teeth. Their feet also are plantigrades compared with the digitigrade character of those of most of the order. Bears are widespread today principally in the northern portions of both hemispheres. In the Old World, they extend southward to the Atlas Mountains in northern Africa and to southern India, Borneo, Sumatra and Ceylon. They are also found in the Andean Highlands as far south as Bolivia and Chile. They are, however, 
entirely absent from the Ethiopian and Australian realms. The origin and evolutionary history of the bears is undiscovered, as the earliest recorded fossils are in the Miocene of the Old World. By Upper Pliocene they had reached Eastern Europe, but up to 1916 they were unknown in the New World in rocks older than the Pleistocene. A Pliocene bear, however, has recently been reported from Oregon. Procyonidae The Procyonids, the raccoons and their kin, with one Asiatic exception, are entirely confined to the New World, especially tropical America. Geologically, they range upward from the primitive Miocene genus Phleocyon, which is the inactant form between this family and the Canidae, although the grinding teeth and plantigrade feet of the raccoon have caused its inclusion by certain authorities with the bears, Mustelidae. This family, which contains the weasels, polecats, badgers, and others, while especially abundant in North America, is found the world over, except Australia. Its members are, however, rare in Africa and South America. They are known from the Upper Eocene in Europe and from the Oligocene in North America, and one Miocene form, Megalictis, was gigantic, the skull alone equaling that of a black bear. These four families are known collectively as Arctoidea, or bear-like forms, while the three remaining ones, the Veridae, Hyanidae, and Felidae, are called Aleuroidea, cat-like. Viveridae. These are the civets, genets, and mongooses, and are limited largely to the Ethiopian and Oriental realms, only a half-dozen species being found outside of these areas. The curious Madagascar genus Cryptoprocla, the fossa, forms a connecting link between this family and the cats. About 30 species are known fossil, chiefly from the European tertiary, the genus Vivera itself having persisted since latter Eocene time. Hyanidae The hyenas are loathsome creatures of very dubious repute, as they are largely eaters of carrion. In spite of a rather dog-like appearance, their affinities lie with the Viveridae, from which they lately arose. They are confined today to tropical Asia and Africa, but formerly had a much wider range. End of first half of chapter 33second half of chapter 33 of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org organic evolution by richard swan blow chapter 33 incursion of modernized mammals and evolution of carnivores felidae the cats are in many ways the most highly specialized of carnivores chiefly in their dentition for the carnassial here reaches the height of perfection as a shearing tooth. The molars, on the contrary, are almost entirely lacking. Another specialization lies in the retractile claws, characteristic of all felidae except the cursorial hunting leopard, or cheetah, Cynelurus, which, as its name dog-cat implies, shows a number of dog-like convergences in limbs and feet. The working of the retractile claws is as follows. The ungual or claw-bearing phalanx is capable of a wide vertical range of movement and has attached to its upper side an elastic ligament which would keep the claw permanently raised were it not for an antagonistic muscle and tendon attached to the lower side. The contraction of this muscle pulls the ungual downward, thus protruding the claw and at the same time stretching the elastic ligament. Relax the muscle and the elasticity of the ligament again withdraws the claw. This permits the cat to move silently in stalking its prey, and at the same time provides prehensile organs of high perfection for securing it. Distribution Cats are today worldwide in their distribution, with the exception of Madagascar and Australia. The Old World producing the most notable living species, such as the lion, Felis leo, the tiger, Felis tigris, the leopard, Felis pardus, the ounce or snow leopard, Felis uncia, and others including the supposed ancestor of our domestic cat, the caffre or Egyptian cat, Felis caffra. In the New World, the most noteworthy are the puma, Felis concolor, the jaguar, Felis onca, 
and the lynxes and caracals. Fossil cats. But it is the fossil felines which are in many ways of the greatest interest, for they include not only the ancestors of the modern forms, but the now extinct saber-tooths, creatures whose endowment of effective weapons put them in the very forefront of the carnivorous hordes as efficient beasts of prey. Thus the felidae are divisible into two phyla or subfamilies. The felini or biting cats, the race to which all existing felines belong, and the macerodontini or saber-tooths, the stabbing cats whose line has ceased to exist. They show many points of contrast in body, limbs and tail, but especially in skull, jaws and dentition, and, as we shall see, these distinctions arose in the course of evolution from a single, as yet unknown stem through adaptation to contrasting types of prey, for the saber-tooths were relatively slow of foot, and their rise, culmination and decline is so intimately associated with that of the slow-moving, thick-skinned ungulates, elephants, rhinos, swine, the so-called pachyderms of Cuvier, that the conclusion that we have here, the proper association of predatory animals and their usual victims, is irresistible. On the other hand, the swift-footed biting cats are in like manner associated with the thin-skinned cursorial ungulates, as they are today, and the inference is that they in their turn were adapted to such a source of food. The contrasting anatomical features are felines have limbs less robust, more cursorial, toes tending to reduce, while macrodonts have limbs shortening, more robust, digits never fewer than five. In the felony, the tail was long, in the saber-tooths, it became progressively shortened, especially in the final form, smilodon. Dentition. In the felines or biting cats, the carnassial is relatively smaller, and the premolars in front of it are less reduced than in the saber-tooths. But it is in the development of the canine that the most marked distinction is seen, for while in the felinae, the upper and lower tusks are more nearly equivalent in size and power, in the macrodonts, the lower ones are reduced to a size not much greater than that of the incisors. The upper canines, on the contrary, have become thin, curved daggers of relatively enormous length, showing the same fine serrations on their cutting edges that we saw in the teeth of the carnivorous dinosaurs. It is these great sable-like tusks which gave the popular name to the group. Skull There is a marked difference in the form of the skull in the two phyla, especially when seen in profile and the principal purpose of this modification in the saber-tooths is to obtain greater leverage and so render more effective the downward stabbing stroke of the tusks. A glance at the diagram of the skulls of Felis tigris and Smilodon drawn to the same scale will render this clear. The principal distinction lies in the rear of the skull or occiput and in the arch of the face. In Felis, the cranial arch is highest just behind the orbits and diminishes both toward the front and toward the rear so that the occiput is comparatively low. In Smilodon, on the other hand, the rear of the skull is highest and the face slopes downward and forward, the sabers continuing the line of the curve. The condyle for the articulation with the neck is on a level with the tooth line in Felis, and the mastoid process behind the ear openings are inconspicuous. In Smilodon, on the other hand, the condyles are high and the mastoid processes extend far below them, these processes are for the insertion of the sternomastoid and clidomastoid muscles, whose combined function is to depress the skull. The value in the saber-tooth is at once apparent, as they are the muscles which produce the downward stroke of the head, by which, with terrible efficiency, the tusks are driven into the victim. A well-rounded condyle in Smilodon points to great freedom of movement in the vertical plane. The muscles of the dorsal side of the neck, which raise the head, were alike powerful in both forms. Jaw. There is a marked distinction in the lower jaws of the saber-tooths as compared with the biting cats, more marked in some respects in the earlier types such as Hoplophonius than in Smilodon. For here the jaw is lighter and has less powerful muscles, as the diminished coronoid process and other muscle insertions show. The jaw was capable of being opened more widely in the saber-tooth although the yawn of a modern tiger is a memorable sight. In the earlier saber-tooths, the front portion of the lower jaw is continued downward into a distinct flange for the protection of the tusk, a feature which the totally unrelated amblypod dinoceros also shows. In later forms, with the enormous extent of the tusks, such a protection becomes impracticable and the flange almost entirely disappears.
The chin of the saber-tooths, however, never shows the rounded character of that of the biting cats. Ancestry The cats seem to have had their initial evolution in the great Asiatic adaptive radiation center, whence they spread the world over. It is only in North America, however, that the paleontological series is sufficiently complete to reconstruct a phylogeny such as the above. The Asiatic Eocene ancestry is as yet unknown. Feline Phylum Denictus is the most primitive of cats, but is, nevertheless, despite the fact that Matthew places it in the biting cat phylum, a saber-tooth, as the elongated upper and reduced lower canines, the flattened chin, and the protective jaw flange show. Scott looks upon this form as the somewhat modified survivor of the ancestral stage, and representing very nearly the common starting point of both the feline and the macrodont subfamilies. As compared with its contemporary Hoplophonius, the limbs in Denictus are longer and more slender, implying greater cursorial powers. The limbs also retain more primitive features, and the smaller feet with their less developed claws do not have the clutching power of those of Hoplophonius. Altogether, Denictus, while showing certain saber-toothed characteristics, was speedier and less capable of holding a struggling prey while the stabbing tusks could manifest their effectiveness. It was therefore tending toward the adaptations of the modern cats, which is reason for considering it the first recorded member of their line rather than the common ancestor of both phyla. Denictus is confined to the American Oligocene. The genus Nimrivus is still more like the modern cats in the general aspect of the skull and dentition. The canines are more nearly of a size, although the upper ones are still decidedly the larger. The mastoid process is not at all prominent, the lower jaw lacks the flange, and the chin is becoming rounded. The limbs are long and slender as in Denictus, but the foot, instead of being five-toed, has but four, of which the lateral ones are shortened, while all of them bore only partially retractile claws. In general, the limbs are dog-like, resembling those of the living cheetah, Sinelurus, of which we have spoken and which may be a lineal descendant of these so-called false saber-tooths. Nimrivus is found in the upper Oligocene and lower Miocene of North America and the Miocene of France. In Pseudelurus, the canines are normal and the jaw has neither flange nor an angulated chin. The skeletal characters and much of the skull are as yet unknown. This cat is found in the mid-Miocene of France and again in the middle and upper Miocene of Nebraska and Colorado. It is an undoubted ancestor of Felis, though it may not have been derived from Denictus at all, but is rather, as Scott believes, a new migrant both into Europe and North America from the Asiatic home of the race. That there were two phyla, Scott does not deny. He does object, however, to Matthew's attempted derivation of biting cats from primitive saber-toothed such as Denictus, claiming that this view runs contrary to the supposed law of the irreversibility of evolution, a rule which many authorities look upon as well established. The theory, Scott continues, postulates a different mode of development from anything that we have so far encountered in the series, previously described and supposes that the upper canine first lost its original form, becoming a thin, elongate and scimitar-like tusk while the lower canine was reduced almost to the proportions of an incisor, and the lower jaw acquired a straight flat chin and inferior flanges for the protection of the tusks. Then, after specialization had advanced so far, it was reversed and the original condition regained. This interesting hypothesis may possibly turn out to be true, though personally I cannot accept it, and should it do so, it would necessitate a thoroughgoing revision of current opinions as to the processes of mammalian development. The law of the irreversibility of evolution applies rather to the impossibility of regaining a lost anatomical structure, not, as Scott would imply, to the reduction of a highly specialized one. And while the parallelism is not exact, the proboscideans to be discussed in the next chapter underwent somewhat the same evolution as that which Matthew postulates for the cats, in that a highly modified and elongate jaw synthesis subsequently shortened and simplified, and the upper tusks, large structures in all known prehistoric elephants, are today becoming vestigial in the existing Indian species, even in the males. Felis is the final genus of the biting cat phylum, and needs no further description than that given above. 
Geologically, it dates back to the Pliocene and was represented in the North American Pleistocene by a large species, Felis atrox, of a size greater than a lion and ranging over the southern half of the continent. Huge specimens of this species, differing somewhat from the type, have been found in the Rancho La Brea asphalt of Southern California, in association with the great saber-tooth Smilodon californicus. But although the skulls of the latter are numbered by the hundreds, as many as thirty have been found within the space of three or four cubic yards, Daggett. Those of the former are very rare, as though their habitat and habits differed materially, and the lion-like form not being adapted to prey upon the great brutes which were caught in the tar, did not venture within the limits of its fatal grasp. Sabretooth Phylum Turning to the Sabretooth Phylum, there is little doubt that the Oligocene Hoplophonius was the direct ancestor of the Sabretooth line. In this genus, the upper canine was long, thin, curved, and finely serrated along both edges, but the lower canines were hardly larger than the incisors. The skull was longer than in modern cats, and in every way resembled a smaller and more primitive edition of that of Smilodon. The lower jaw was relatively much stouter than in the latter, and the flange was so deep that the tusks were completely protected and could only be used when the mouth was open. Smilodon, on the other hand, could have used the tusks very effectively with the mouth closed. Whether it did or not is a matter of opinion which cannot now be decided. The body and tail of Hoplophonius had more the proportions of a modern leopard, but the limbs were more powerful, although far less so than in Smilodon. The character of the four-limb bones implies great freedom of rotation of the four-paw, showing it to have had a more general use than in modern cats. The feet were small, five-toed, but with fully retractile claws. Thus, Merriam says, the presence of long, knife-like canines is correlated with powerful grasping feet possessing highly developed retractile claws. With his powerful feet, the animal clung to its prey while it struck repeatedly with its thin, sharp sabers. Macarodus is the Miocene to Pleistocene representative of the saber-toothed phylum, known from very fragmentary material in North America but from practically perfect skulls in the Miocene of France. The skull is like that of Smilodon, but somewhat more primitive, being longer, with a smaller brain case and muscular crests. The mastoid processes for the insertion of the stabbing muscles of the neck were less developed. The jaw, on the contrary, was proportionately heavier than in Smilodon, and the protective flange much larger. It was insufficient, however, fully to protect the canine when the mouth was closed. Macarodus is, in many respects, midway between Hoplophonius and Smilodon, but whether or not any of the American Miocene and Pliocene forms are surely of that genus cannot be decided until skulls are found. The jaws which are known, however, are quite similar. The genus Smilodon terminates the series of saber-toothed cats and has already been characterized in contrast with Felis. It seems to be exclusively New World, the European Pleistocene saber-tooths belonging to the more conservative Macarodus. Smilodon was originally discovered in South America, Pampas Formation, but its presence in North America is abundantly proved by the profusion of its remains at Rancho La Brea. As it is often found in association with ground slots, Smilodon, etc., which are unknown in the Old World, its final specialization over the more conservative Macarodus, its European contemporary, may well have been a special adaptation to destroy and devour the great slots in particular, rather than the other pachyderms which form the dietary staple of saber-tooths in general, and the other pachyderms which form the dietary staple of saber-tooths in general. There is preserved in the museum at Buenos Aires a skull of Smilodon Neogaeus, casts of which may be seen in many museums, in which one of the tusks is locked fast by its tip between the equivalent canine and incisor of the lower jaw. This has been cited as argument for the belief that these structures had grown so huge as to become an actual menace to the individual, causing in the present instance a case of mechanical lockjaw which was followed by death from starvation. The analogy, although not precise, lies with the deer whose antlers are occasionally locked in combat, resulting in the speedy death of the contestants either from starvation or because their subsequent helplessness renders them an easy prey to human or other enemies. This has been taken as an argument in favour of momentum in variation, Loomis, by which is meant orthogenetic variation, possibly guided in part by natural selection, but which, instead of seizing when the point of greatest usefulness is attained, 
breaks away from selection control and continues to increase even to the limit of disaster. Merriam speaks of the destructive apparatus of the saber-toothed tiger as one of the most deadly combinations that has been found in any flesh-eating animal, but like the delicate mechanism of the high-power gun, there seem also to have been great possibilities for becoming disabled, and if the long thin sabres were once broken, the saber-tooths would be less effective than the other large cats. In a large number of specimens found there is evidence of fracture or loss of one or both sabres long before the death of the animal, so that the extreme specialization of this creature may have led to a stage at which accidents occurred so commonly as to destroy the type. Matthew, on the contrary, cannot believe that such a noxious character could be developed to the point of seriously reducing the expectation of life of the individuals in which it was present, much less of being the direct cause of the extinction of a race. He believes that, in Smilodon, the immense development of the canines made them highly efficient weapons for a particular mode of attack, and was an essential element of its success in its especial mode of life, not a hindrance or bar to its survival. As we have seen, the evolution of the biting cat, swift of foot and powerful of jaw, was correlated with that of the thin-skinned cursorial ungulates, their normal prey. With them, these cats spread and waxed strong and powerful, and with their diminution in the new world, the felines diminished. In the old world, on the contrary, both great cats and great game of the cursorial sort are still numerous. The macarodons, on the other hand, increased pari passu with the heavy, slow-moving, thick-skinned forms, and with them they diminished, for both the ungulates and the slots and their saber-toothed enemies are extinct in the new world, while in the old, the great ungulates are rare and so far between that the saber-toothed have entirely disappeared there as well. Since their day, the elephants and rhinos, once their stature is attained, fear no foe but man, although the lions and tigers do assail their young, and thus they are held in check. It is the old story of high and narrow specialization and the dependence upon a peculiar sort of conditions and of food. Eliminate those conditions or the food, and the very specialization which was once a mark of adaptability now makes the race inadaptable and its doom is sealed. End of chapter 33this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Christian Silva. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 34. Proboscideans. Aside from the whales and the great dinosaurs of the Mesozoic, the elephants lead the kingdom of beasts in size and majesty and stand unique in nobility of physical and mental character. Add to this the fact that their evolution since the close of the Eocene can be traced with great fullness, and their claim to our interest, second only perhaps to that of the horses and mankind, is complete. Place in Nature The placental mammals may be grouped principally according to the character of their foot armament into four cohorts, the clawed or unguiculate forms, the hooved or ungulate, the nailed or primate, and the cetaceans or whales. Of these, the carnivora as representatives of the unguiculates have been discussed, and we now pass to a consideration of the hooved creatures, of which the proboscidea form, in a sense, the most primitive of living orders. Proboscidea are therefore members of the class Mammalia, cohort ungulata, which embraces also the familiar parasodactyla and artiodactyla, the archaic condylarthra and emblipida, in the curious South American notoungulata, as well as the hyracoidea, and, as an appendix to the cohort, the serenia, or sea cows. It is with the last two orders particularly that we are concerned, for paleontology has shown that, however far removed from the lordly elephant, the humble hyraces or conies on the one hand, and the whale-like sea cows on the other may be, they are nevertheless the nearest to the proboscidea of all mammalian orders. The great divergences between the ultimate representatives of the proboscidea and serenia, the elephant and manatee, are merely due to environmental adaptation, the offspring of a swamp-dwelling ancestor coming to a parting of the ways of which one leads to firmer ground, the other to the waters. The elephant's evolution, as we shall see, largely concerns the head. 
the body, except for the increase in bulk and the mechanical readjustment of the limbs to bear the weight, exhibiting but little change with the flight of time. The sea cow, on the other hand, is profoundly altered in its bodily contour. The hind limbs have disappeared, and in their stead there has been developed a propulsive tail. The head, however, in contrast with that of the elephant, has remained practically as it was. The other near relatives of the proboscidea, the hyracoidea, are few, nor have we record of their ever having been numerous. They are small, rabbit-like animals, differing from the proboscideans in that their feet are hooved instead of being clawed. Their ears are short, and their teeth are those of ungulates, more like those of a miniature rhinoceros than a rodent. These are the conies, the feeble folk of the Book of Proverbs, which make their dwelling among the rocks, and they have existed with comparatively little change for millions of years, while elephant and sea cow lineage have departed so widely, each along its chosen course. The hyraces, of which there are but two genera, one of them, curiously enough, being arboreal, are distributed from the Arabian Peninsula through Africa to the Cape of Good Hope. These closely related orders, Proboscidea, Hyracoidea, and Serenia, are known first from Africa and seem to form the principal contribution of the Dark Continent to the world's mammalian fauna. Elephant Anatomy Something of the anatomical structure of the elephant is necessary to an understanding of the evolutionary changes which its ancestors have undergone. In our discussion of this structure, we will speak first of the primitive or archaic characteristics, then of the elephant's specializations. Archaic Characters The elephant contains within its huge body a number of primitive features, for the soft parts of an animal's anatomy are less subject to mechanical stresses, and are therefore rather more conservative in their rate of change than are the bones and teeth. To enumerate briefly, the stomach is simple in form, the liver has but two lobes without a gallbladder, the lungs are simple and but slightly lobated, there are two superior vena cavi, the ancient number, which carry blood to the heart, the placenta by which the unborn young are nourished is primitive, and finally the brain, although huge in size, is old-fashioned in form in that the cerebrum, or forebrain, does not cover the cerebellum, a notable contrast with that of man. Skeletal Structures the feet are five-toed, although there is a tendency toward the reduction of the lateral digits of the hind foot, especially in the African elephant. The number of hooves may be fewer than the actual digits, as the entire structure is encased within a huge cylindrical mass of flesh and skin, so that no external sign of the digits other than their terminal nail-like hooves is visible. The carpal, or wrist bones, are serial, that is, placed one above another in line with the metacarpals themselves. This is the type of wrist seen in the condylarth phenacodus, and is mechanically defective as compared with the displaced or interlocking carpus, wherein the bones alternate, as do the stones in a well-laid wall. It will be seen at once that a serial carpus will not properly resist splitting stresses, and therefore cannot be used in an animal which is either digitigrade or unguligrade, unless, as in the elephant, the entire foot is bound together in such a way as to eliminate those strains. On the part of all cursorial ungulates, such as the horse or deer, the ulna tends to reduce, especially in its lower two-thirds, the upper portion, which forms the elbow joint, being of necessity retained. In the proboscidea, on the other hand, not only is the ulna retained entire, but it has become the dominant bone of the forearm, the radius being much more slender, and crossing over the ulna from the outer to the inner side. Specializations Size. The grandeur of the elephant is a familiar thing in these days of zoological gardens and circus caravans, but rarely does one see a really huge specimen. The tallest living elephants belong to the African species, as those of India are longer and lower. Jumbo, the huge African elephant purchased by P. T. Barnum from the London Zoo, had a height of eleven feet and a weight of six and a half tons. His weight, but not his stature, was exceeded by a huge Indian elephant in Barnum's herd a few years ago. Wild African elephants are said to attain a height of 13 feet, while the largest American proboscidean was the imperial elephant of the early Pleistocene, whose stature equaled if it did not surpass that of the African form. The greatest recorded height is that announced in the recent English press for a straight-tusked elephant, Elephus antiquus discovered near Chatham, England, 
in a pleistocene river terrace in the grounds of the royal school of military engineering at upnor this creature will rival if not exceed in size the great skeleton of elephas meridionalis in the paris museum which measures about fourteen feet in height at the shoulder pillar-like limbs while the bones of the limbs and feet are primitive in their numbers and arrangement they are modified in one way in that they lack the angulation characteristic of ordinary ungulates and are perpendicular one above another thus in the horse the thigh is permanently flexed at the knee so that its long diameter is always oblique but that of the elephant is vertical this produces an alteration in the shape of the bone itself for in the horse it is an elongated s with the articular forces more or less parallel with the axis in the elephant it is i-shaped the articulations lying at right angles with the axis of the bone as the stress is thus transmitted through the length of the bone the latter may be flattened without serious detriment to its strength which is impossible when the stress passes obliquely through the bone we find this same type of limb again and again as in the amblypod dinoceros and the seropod dinosaurs and while these creatures have not been observed in the flesh the inference that their limbs were elephantine as an adjustment to weight carrying is irresistible shortening of the neck as a rule long limbs like those of the elephants are accompanied by a corresponding lengthening of the neck as in the horse or more notably the giraffe to enable the owner to reach the ground this arrangement serves well enough where the head is comparatively small and there is no proboscis but in the elephant the huge head could hardly be borne on a long neck and besides the proboscis obviates the necessity for this proboscis the trunk of the elephant is in many ways its most distinctive feature and indeed gives the name to the order it is the much elongated combined nose and upper lip and the nostrils run the entire length terminating at the tip which is provided with one indian or two african finger-like processes by which relatively minute objects may readily be picked up the trunk is a great muscular mass with an enormous number of component muscles which by their coordinate movement shorten or lengthen the organ as a whole or curl it about any larger object to be lifted it abundantly compensates for the extremely short neck form of the skull next to the proboscis one of the most remarkable elephantine features is the peculiar proportions assumed by the skull which has not only increased in actual size but its height is all out of proportion to its length as compared with that of other animals this is simply a mechanical adaptation to give leverage for the great weight of the trunk and its occasional burdens the skull may be looked upon as a lever of which the occipital condyles form the fulcrum the long axis the weight arm and the occipital plane at right angles to the long axis the power arm shortening the long axis reduces the weight arm while the heightening of the skull especially at the occiput lengthens relatively and actually the power arm thus increasing the leverage and at the same time giving greater surface for the attachment of the great elastic ligament ligamentum nuchae which runs backward to the vertebral spines and bears the weight of the head and for the huge muscles of the neck thus not only is the power greatly increased but it is much more effectively applied through this bulldogging of the skull as it has been called the alterations in shape thus described do not carry with them an increase in the size of the brain cavity but the outer and inner tables of the cranial bones have separated from each other and the intervening space has become filled with air cells separated by thin apparently irregular bony plates to this cancellous bone with its air cells the name diploe has been given it is found in the skulls of other animals and of man where wide expansions of bone are developed such as in the skull of coryphodon but nowhere is the diploe developed to the extent found in the elephant dentition another highly characteristic proboscidean feature is the dentition remarkable in three ways fewness of the teeth present at any one time tooth succession and the development of the individual tooth itself an elephant, genus Elephus, never has more than one pair of tusks, which are the second upper incisor teeth, and one complete or two partial grinders in each half of each jaw, that is, six complete or ten partially worn and partly formed teeth at any one time. Of course, the total number of teeth is greater, twenty-eight as compared with the normal forty-four, but instead of having a milk set succeeded vertically by the permanent teeth, 
the teeth appear in numerical sequence. The upper milk tusks are succeeded by the permanent ones, as in other mammals. The grinders, however, are formed one at a time in the rear part of the jaws, and move forward to replace those worn out by use. Owen tells us that the milk or deciduous tusk appears beyond the gum between the sixth and seventh month, and rarely exceeds two inches in length and a third of an inch in diameter at its thickest part, where it protrudes from the socket. The permanent tusk cuts the gum usually a month or two after the milk tusk is shed. The first molar tooth appears during the second week, is complete and in full use at three months, and is shed when the elephant is about two years old. The second molar has most of the plates in use at two years of age and is shed at six. The third appears at two, is at its maximum at five, and is shed at nine. These are looked upon as milk molars. The first true molar, which is the fourth grinder in succession, appears at the sixth year and is shed from twenty to twenty-five. The fifth shows its crown at twenty and is shed probably at sixty, and the last molar appears at from forty to fifty years and lasts out the century. The tusks are spirally curved elongated cones, composed, except for a small patch of enamel at their unworn tip, entirely of dentine or ivory of the superlative fineness. They grow from a large conical pulp at the bottom of the alveolus, or socket, and are formed continuously throughout the animal's life. Many other creatures, such as the rodents, have continually growing incisors, but with them the upper and lower teeth are antagonistic, and are kept within limits by wear. With the elephant's tusks this is not true, and while their use, especially that of digging, entails some wear, there is nothing to limit their monstrous growth. The tusks of the Indian or Asiatic elephant are comparatively moderate in size, the largest cited by Owen in his odontography having a length of nine feet with a basal diameter of eight inches and a weight of 150 pounds. But, as he says, these dimensions are rare in the Asiatic species. The record for an African elephant, on the other hand, is that of a superb pair of tusks recently seen in New York of which the right one was 10 feet 3 quarter inches by 23 inches in circumference and weighed 224 pounds, while the left was 10 feet 3 and a half inches long by 24 and a half inches around and weighed 239 pounds, giving a total of 463 pounds for the pair. It is said that the creature that bore these tusks was so old and the tusks so burdensome that he occasionally had to stop and rest their tips on the ground. The females of both species usually have smaller and straighter tusks than the males, although the tusks may be vestigial in the Asiatic females and in the males as well. In certain of the extinct forms, notably the imperial elephant of the southern United States and Mexico, the tusks are much larger, those of a specimen at Yale measuring more than 13 feet on the curve, while one in the city of Mexico is said to exceed 16 feet. The molar teeth are highly complex structures, made up of a number, up to twenty-seven or more, of transverse plates or lamellae, each of which is composed of a flattened mass of dentine surrounded by enamel. The plates are united by a third substance known as cement, so that as the crown wears away, it bears a number of transverse ridges, formed of the harder enamel, separated by depressions at the bottom of which lies the softer cement or dentine, as the case may be. The first teeth are relatively simple, but the number of plates and consequent ridges, two to a plate, increases with the size of the teeth until in the last molar the maximum of 27 for the Asiatic and 10 or 11 for the African elephant is reached, the latter being more primitive in its tooth structure. End of chapter 34, part A. Chapter 34B of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francis Wicks. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Part 3 The Evidences of Evolution. Section 3 Paleontology. Chapter 34B Probiscidians. Brain. As we have already seen, the brain is of an old-fashioned sort in that the forebrain does not cover the hindbrain. On the other hand, its specializations lie in its great size, which actually twice exceeds that of man and is second only to the size of the brain of the great whales. In addition to its volume, the elephant brain is noted for its convolutions, but this is in part an adaptation to size, 
for the bulk of an object increases with the cube of its diameter, while the surface enlarges with the square. The one, therefore, outruns the other, and, if they are to bear a definite ratio to each other, the surface must be increased by infolding. Bedard speaks of the proboscidean brain as a great specialization of a low type. The intelligence of the elephant has been exaggerated by some writers and greatly minimized by others. Elephants possess a remarkable memory of injuries, real or fancied, of misfortunes, of friend and foe, and of the time and place of the ripening of favorite fruits, as many a planter knows to his cost. They also learn to perform complex labors, such as the carrying and piling of logs in the teak yards of India, without direction other than the initial order. They are obedient and docile, notably those of India, and this seems the more remarkable when it is remembered that they are not domestic animals, in the sense of being the product of generations of selective breeding, but that practically everyone is caught wild and subsequently tamed, so that these qualities of which we speak are inherent in the race. But the docility, especially of the males, is subject to rude interruption by periods of nervous excitement, apparently of a sexual nature, known as must, during which they become very dangerous and sometimes destroy the keepers in their paroxysms of rage. Ultimately, all male elephants become surly and intractable. In the wild state, such are known as rogues and live apart from their kind until they die. The great Asiatic elephant, Gunda, in the New York Zoological Park, when purchased in 1904, was so docile that children rode upon his back. In 1908, he began to show signs of surliness, and the following year made a murderous attack upon his keeper. In 1912, Gunda was put in chains for another savage assault, and in 1913, another keeper had a narrow escape from death. Finally, in 1915, the beast had become so dangerous and so unhappy that in spite of being in every other way a superb specimen, he was condemned to death and executed. His age at the time of his death was about 24 years. The famous Jumbo was sold from the London Zoological Gardens because he was no longer trustworthy from the same cause. He was not, however, a confirmed rogue, even when he died three and a half years later. Jumbo was also 24 years old at the time of his death. There is a certain parallelism between the nature of human mental development and that of the elephant. One of the most potent factors in the evolution of man's mind is his ability to handle various objects and thus bring them before the eyes for examination. This is also true of the elephant, although to a less extent, and undoubtedly has aided materially in its mental development. Elephants have been rightly accused of timidity and cowardice, though when brought to bay, rage may simulate courage, making a charging tusker a most formidable foe. Senses. In common with most forest and jungle dwellers with whom opportunity for extended vision is rare, elephants are relatively dull of sight, though keen of scent and hearing. In fact, marvelously so, for Schillings, the German explorer, tells us that they either have an acuteness of some known sense far beyond our comprehension or some other sense unknown to us. The latter, however, is hardly possible, and since the sentinels of the herd stand with uplifted trunk testing the breeze, it is probably in the sense of smell that elephants are thus gifted. Evidences for Evolution Ontogeny But little is known of the earlier stages of elephant ontogeny owing to the great scarcity of embryonic material. The smallest and most immature embryo of which a description has been thus far published was pictured in L'Illustration for December 20th, 1912. In this picture, the creature, whose length was but 17 centimeters, 6 and 5 eighths inches, is seen astride an ordinary drinking glass, tumbler, but even at this early stage is essentially elephantine, proboscis and all. About the only thing noticeable in the picture, wherein the specimen departs from the normal elephant, is the marked angulation of the limbs and the relatively greater length of the foot below the heel. The embryo is that of an African elephant from the Congo. Aside from the gradual increase in tooth complexity with age, perhaps the most notable ontogenetic change is the heightening of the skull with the development of the diplo. For the cranium of a newborn elephant is like that of other mammals, a comparatively thin-walled brain case, the cavity of which increases but little in size with the growth of the skull as a whole, as the figure shows. Phylogeny Size The phylogenetic changes, on the other hand, are amply recorded by the remarkably extensive series of fossil proboscidea 
which have come to light. If merithorium, see page 593, is to be considered a proboscidean in the direct line of descent, its estimated height of three and a half feet may be taken as the one extreme in the series, that of Eliphas Antiquus of fourteen feet as the other, an increase of about four diameters or sixty-four times in bulk. Dentition. The dental formula of merithorium may be expressed thus, incisors upper right three, left three, lower right three, left three, canines upper one and one, lower zero, premolars upper three and three, lower three and three, molars upper three and three, lower three and three, equaling upper twenty, lower eighteen, equals thirty-eight teeth, a very slight reduction from the normal forty-four. In Peleomastodon, see page 593, the formula is incisors upper 1 and 1, lower 1 and 1, canines upper 1 and 1, lower 0, premolars upper 3 and 3, lower 3 and 3, molars upper 3 and 3, lower 3 and 3, equals 16 upper 14 lower, equals 30. In Mastodon Americanus, deciduous teeth, incisors upper one and one, lower one and one, canines upper zero and zero, lower zero and zero, molars upper three and three, lower three and three, equaling eight upper eight lower, sixteen. Permanent teeth, incisors upper one, lower zero to one canines upper zero lower zero premolars upper one lower one molars upper three and three lower three and three equals upper ten lower eight equals eighteen to twenty eliphas deciduous and permanent incisors Upper two and two, lower zero. Molars upper six and six, lower six and six. Equals sixteen upper, twelve lower. Equals twenty eight. Thus it will be seen that there is a gradual diminution in the number of the teeth during the progress of evolution. Especially is this true with reference to the number present in the jaws at any one time. In the earliest proboscidean, Merithorium, the molar teeth are small and short-crowned, with two or three simple transverse crests separated by open valleys. As time goes on, the number of cross-crests becomes greater, although in the mastodons there are never more than five or six. The mastodons have, moreover, little or no cement in the intervening valleys, although the latter may be more or less interrupted by additional cusps. In some species, the worn crests are comparatively simple. In others, there is a more or less complex trefoil, pattern of the enamel produced by wear the transitional elephants of the genus stegodon see page 600 have more complicated teeth the crests increasing in number up to 10 and becoming narrower there is also a tendency towards the filling of the valleys with cement in eliphas the deep crowned complex grinding teeth suitable for harsh herbage are perfected reaching great intricacy in the siberian mammoth eliphas primogeneus in which the number of crests may be 25 or more in the African elephant, Loxodonta, the teeth are less complex in that not only are the crests fewer, 10 or 12, but each becomes lozenge-shaped upon wear, rather than having the form of the greatly compressed ellipse with parallel sides. Tusks. The earliest form, Merithorium, has three incisor teeth above on each side, the second pair of which are larger than the others and point sharply downward. The single lower incisors are in the form of procumbent tusks, almost horizontal in their position. Paleomastodon, the next stage, has a single pair of tusks above, with a broad enamel band and a pair of spatulate ones below, at the end of the elongating lower jaw. None of the tusks are continuously growing as in later forms. From Paleomastodon on, the tusks are born in both jaws and grow continuously throughout life, the upper pair, which are curved downward, possessing an enamel band on their outer face. 
These are the four tuskers, or tetrabelodonts. Subsequently, all of the proboscidea lose the lower tusks, although vestiges, one or two, may be present in the male of the American mastodon. With the loss of the lower tusks, the upper ones turn upward and finally lose their enamel, as in the form just mentioned and in the true elephants. Lower jaw. The lower jaw also undergoes a remarkable evolutionary change, elongating at the synthesis with the development of the lower tusks until a maximum is reached, after which, with the loss of these tusks, it shortens until but a spout-like vestige of the old elongation remains. In the aberrant form Dinotherium, the lower tusks are retained, but the jaw bends downward sharply at the symphysis so that the short, pointed tusks lie at right angles to the jaw. The upper tusks are apparently lacking. Tusks seem to have had their stimulating function, that of digging, first a spade-like use of the spatulate lower tusks, the upper ones having possibly a pickaxe-like function for loosening the earth. Later, when the upper ones assume the entire digging function, as we have seen, they turn upward instead of down. The African elephant to this day is a most industrious digger, and the right tusk, as a consequence, is almost always the shorter of the two. The use to which Dinotherium puts its lower tusks is conjectural. There is reason to believe, however, that it may have been partially aquatic, and the simplicity of its teeth points to a very succulent sort of food, possibly of aquatic or swamp vegetation. If so, the tusks may have been used for detaching it. Proboscis the presence of a proboscis is always indicated by the shortening and backward retreat of the nasal bones, together with the strengthening of the adjoining bones for muscle attachment. There is therefore no reason to believe that Merithereum bore a proboscis of any sort, although it may have possessed a prehensile upper lip. But even this cannot be proved. In Paleomastodon, on the other hand, the nasals have receded and the rear of the skull has begun to heighten, indicating that a proboscis has been developed probably merely for the purpose of reaching beyond the lower tusks. Thus, the development of the latter seems to have been the prime cause of the growth of the trunk, which developed pari passu with the elongating lower jaw. Although the jaw was long, however, the proboscis was distinctly limited in its movement, for while it could be raised and swayed from side to side, it could not be bent downward unless to one side of the jaw. The shortening of the jaw, or, as in the Dinotherium, its downward curvature, left the proboscis as the wonderful pendant organ which the living elephant possesses. End of chapter 34b, recording by Francis Wicks, Canada. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 34c of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francis Wicks. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Part 3. The Evidences of Evolution. Section 3. Paleontology. Chapter 34c. Proboscideans. Ancestry. Early Tertiary Ancestors. The genus Meritherium, Maris, an ancient lake near which the remains were found, and Beast, comes from rocks of late Eocene and lower Oligocene age in what is known as the Fayum district of the Libyan desert some sixty miles southwest of Cairo, Egypt. The form is imperfectly known, except for the skull, which is unlike that of any other proboscidean in that the face is short, the middle portion long, and there is no indication of a proboscis. However, it does show the beginnings of proboscidean evolution in that the nasal openings are large, and are beginning to recede. The air cells are beginning to form in the back of the skull. The second pair of upper incisors are enlarging into tusks. The molars are transversely ridged, and the anterior part of the lower jaw is elongating and becoming spout-like. So much of the skeleton, as is known, indicates an animal about three and a half feet high. This creature was probably a swamp dweller, living upon the succulent semi-aquatic herbage of the time. It is unrecorded outside of the Fayum, but seems to have existed into the lower Oligocene so as to become a contemporary with the next genus. The succeeding genus in the evolutionary series, Paleomastodon, from ancient and Mastodon, was also discovered in the lower Oligocene of the Fayum district, but has recently been reported from the Gaj horizon of northern India in the Siwalik Hills. It is an undoubted proboscidean of larger size than its predecessor and with limbs much like those of modern types. 
the skull has increased materially in height, with a considerable development of diplo, and the small nasals with their openings have receded, so that they lie just in front of the orbit, much as in the modern tapers. This would imply the development of a short extensile proboscis. The upper and lower canine and incisor teeth have entirely disappeared, with the exception of the second pair of incisors, which have become well-developed tusks. Those of the upper jaw are large, downward curved, and have a band of enamel on their outer face. The lower jaw has elongated considerably, especially at the symphysis, and the tusks point directly forward, as in Melitherium. The premolar teeth have two, and the molars three, transverse crests composed of distinct tubercles, while the hindermost teeth is tending to develop yet another crest. The neck is fairly long, although the posterior cervical vertebrae tend to shorten. Dinotherium, an extinct proboscidean whose remains have been found in the Miocene and Pliocene of Europe and India, differs remarkably from the contemporary mastodons, mainly in its dentition, in that the teeth, which are more numerous than in the proboscideans in general, and have the normal vertical succession, have but two transverse crests. They are, therefore, the simplest of proboscidean molars. The upper tusks appear to be lacking, and, as we have seen, the lower jaw, with its contained tusks, bends abruptly downward at the symphysis. There is evidence for the presence of a well-developed trunk, and the remainder of the skeleton is typically proboscidean. The skull and the body and limbs have much the proportions of the American mastodon. A gigantic skeleton from the Romanian Pliocene, Dinotherium gigantissimum, exceeds the largest mastodon in stature. We can conjecture little of the origin or of the habits of this form, except that its food must have been of a very succulent sort. Its line must have diverged from the main proboscidean stem very early, as even Paleomastodon is too far advanced to have given rise to it. It represents an aberrant sideline of fairly long duration. Later Tertiary Mastodons There is considerable confusion as to the exact relationship of the various species of later tertiary mastodons, and their exact phylogeny is not yet clearly understood. So the classification here given is tentative and subject to future revision. It seems most natural to group together all of the four tusked mastodons with the elongated lower jaw under the name Tetrabelodon, Greek four, dart, and tooth. A study of their molar teeth seems to show that at least two parallel evolutionary lines would be thus included, both of which, from the trend of proboscidean evolution, pass through a four tusk stage. Classifying them in this way, we recognize two principal genera, Trilophodon, three, and crest, and Tetralophodon, four, and crest, in which the intermediate molars, milk molar four, molars one, and two, have three and four cross crests, respectively. Trilophodon is the third stage in proboscidean evolution, if we omit Dinotherium, and is well represented by the Miocene Trilophodon Angustidens, of which a splendid specimen from Gere, France, is preserved in the Museum of the Jardin des Plantes at Paris. It was an animal of considerable size, nearly as large as the Indian elephant, but differing from it in the enormously long lower jaw, which, with its contained tusks, had reached a mechanical limit of efficiency. The downward curved, enamel banded upper tusks do not reach much beyond the limit of those of the lower jaw. The adult molars have attained such a size that but two can be contained in a jaw at any one time. Correlated with the great length of the jaws is a marked increase in the diplo of the skull. Trilophodon was a great migrant, for not only do we find its remains in Europe and Africa, but it was the first proboscidean to reach North America and must have come by way of Asia early in the Miocene time. Thereafter, the Proboscidea formed an important element in the fauna of North America until the extinction of the American Mastodon in post-glacial time. Trilophodon productus is a well-known Texan specimen from the Pliocene. The group known as Tetralophodon is also long-jawed. One American form, Trilophodon lily, from the Nebraska Pliocene, possessing a mandible at least six feet in length and very heavily built, 
and the entire animal must have been ponderous. The type specimen, that of a very old animal, has but one badly worn molar left in each jaw. Tetralophodonts are numerous in both the Old and New World. In the latter, they give rise to the next genus to be considered, Dibelodon. In Dibelodon, Greek for two and dart, the molar teeth are similar, and, because the intervening valleys are blocked by additional cusps, form, when worn, a rather intricate enamel pattern. It differs from the tetralophodont group, however, in the loss of its lower tusks and the consequent shortening of the jaw. The enamel band of the upper tusks also tend to disappear, and in its final stage we have a form not unlike mastodon itself, except for the greater complication of its grinders. Dibelodon is found widespread in the Pliocene of North America, and, as far as we know, was almost the only proboscidean to reach South America, where it spread one species along the Andean highland, another in the lower country to the east. The genus persisted into the Pleistocene in the southern hemisphere, but in the north was replaced by Mastodon. Mastodon, Greek for breast and tooth, the best known of American proboscideans, belongs in reality to the Trilophodont group, as its intermediate molars possessed but three crests. They also lack the intervening cusps of Tetralophodon, so that the tooth is simpler in its appearance. The lower jaw is shortened in common with that of all later proboscideans, but, as we have seen, vestigial and apparently functionless tusks may be present in some lower jaws, presumably those of the males. The huge specimen, the so-called Warren Mastodon, in the American Museum of Natural History, has but one such tusk, while the Otisville specimen, a splendid young male, mounted in the Yale Museum, has none, nor is there any trace of a socket. The Mastodon attained a height about equal to that of the Indian elephant, from seven to nine feet, but was much stockier and more robust in build, a feature especially noticeable in the breadth of the pelvis and the massiveness of the limb bones. The skull also differs from that of the true elephants in its lower, more primitive contour, and although there is a large development of air cells in the cranial walls, the brain cavity is relatively larger. The upper tusks are comparable to those of the elephants in the absence of enamel. Their length may exceed nine feet. There are but two adult molars in the jaws at any one time. The mastodons were Pliocene and Pleistocene in range, outliving the true elephants in North America. In geographical distribution, they range from Europe across Asia to Alaska and thence southward throughout the United States. They seem to have been more exclusively forest-dwelling forms than the true elephants which were their contemporaries. Their remains have been found chiefly as a result of drainage excavations in the swamps and boggy lands where they were doubtless mired and thus preserved from decay. This is especially true in New York, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and Iowa, where it is said that almost every bog contains a mastodon. The food consisted of twigs of hemlock, spruce, and other evergreen trees, possibly other herbaceous vegetation as well, and one specimen, found in Ulster County, New York, had preserved with the bones a quantity of long, dense, shaggy hair of a dark golden-brown color. True Elephants In order to trace the evolution of the true elephants, one must go back to the upper Miocene of southern India, to the form known as Mastodon latidens. This creature gave rise to a species variously known as Mastodon elephantoids, that is, elephant-like, or Stegodon, Greek to cover, Clifty, for its transitional character is such that authorities differ as to whether it is a mastodon or an elephant. In Stegodon, the molar teeth have more numerous ridges than in the true mastodons, and the name is given because of the roof-like character of these ridges, the summits of which are subdivided into five or six small rounded prominences. There is a thin layer of cement over the enamel in an unworn tooth, but no great accumulation of it in the valleys, in contrast with the elephants. These teeth show how slight the transition is. However, add merely a filling of cement to bind the crest together and the elephant tooth is formed. True stegodon remains have been found only in southern and southeastern Asia, which suggests that that region may have been the original home of the true elephants. 
The elephants have been sufficiently defined in the anatomical section of this chapter. Aside from the living forms, two species are peculiar to the European Pliocene and Pleistocene, and two to the North American, while a third, the hairy mammoth, Elephas, Greek for elephant, primogenius, is common to both and to Northern Asia as well. The European species were Elephas antiquitus, the straight tusked elephant, and Elephas meridionalis, the former being the more primitive and showing the closest affinity with the living African species Loxodonta. Both these and E. primogenius were contemporaries of early man in Europe during the glacial period. The American species are, first, E. imperator, the larger so-called southern or imperial mammoth or elephant, as its remains are found in Mexico, whence it ranged into Texas, California, and as far north as Nebraska. A single molar teeth described from British Guiana seems to pertain to this elephant. If so, it is the only other species of proboscidean, aside from the genus Dibelodon, recorded from the southern continent. The molars of the imperial elephant are distinctive in that the crests are relatively few and the surrounding cement very thick. The second American species is Elephas columbi, the Colombian elephant, a successor of Imperator, distinguished by its lesser stature and more numerous crests to the teeth. Each of the American species seems to have been characterized by the extreme spiral form of the tusks, which in old age actually crossed at the tip, so that their primal function of digging was utterly lost, nor were they efficient weapons of offense or defense. They have been cited as instances of evolutionary momentum, if such a thing exists, and certainly, so far as we can see, were detrimental to their owner rather than otherwise. E. columbi is widespread throughout the United States up to the limits of the range of E. primogenius, which replaced it in the north. The distinction between the two species, however, is not always clear, and there may have been transitional forms. Elephas primogenius is the hairier woolly mammoth, the mammoth of popular knowledge. It was a near relative of the living Asiatic elephant, but adapted to withstand the cold of the Arctic climate. This adaptation lay in the development of a coat of coarse, long, black hair with a thick coat of brown wool beneath. It was circumpolar in its range, being found in great abundance along the shores of the Arctic Ocean, but extending southward into Spain and Italy and Europe, and as far as North Carolina and California in the New World. The famous frozen specimens of the Siberian tundras, that of the Lena Delta found in 1799 and that of Bereskova in 1901, now mounted in the Petrograd Museum, have been described in Chapter 25. According to Matthew, the contents of the stomach show that these animals fed upon the same vegetation, grasses and sedges, birches, alders, poplars, etc., that prevails today in the far north. They must have been very numerous, as their tusks constitute one half of the commercial ivory annually available and represent thus far a herd of no fewer than 40,000 individuals. Not, of course, those living at any one time, but the accumulation of centuries. That the mammoth was a familiar animal to prehistoric man is attested by the numerous drawings of them made by the artists of the Upper Paleolithic Age on the walls of caverns. The teeth of the mammoth reached a maximum degree of complexity, doubtless an adaptation to the harsh vegetation of the north. Their tusks were of two sorts, one shorter and straighter, the other a long spiral, rivaling the tusks of the Columbian elephant. In size, the mammoth, despite its name, was not great, as it rarely, if ever, exceeded the stature of the Indian elephant of today. Living Elephants there are but two well-defined species of elephants extant, and these are reaching the natural limits of their racial life. They are first the Indian or Asiatic elephant, Elephas indicus or maximus, which inhabits the forest regions of southwest and northeast India, Ceylon, Burma, Assam, Siam, Cochin, China, Sumatra, and Borneo. During the hot season, they are confined to the denser parts of the forest, generally near water, while during the rainy season, they range into the open, feeding on the tender grasses. The African elephant, Loxodonia, Greek for slanting, Africana, is distinguished by its greater size, enormous ears, lower forehead, and larger tusks, also by the character of its grinding teeth. 
It is confined to the wooded districts of Africa south of the Sahara and north of the Cunin and Zambezi rivers. But in many districts, it is becoming extremely scarce owing to the persecution of the ivory hunters, for as ivory is of a finer quality, as well as being more abundant than that of the Indian species. Lucas tells us that in the course of a few years, not a single old individual will be left alive, and unless they are protected by law, they are doomed to a speedy extinction. The African elephant is rarely tamed, although it may be fully as tractable as its relative. A number of subspecies of African elephants have been described, most of which are geographical races, differing mainly in the form and proportion of their ears. End of chapter 34c Part 3, Section 3, Chapter 35a of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 35a Horses. The evolution of the horse has for humanity a very deep interest because of the debt of gratitude which man owes to this humble servitor and comrade, and because of the fact that, largely through the unwearying efforts of Professor Marsh of Yale University, a collection of fossil horses was there assembled which was to prove the first documentary record of the evolution of a race. As such, it still remains absolutely unique. This classic collection was studied by Huxley, who pronounced it conclusive evidence in favor of evolution. Darwin was so impressed with its importance that he would have visited it had his health permitted, but he died without having seen such a culminating proof of the theory of evolution. Equine Adaptations The adaptations undergone by the horse are in their last analysis reducible to two things, the perfection of the mechanism for food-getting and of that for speed, which constitutes the principal means of defense and the influence upon the creature of these two groups of modification is so great that the entire body shows specialization and we cannot as in the elephants or in the human body point to a number of primitive characteristics with a veneer of specialization along certain narrow lines hence we may dismiss the consideration of archaic features in the horse and pass at once to its specializations bodily contour Many of the equine adaptations have been referred to in chapter 19. It is only necessary to summarize them with exclusive reference to the horse. In order to reduce air resistance, the body, neck, and head are smoothly rounded, with no needless excrescences, and with perfect symmetry of form, so that a running horse with head extended and ears laid back conforms to the numerical, or streamlines, almost as perfectly as does a bird, or even a fish. This same symmetry is seen in the limbs, long and slender distally, and with the powerful muscles bunched at shoulder and thigh where they blend more or less with the contours of the body, the force being transmitted to the feet by long slender tendons. This concentration of the weight high on the legs, as we have seen, quickens their rate of movement without diminishing the length of stride. Limbs and Feet the limbs themselves have departed widely from the ancient plantigrade gait of their primal ancestry and are unguligrade in that only the tip of the single toe, encased in its modified nail, is in contact with the ground. The wrist, the so-called foreknee, and the ankle, the hawk, being raised far above the medium of support. Thus the lengthening of the distal limb segments is obtained not only by the actual elongation of the bones themselves, but also by their posture. The reduction of digits is also manifest, the horse being one of the few mammals which ever attained monodactyly, although the equivalent reduction in the artiodactyl or even toed foot to the irreducible minimum of two has been several times acquired. This diminution of digits carries with it a corresponding reduction of the second bone of the lower segment of each limb, that is, the ulna of the forearm and the fibula of the lower leg. In the former case especially, this means a loss of universal motion, for it is only by the combined action of both radius and ulna that the rotary movement of the hand upon the arm is effected. Only the proximal third of the ulna, which forms the greater portion of the elbow joint, is retained. All of the limb joints, with the exception of the hip and shoulder, are of the tongue and groove variety, their motion being thereby limited to the fore and aft plane. 
Within the limits thus imposed, however, the range of movement is very great. The shoulder girdle is reduced, as in all cursorial types, in that the clavicle or collarbone has disappeared, and there is no real articulation left between the shoulder blade and the remainder of the skeleton. This also permits great freedom of motion in the limited plane. Lengthening of limbs implies a coordinate elongation of the neck and skull in contrast with the lack of such modification in the elephant. In general, there is, in a cursorial form, a recognizable speed index, as indicated by the ratio of length to diameter in the limb bones. And not only does this ratio hold for each of the several bones concerned in locomotion, but it may also be seen in the skull, vertebrae, ribs, and other skeletal elements as well. The hoof, which terminates the single remaining digit, is a marvel of perfection, strong, of the right degree of growth to offset a normal wear, and with a shock-absorbing cushion, or frog, to guard the system from the great concussion produced by the impact of the foot with the ground at high speed. The perfection of the foot and limb to withstand such a shock is illustrated by the jumper Heather Bloom a horse which held a record of eight feet two inches, in which the entire weight of the animal, coming from such a height, was repeatedly received on what is equivalent to the middle finger of the two hands. That the limit of such evolution has practically been reached, however, is evident from the fact that many a fine horse has been destroyed merely because a rutted road caused the fracture of a single bone strained beyond endurance. Bone is a wonderfully efficient material, and it is utilized in what is mechanically the very best possible way to produce results, but with a very close margin of safety. It is this last fact that makes further speed adaptation for so large an animal virtually impossible. Skull The skull is characterized by a large and well-developed brain case, orbits completely surrounded by bone, and an elongated face, the purpose of which is twofold first the raising of the eyes as far above the ground as possible, while grazing in order to increase the range of vision, so essential for safety's sake, and second to allow room for the development of the deep-crowned grazing teeth. The elongation of the jaws separates without reduction in their numbers those teeth which are concerned with the prehension of food, the incisors, from those whose function is that of mastication, the premolars and molars. Incidentally, the gap, or diastema, thus produced forms a convenient place for the bit, and thus aids in the subjugation of the creature, but this was hardly nature's purpose in its production. Teeth There is a tendency toward tooth reduction as the anterior premolar, the so-called wolf tooth, which although one of the premolar series is unchanged, is rarely present. Then, too, the tusks or canines are rarely developed in the female, although the normal male always possesses them. Sex characters are so rarely distinguishable among fossil forms that the lower jaw of a Miocene horse, Merychippus, in the Yale collection, in which there is absolutely no trace of canines, was at once hailed by its discoverer as that of a mare. The incisors, or cropping teeth, are long-crowned and are, with the single exception of Macrachenia, a peculiar ungulate of the South American Pleistocene, unique in possessing a pit-like depression in the grinding face. This pit, which is worn away with use, is one of the best criteria of its possessor's age. The three molars and three preceding premolars of each jaw have become deep-crowned, hypsodont grinding teeth, having the form of slightly curved prisms, strengthened by three buttresses on their outer convex face. The teeth are composed of the three materials which characterize the elephant's tooth, dentine, enamel, and cement, elaborately interwoven when seen in cross-section. As these substances differ markedly in hardness, differential wear produces a characteristic pattern of the more resistant enamel upon the wearing surface. For a while the teeth continue to grow, extending deeper and deeper into the jaw, and at the same time moving slowly outward to compensate for wear. Finally, at about five and a half years of age, the dimensional limit of the jaw is practically reached, which of course makes further growth of the tooth impossible. Then the roots are formed, and the tooth is completed. The outward movement, however, still continues, cancellous bony tissue filling the gradually vacated socket, until the tooth is so nearly consumed as to be of no further service, when it is shed. The rate of growth and the outward movement are in absolute accord with the normal rate of wear, and the entire tooth is nicely calculated to last throughout the potential lifetime of the animal, 
about thirty-four years. With its final consumption malnutrition results, which, coupled with other evidences of senility, summons the horse to its final rest. Size Another equine characteristic is size, for aside from the elephants, rhinoceroses, and hippopotamuses, the horse compares favorably with any terrestrial animal, being equaled only by the larger bovines, the cattle, buffalo, and bison. This is, of course, especially true of certain domestic strains, such as the Percheron horses, some of which reach a shoulder height of 19 hands, or 76 inches, and a weight of over 2,400 pounds. On the other hand, the Shetland ponies are reduced in physical dimensions, largely due to the harsh, restricted conditions of their island home, but aided by selective breeding. The following comparative measurements are given by Chubb for two animals, the skeletons of which he is most admirably mounted in the American Museum of Natural History. Giant draft horse, height at shoulders, six feet, one inch, eighteen and one quarter hands. Weight in life, 2,370 pounds. Bulk of humerus, 118 and three quarters cubic inches. Bulk of femur, 188 cubic inches. Shetland pony, height at shoulders, two feet nine and three eighths inches, eight one eighth hands. Weight in life, one hundred seventy pounds. Bulk of humerus, nine and a half cubic inches. Bulk of femur, thirteen and a half cubic inches. Brain and mentality. The brain is not only of considerable size, but is of a relatively high type compared with those of other mammals, and is richly convoluted. The intelligence of the horse is great, but not equal to that of the elephant. As compared with the cattle, on the other hand, the horse is much the more intelligent, and is able to keep out of trouble and care for itself under trying conditions which prove fatal to the former. The docility of the horse and its ability to learn not only from its master, but also from experience, are notable. On the other hand, it is emotional and its psychology is largely linked up with its normal mode of defense, flight for the first impulse of a domestic horse upon seeing any incomprehensible thing is to run away sometimes to its own and its owner's destruction in the wild state this same impulse is of the greatest possible value as a means of survival senses all three of the major senses sight hearing and smell are well developed of the three hearing is perhaps of the least importance to a plains dwelling creature just as sight is to one which is forest bred evolutionary summary briefly stated the evolutionary changes which the anatomy of the horse would lead us to predict are increase in size lengthening of the limbs reduction of ulna and fibula with a consequent limitation of the range of movement change of the foot posture from plantigrade to unguligrade reduction and loss of digits from five to one perfection of the hoof perfection of the dental battery in elongation and complexity of teeth premolars becoming molariform that these changes are all recorded in the paleontological record is conclusive proof of equine evolution end of chapter thirty five a part three section three chapter thirty five b of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull Chapter 35b Horses Paleontology of the Horse Place of Origin We have spoken of the simultaneous appearance of the modernized mammals in the Old and New Worlds, and the consequent belief in their origin in some contiguous landmass, which we have designated as Boreal Holarctica, what is true of the modernized mammals in general is true of the horses in particular, although as yet it is incapable of actual demonstration. The London clay, however, an Eocene formation of Europe, has produced Hyracotherium, the old world's most ancient known equine, while in the Wasatch rocks of western North America, of nearly equivalent age, the earliest American genus, Aohippus, has been found. These two genera are very much alike. But the premolar teeth of Hyracotherium, especially the second one of the upper jaw, are more simple than in Aohippus, 
thus stamping the Old World type as the most primitive horse-like form known. Horses are found from time to time in Europe and Asia, as one ascends the geologic column, but the sequence does not seem to be continuous as it is in North America. Hence the inference, first clearly brought to Huxley through the study of the Yale series, that North America was the real theater of equine evolution, while the Old World horses were merely the relics of genera which migrated thence from time to time as barriers to dispersal were temporarily removed. The earlier of these migrations, while interesting, are unimportant from the standpoint of the evolutionary continuity. Had it not been, however, for the final Pliocene migration of the horses to the great Asiatic continent within whose fastnesses they found asylum, their inexplicable extinction in the New World during the Pleistocene would have closed the book of their progress forever, and we would see them only as our paleontologic vision is able to pierce the gloomy curtain of the geologic past. Eocene. Several generic names have been applied to the Eocene horses, of which Aohippus, the dawn horse, and Orohippus, the mountain horse, are the best-known American forms. The first comes from the lower Eocene, Wasatch, formation, and the latter succeeds it in the middle Eocene, Bridger beds. Both are from Wyoming and New Mexico. The Eocene was a time of warm, moist climate, during which North America was clothed with a luxuriant vegetation, forests in which grew both evergreen and deciduous trees of a distinctly modern character, and, beside the numerous streams and lakes, sedgy meadows which in turn gave rise to grassy plains. Such was the environment of the first known horses, which were already somewhat advanced toward their evolutionary goal. Aohippus was a small but graceful creature, about twelve inches or three hands in height at the withers, with arched back, short head and neck, limbs of moderate length, and showing in the digitigrade character of the feet the beginnings of cursorial adaptation. In fact, the general proportions are much those of a dog, such as the fox terrier or the whippet. The hand bore four complete toes, each terminating in a hoof-like nail, while the foot had but three, although a splint-like remnant of a fourth is present, and, in at least one specimen, the tiny splint-like vestige of the fifth is also seen. The advance of evolutionary progress shown by the foot over the hand is interesting, for it shows the foot to have been the main propelling organ, and therefore the first to feel the influence of cursorial adaptation, and it also shows the reluctant relinquishment of general utility for mere propulsion on the part of the hand. There is as yet no reduction of the ulna, nor of the fibula. The dentition is also advancing, in that the molars already begin to foreshadow their future complication. The originally separate cusps are fusing into cross crusts, and the hinder premolar is becoming molariform. In Orohippus, a further advance is indicated by the loss of the splint of the fifth digit of the foot, the shortening of the outer finger of the hand, the perfection of the molar-like character of the fourth or hindermost premolar, and the beginning of the molariform change in the third. Epihippus, from the upper Eocene Unte formation, goes yet further in that the third and fourth premolars are molariform, and the second begins to be so modified. The digits of the hand are still four, and those of the foot three, but the middle digit of each begins to be the dominant one. There is in the part of the Eocene horses a gradual increase in size, the type skeleton of Orohippus mounted at Yale measuring thirteen and a half inches in height. Epihippus was still larger, but the complete skeleton thereof is as yet unknown. The known range of Eocene horses from Europe to New Mexico speaks for their migratory powers, always a characteristic of the equine hordes. Oligocene The Oligocene was a time of increased aridity, due in large part to continental uplift. And while much of the same conditions prevailed as in the Eocene, there was a consequent dwindling of streams and lakes which gave impetus to the development of broad meadow lands and of true prairie as well thus there were three conditions woodland meadows and dry prairie which seem to have given rise to several parallel lines of equine evolution some of which terminated being overcome in the struggle for existence while others flourished and gave rise to the horses of the miocene but two genera of oligocene horses are recognized mesohippus and myohippus the former one lower and middle oligocene the latter confined to the upper oligocene mesohippus which had attained the size of a prairie wolf had three functional digits in both hand and foot although a rather long splint bone represented the fifth digit in the former 
The middle toe in each instance was much the largest, and the lateral ones, in consequence, bore less of the creature's weight. Mesohippus bardi, the best-known form, averaged about eighteen inches, or four and a half hands, in height, and was a slender-limbed creature, very well adapted for speed. Mesohippus intermedius was larger, fully the size of a sheep, averaging twenty-four inches, or six hands in height, and was in some ways unprogressive, which, together with the conditions under which it is found, may be taken as indicative of a conservative forest-dwelling form, in contrast with the progressive plains-living type. In all Oligocene horses the premolar teeth, with the exception of the small, simple first premolar, are fully molariform. Miocene the Miocene was a time of great continental elevation, and witnessed a wide expansion of our western prairies and a further diminution of the forest-clad areas. As a consequence, many browsing animals, well fitted for survival under former conditions, could not endure the change and perished. But the grazing types, horses, camels, deer, and antelope, adapting themselves to the new conditions, throve, and spread amazingly and became the dominant forms of mammalian life. The Miocene horses were several, representing at least three lines of adaptation, two of which, Merychippus and Hipparion, were to survive, while another, Hypohippus, was doomed to speedy extinction. Hypohippus, known as the forest horse, had broad, low-crowned teeth fitted only for browsing on succulent herbage. The feet were three-toed, which was equally true of all Miocene horses, but were distinctive in their broad-spreading character with well-developed lateral hoofs, as though adapted, like the living caribou, to a soft, yielding ground, rather than hard prairie soil. In the hand vestiges of the first and fifth digits may yet be seen as small nodules of bone at the back of the wrist. Thus, in spite of its having attained the size of a pony, forty inches or so in height, the creature was otherwise persistently primitive, and did not long continue to exist. A huge form, Hypohippus mathui, lately described from Nebraska, greatly exceeded the more typical Hypohippus equinus in size. Merychippus is of especial interest in that it marks the transition from the horse-like forms with short-crowned uncemented teeth, Hyrocotheris, to the true horses whose long-crowned fully cemented grinders are suited to the harsh vegetation of the plains. In Merychippus, the milk teeth are short-crowned and have little or no cement, and are thus reminiscent of its ancestry, while the permanent teeth are intermediate in length of crown, and quite heavily cemented, and are thus prophetic of the future. This is one of the most remarkable instances of the ontogenetic evidence of evolution seen among the horses. Merychippus is three-toed, in some instances with vestiges of the outermost digits of the hand. The lateral toes vary somewhat in the different species, though never reaching the ground, so that while structurally three-toed, the feet are functionally one-toed. The skull of this genus is the first in which the hinder border of the orbit is completed by sending downward a bony bar to join the zygomatic arch. Protohippus and Pliohippus, of the upper Miocene and Pliocene, are two closely related genera. In fact, the distinction between them is not always clear. It may suffice to say that Protohippus represents a form derived from Merychippus, but differing in that the milk, as well as the permanent teeth, are moderately long-crowned and cemented, and in that the hand and foot still bear three toes, while in Pliohippus we have the first one-toed horse. Pliohippus is also characterized by having a peculiar pit or depression in front of the orbit, which may have lodged a scent gland, like the larmier of deer, and doubtless of similar function. Pliohippus had a shoulder height of some forty inches or ten hands. Yet another Miocene horse was Hipparion, closely related to the two preceding genera, from the former of which it is sometimes difficult to distinguish it. The following diagnostic characteristics are based upon a skeleton of Hipparion Whitney from South Dakota, preserved in the American Museum. This species, except for the very large head, had the graceful and slender proportions of the antelopes, but in protohippus and especially pliohippus the skeleton approached more nearly the stockier proportions of the modern horses the hyperion whitney is regarded by professor osborne as fitted to live in a semi-desert country and in contrast to the hypohippus is called the three-toed desert horse the argument for this belief is seen in the highly perfected teeth the pattern of whose enamel is in some instances more complexly enfolded than in any other horse 
doubtless an adaptation to the harshest of herbage. The splendid fleetness which the skeleton implies is corroborative evidence. Hipparion is another world migrant, as its remains are found not only in Colorado, Nebraska, and South Dakota in great abundance, but even in far-off Greece, where in lower Pliocene rocks of Perkimi near Athens they are entombed. Hipparion Whitney reached a height of forty inches or ten hands, while Hipparion gracilis of Perkimi stood forty-four inches at the shoulder. Pliocene Pliocene time was one of great unrest. Conditions were becoming more and more severe, prophetic of the glacial period, new land bridges arose where none had existed for ages, and we find great consequent faunal interchanges recorded. It is not remarkable, therefore, that Hipparion reached the Old World just as the true elephants made their first appearance in the New. Another notable Pliocene event was the appearance for the first time in geological history of true horses in South America, whither they went in company with the Debelodont Mastodons. The South American Pliocene horse was Hippidion, evidently a derivative of Protohippus, but differing in having short, stout rather than slender, one-toed feet. The teeth are like those of Pliohippus, but the skull differs remarkably in the extremely long, slender nasal bones, which, together with the great size of the head, must have given the creature a very peculiar cast of countenance. Hippidion, which had attained a stature of twelve and a quarter hands, lingered into the Pleistocene where it became Onohippidion, a creature but recently extinct, if one may judge from the fresh-looking horny hoofs preserved in certain Patagonian caves. The modern horse first appears in the upper Pliocene beds of Eurasia and North America, and represents the culmination of the race. The feet are one-toed, but with well-developed splints of the second and fourth digits still remaining. In some individuals these are fused with the cannon bone, in others they are free. The teeth are long columnar structures of intricate enamel pattern, admirably adapted to their owner's needs, and the animal has attained the maximum stature consistent with fleetness. End of chapter 35b Part 3, Section 3, Chapter 35c of Organic Evolution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull Chapter 35C Horses Pleistocene A number of extinct species of equus are recorded, principally from the Pleistocene of both North and South America and the Old World. Of these, the best known is Scott's horse, Equus Scotti, from the staked plains Llano Estacado of Texas. This species, of which a number of perfect specimens have been found, was discovered at Rock Creek, Texas, in 1899, by an expedition from the American Museum of Natural History. Thirteen years later, a party from Yale reopened the quarry and secured several more specimens, one of which is now mounted in the Yale Museum. It is of an animal about fifteen hands in height, having somewhat the proportions of a western bronco, but with a very large head, and with teeth greater than those of a modern dray horse, although very similar in pattern. Horses of this or related species, some smaller, others larger, are extraordinarily abundant wherever the earlier Pleistocene deposits are found in North America, and they evidently survived the first glacial advance, but shortly afterward, why we cannot tell, they became extinct not only in North, but in South America as well. This apparently was also true of Europe, but in Asia and Africa the race found sanctuary. Otherwise the horse would be included with the mastodons, ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, and a host of other splendid creatures among the totally extinct. Glacial conditions alone seem inadequate to account for this great tragedy, for not only did the hand of death bear heavily upon the equine herds within the limits of the ice belt, but far beyond, to the uttermost confines of the western hemisphere. That no permanent change of environment occurred to render the earth unsuitable for these creatures is evident from the amazing way in which the few imported horses liberated by the Spanish conquistadors multiplied and spread, giving rise to the great herds of wild mustangs in both North and South America. 
we look naturally therefore for some other cause of extinction and the one of all theories that seems most plausible is the bringing in by migrating animals of insect transmitted disease such as the sleeping sickness of africa or the sura disease which attacks domestic horses in india a further discussion of this problem has been given in chapter seventeen on parasitism and degeneracy so far as we know now such an extinction cause is incapable of proof unless it shall be found that these diseases produce a recorded change upon the bones themselves for of course the soft anatomy of fossil horses is utterly beyond our reach for direct study living horses several species of horse-like animals are yet alive in their wild condition in asia and africa all of those of europe and the americas being either domesticated or feral that is of domestic ancestry of the true horses but one wild type remains the mongolian or prevalsky horse the tarpan of the gobi desert of central asia and the neighboring regions it is a small animal standing but twelve hands of a yellow dun or buckskin color with black mane tail and legs and a white muzzle there is no forelock the mane is short and upright and there is a decided beard beneath the relatively large head at least three other primitive types of true horses are living under the fostering care of mankind and these or an admixture of them constitute our various domestic breeds of them the first is the celtic pony pale buff mouse gray or even brown with a large forelock and tuft beneath the jaw a light colored mane and tail but with a certain admixture of black hairs there is long bushy hair at the base of the tail this horse is also characterized by a short face broad forehead slender legs and small hoofs and is found from iceland to western norway the second form is the norse yellow dun or forest pony related evidently to the mongolian horse but larger stockier and with fuller mane and tail in some cases there is a dark stripe down the back and traces of barring on the legs the face is longer and the hoofs relatively larger than in the celtic horse the norse pony is the main ancestral stock for the ordinary domestic horses of northwestern europe the changes may be due to domestication or to the infusion of arab blood the last great type is the southern horse or barb the arab or thoroughbred equus africanus the color of this creature is bay sometimes gray with black points and often with a white star on the forehead and one or more white legs it has a small head and slender graceful limbs and possesses great docility and spirit nearest the true horse comes the kiang equus harmonious of central mongolia and turkestan this creature is not an ass although ass-like in many ways it stands twelve and a half hands the ears are horse-like and the hoofs broad especially in front the tail tuft is large and there is the rudiment of a forelock in winter the color is grayish in summer chestnut with no striping the zebras are exclusively african and are of course characterized by a very conspicuous striping when seen out of their natural surroundings they are nevertheless generally reported to be protectively colored when in their appropriate habitat although this is a subject upon which colonel roosevelt has much to say as he believes that the theory of protective coloration has been considerably overdrawn there are two well-defined species of zebra living while a third the quagga is so recently extinct that mounted skins may yet be seen in certain museums the plains or burchell zebra is somewhat variable in the coloring but always lacks the cross-striped rump the so-called gridiron of the true or mountain zebra the former is still numerous in fact it is said to be the second big game animal of the world in point of numbers the mountain zebra on the other hand is becoming so rare that it is protected by law it is more nearly related to the ass and has longer ears narrower hoofs and a scantier tail tuft than the birchal species the ass equus asinus is domesticated the world over in fact its subjugation by mankind long antedates that of the horse asses are still wild in the tropics of africa and are gray at all seasons with a dark back stripe when wild the size is medium to large ranging from eleven to twelve and a quarter hands at the shoulder the hoofs are small and narrow and the fore pair are no larger than the hinder ones 
There are two varieties, the Nubian ass, which has a transverse shoulder stripe, and that of Somali, which lacks the shoulder stripe but has barring on the legs. The domestic variety is typical of the Nubian form. Horses and Man Mankind owes a profound debt of gratitude to the horse, first in savage days as an easily obtainable food, later as a partner in his labors without whose aid human progress toward a higher civilization would have been retarded immeasurably. It has been thought by some that the condition of semi-barbarism of the North American Indians, really a race of great potentiality, was in part due to the premature extinction of the American horses. There is no record of the association of man and the extinct horses of America, but during prehistoric times in Europe, before the extinction of the mammoth, we find records of the association of the horse and man in the form of mural decorations on the walls of caverns. It is interesting to note that at least three types of horses are shown by the Paleolithic artists, one a small-headed form resembling in this regard the Arab of today, another large-headed, with the erect mane and beard typical of the living Prowalski horse, and a third, which in contour closely resembles the Norse or forest pony. The presence of bridle-like markings on the head of one horse has been taken as an indication of domestication on the part of the prehistoric peoples. One finds, however, no trace of a drawing of a man on horseback, or other use of the animal as a beast of burden, and the idea has been advanced that possibly because of its extreme docility it may have been occasionally easier to lead home a captured horse to the slaughter than to carry home the meat. One of the most remarkable prehistoric encampments, not in caves but in the open air, is at Solutre in saône et loire France. Here there was a fine southern exposure sheltered on the north by a steep ridge. Encircling the south side was a kind of protective wall formed almost entirely of the bones of horses to the estimated number of 80,000 individuals. Such a wholesale slaughter, of course, extended over a long period of time, but might readily have been an important factor in local extermination when aided by the weakening effects of disease. End of chapter 35C Chapter 36 of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jairus Amar. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter 36 Camels The camels are another group of animals whose phylogeny has been very clearly demonstrated by the fossil evidence, the perfection of the record being second only to that of the horses. Add to this the fact that they are throughout almost their entire evolutionary career exclusively North American forms and their title to a high place in our interest is complete. Place in Nature As the horses were representatives of the perisodactyla or odd-toed ungulates, so the camels belong to the other great group of hoofed forms, the even-toed artiodactyla. The latter, while largely eliminated from the Western world, are still comparatively numerous in Africa and Eurasia, where at least 250 distinct species are known, as against 34 for the Americas. That the artiodactyla were formerly much more abundant, especially in North America, is forcibly brought home to every collector of fossil vertebrates in the West. The principal points of agreement of all artiodactyls are the axis of the foot lies between digits 3 and 4, rather than within digit 3, as in the perisodactyls. Hence the two digits, one on either side of the axis, are symmetrical and the number 2 is the irreducible minimum. While there are normally an even number of digits, the peccaries, tayasu, have three remaining in the foot, 
and a five-toed ancestral artiodactyl is conceivable, for the oreodonts retained a well-defined vestige of the first digit of the hand. Another artiodactyl characteristic lies in the astralagus, the ankle bone which articulates with the tibia or shin. In common with that of the parasodactyls, the upper or tibial facet is pulley-shaped, but in the latter the distal facet is flat, thus permitting no movement between it and the succeeding tarsal bones. In the artiodactyls, on the contrary, the distal facet is curved in such a way that a double tarsal joint is formed. This type of astralagus, a very resistant bone, is an extremely common fossil and is absolutely diagnostic of the group. The molar teeth are invariably one of two sorts or a combination thereof. The crown is either covered with conical cusps, bunodont, as in the swine, or the cusps are crescentic, selenodont, the latter sort being typical of the cud-chewing forms of ruminants. Certain ancient types, anthracothors, had bunosolenodont teeth of a transitional character. The teeth may be short-crowned or, in the case of grazing ruminants, deep-crowned as an adaptation to abrasive food. They never, however, reach the degree of perfection seen in the true horses. Artiodactyls are apt to possess weapons, either tusks, which are modified canine teeth, or horns or antlers of various sorts and degrees of development, or rarely both. Osborne's classification of the artiodactyls is as follows. 1. Section Primitive Artiodactyls Families of more or less uncertain affinities. 2. Section Suina or pig-like artiodactyls, pigs, peccaries, elethyrs, hippopotami. 3. Section Oreodonta, American primitive ruminants or oreodonts, cud-chewing swine. 4. Section Tylopala, camels and llamas. 5. Section Tragulina, Primitive and ancestral deer-like ruminants. 6. Section Pecora. True or modernized ruminants, including the giraffes, deers, pronghorn antelope, old-world antelopes, sheep, goats, chamois, bovines, etc. Thus it will be seen that the camels occupy an intermediate place within the order. They are, however, an isolated group, as their connection with the other section is not yet clear. Tylopod Characteristics The tylopod characteristics are as follows. The limbs are long and two-toed. The metapodials, which are fused to form a cannon bone, diverge distally and have lost to a large extent the keels which serve to limit the lateral movement of the digits. Hence, the digit a grade foot is yielding as an adaptation to desert sands. The feet are, moreover, provided with one or two cushion-like pads, hence the name tylopoda. The stomach is three-chambered. There is an ancient type of placenta and the red blood corpuscles are oval instead of circular in outline, which makes the group absolutely unique among living mammals. Living genera Camellus There are but two living genera, each of which include a like number of species. Four altogether extant. One, Camellus, being confined to the old world, while the other, Alkenia or Lama, is characteristic of the new. The two species of camel are Camelus dromedarius, 
the one-humped Arabian camel or dromedary, and Camelus bactranius, the two-humped Bactrian camel of Central Asia. The two species will interbreed, and the consequent hybrid or mule camel possesses the one hump of the dromedary and the brown, shaggy coat of the Bactrian parent. Whether reversing the cross, see page 131, what produced the same result is not recorded, but upon a priori grounds one would not think so. The progeny of a male Bactrian and female Arabian camel is preferred to either of the pure breeds. The camel has rightly earned its name of Ship of the Desert, for practically all of its peculiarities are but an adaptive response to the harsh conditions of that inhospitable environment. Many of these adaptations have been mentioned in Chapter 14, but they must be reviewed and brought together in order that the evolution of their owner's ancient lineage may be the more appreciated. As in the horse, two directions of adaptation stand out sharply, that of speed, ever a desert requisite, and of teeth, for the harsh and scanty herbage. The other characteristics the horse does not possess, for they are the direct outcome of desert life. Speed Cursorial characteristics are well shown in the length of limb, reduction of digits, of ulna and fibula, and in the limitation of the range of movement of the limb joints. The feet, however, have retrogressed in that they are no longer unguligrade, but digitigrade. For almost the entire length of the phalanges, except for the intervening pad, lies flat upon the ground. The hoofs are reduced to nail-like structures, and the whole yielding foot, with its absolutely silent tread, is admirably designed to support the animal on the shifting desert sands. The foot retrogression somewhat diminishes the extreme length of the limb. But this is, to a certain extent, compensated for by the fact that the thigh is freer from the body than in other ungulates and thus, the length of stride is increased. Teeth The teeth of the camel have suffered a reduction in numbers, in that the dental formula is I, 1, 1, over 3, 3, C, 1, 1, over 1, 1, P, 3, 3, over two two m three three over three three equals sixteen over eighteen equals thirty four instead of the normal forty four there is therefore but one upper incisor left on either side and it is more canine than incisor like the lower incisors on the other hand are all present, more or less spatulate and procumbent, and the canine is somewhat similar and functions as an incisor. Behind the canine comes a short diastema, and then a recurved, tusk-like premolar, which has assumed the discarded form and function of the canine. This is followed by a longer toothless area, and the four cheek teeth, the fourth premolar and the three molars, form an efficient compact grinding mechanism of long crowned, but, as compared with the horse, relatively simple teeth. Hump The hump, which forms so very characteristic a camel feature, consists of a conical mass of gelatinous fat when the animal is well fed is nourishment stored against the time of scarcity, and can be drawn upon during the passage of the desert. Whether or no any of the extinct camels possessed such an organ, we cannot tell, as it is entirely superficial 
and leaves no impression upon the skeleton. The hump becomes flaccid and falls over on one side in an exhausted camel. Water Reservoirs Another desert characteristic is the development of water reservoirs in the walls of the stomach, properly the paunch or rumen. They are small, flask-shaped cavities, each with a constricting muscle at its mouth, so that when the stomach is filled with water, the muscles relax automatically, allowing the water to enter the cavities, while that which remains is absorbed into the system. In time of water scarcity, the stored liquid is allowed to trickle out into the stomach and is thence available for the impoverished blood. Senses The proud carriage of the head, which is held horizontally, some nine feet from the ground, protects the eyes from the reflected heat and the eyes and nostrils from the sand. The sense organs are still further protected, the eyes by long lashes, the ears by hair, and the nostrils by being closable like eyelids. The creature is keen of sight, but what is still more necessary, the sense of smell is very well developed, so that water may be detected a long way off. Mentality Mentally, the wild camels are sagacious, as the brain is large and well convoluted. But the domesticated ones are so stupid that their bad traits are notorious. Thus Palgrave observes, in Flower and Lydecker, If docile means stupid, well and good. In such a case, the camel is the very model of docility. But if the epithet is intended to designate an animal that takes an interest in its rider so far as a beast can, that in some way understands his intentions or shares them in a subordinate fashion, that obeys from a sort of submissive or half-fellow feeling with its master, like the horse or elephant, then I say that the camel is by no means docile, very much the contrary. He takes no heed of his rider, pays no attention whether he be on his back or not, walks straight on when once set a-going, merely because he is too stupid to turn aside, and then should some tempting thorn or green branch allure him out of the path, continues to walk on in the new direction, simply because he is too dull to turn back into the right road. In a word, he is from first to last, an undomesticated and savage animal, rendered serviceable by stupidity alone, without much skill on his master's part, or any cooperation on his own, save that of an extreme passiveness. Neither attachment nor even habit impress him. Never tame, though not wide awake enough to be exactly wild. As beasts of burden, however, camels are entitled to respect, as one can carry five hundred to eight hundred pounds, and their endurance is phenomenal. The Arabian breed known as the hairy camel, traveling from one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and fifty miles a day for eight to ten days at a time. The distance from Tunis to Japoli is six hundred miles, yet a single camel has carried over that route a burden of rider and gear, weighing not less than 250 pounds in four days, an average of 150 miles a day. Uses Alive, camels are used as beasts of burden for their milk and for the shed hair which is spun and subsequently woven. Dead, the flesh is used as food, the hides for leather, the hair for fabrics, and even the bones are utilized. Their importance to mankind, especially to the nomads of the East and to traders between great cities, 
can hardly be estimated. Even in the twentieth century, the desert of the globe and the arid plains of Egypt, Arabia, and Persia would be rendered impassable by their extinction without most expensively constructed and maintained railroads. Engineering and transportation science may in the future supplant the camel to the extent that they have the horse, but they have not yet done so. There are wild camels in remote Turkestan, the desert of Labnor, and in Spain, but some are certainly feral, that is, of domestic ancestry, and all are probably so, as there are ruins of ancient cities in the Asiatic portion of the range, of which the very traditions have vanished, and to whose departed citizens the ancestors of these camels may well have belonged. It is highly probable that they have not existed wild for thousands of years. The area of servitude includes Arabia, Persia, India, all of the country of North Tartary, to the confines of China, and the coast of the Persian Gulf, and the Canary Islands and Africa, north of the Sahara. There were none in Africa, however, until the third century of our era. Attempts to naturalize them in Australia and North America have been made but the lack of success in America has not been due to the climate or other physical conditions of their ancestral home, but rather to their unfavorable reception by the Americans, who greatly preferred the highly serviceable, cheaper, and more tractable burro. End of chapter 36a Chapter 36 B of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. The Evidences of Evolution, Section 3 Paleontology, Chapter 36 B camels orchenia characteristics the south american genus orchenia llama includes two wild species the guanaco a guanacus and the vicuña a vicuña and their domestic derivatives the llama and alpaca these creatures are of much smaller stature than the camel and lack the characteristic hump of the latter the feet are narrow and the toes more distinctly divided, with two pads beneath, instead of but one. The hair is woolly as a protection from the cold of their mountain home, for instead of being adapted to sandy desert conditions, although their structure shows a desert ancestry, they are upland animals, which may well account for their attainment of South America along the Isthmian land bridge, to the exclusion of the true camels range the orkinia range is along the west side of south america from the equator to cape horn domesticated they have their uses after the manner of their asiatic cousins as beasts of burden and for the flesh hides and wool they have the distinction of being america's only contribution to the list of mammals domesticated by mankind but although their local importance may be great they have by no means contributed to human progress and well-being to the extent that the camels have evolutionary changes these are in a way comparable to the changes undergone by the horses with the exception of the secondary retrogression of the feet to summarize briefly the changes are as follows increase in stature from the size of a western jackrabbit to one much greater than the huge bactrian camel of today loss of lateral digits of which not the least vestige remains elongation and fusion of metapodials to form the very characteristic distally spread cannon bone secondary loss of distal keels broadening of phalanges and the concurrent development of foot pads reduction of the number of teeth 
elongation of teeth in the grazing phylum Phylogeny North America is as we have seen the evolutionary home of the camel family and as Matthew 1915 says its ancestral stages can be very fully and exactly traced in the western formations as far back as the upper Eocene Below which they are merged with the ancestry of other groups They are unknown in any other continent until the Pliocene When they invaded South America and Asia and Africa Surviving in those continents today although extinct in North America since the middle Pleistocene Why the ancestral camels failed to migrate to the old world before the Pliocene when the horses repeatedly made the journey is somewhat obscure unless as Matthew 1915 again suggests their center of radiation was further south for as he says the center of dispersal would appear to have been in this continent how far to the north we have no means of estimating but the exceptional directness of the phylogenetic series as represented by our western fossils indicates in my opinion that these fossils lived in or close to the racial dispersal center eocene camels are unknown until upper eocene time when the first undoubted ancestor of the line appears in protilopus this small creature was no larger than a jackrabbit and had 44 teeth those in each jaw forming a continuous series the canine being only slightly enlarged all of the molars were low crowned the skull with its narrow face already suggests that of the existing forms but the bony orbit was incomplete behind the forelimbs were considerably shorter than the hind so that the back sloped upward toward the rump the ulna was entirely separate from the radius and the fibula was complete the hand had four functional digits but the lateral toes of the foot were greatly attenuated although still complete protilopus is from the uinta stage and is thus contemporaneous with the horse epihippus to which it is comparable in degree of evolution oligocene during the oligocene camel-like animals increased very greatly in numbers so that they must have been a very characteristic element in the fauna of that time this is especially true of poebratherium the remains of which are abundant in the big badlands of South Dakota whence they range across Nebraska into Colorado and west to the John Day Valley of Oregon as Protilopus parallels Epihippus so Proibrotherium resembles a contemporary Mesohippus in the degree of its evolution Proibrotherium like Mesohippus attained the stature of a sheep but the former was more lightly constructed than the sheep with relatively longer limbs and neck and with a small tapering skull the teeth are still 44 as in protilopus and the incisors and canines are more typical of mammals in general not the procumbent spatulate structures of later cameloids the grinding teeth of the upper jaw are short crowned while the lower molars have begun to elongate the jaws are very slender the limbs show a marked digital reduction both in the hand and foot in that small nodules only are present as the last vestiges of the lateral toes keels are still present limiting the lateral movement of the toes the ulna has coalesced with the radius and only the two ends of the fibula remain the hoofs are deer-like the upper oligocene gompotherium differs from poebrotherium mainly in the complete encircling of the orbit by bone miocene during the oligocene there began an initial divergence into at least three phyla which became well-defined groups during the miocene paralleling once more the equine evolution of these the grazing camels which were the main line leading to the modern representatives of the race include the lower miocene Protomerix and the upper Miocene Procamelus The former Protomerix still possessed the full quota of teeth But the grinders show a decided deepening tendency as an adaptation to the abrasive grasses The feet had two digits and possessed pointed hoofs like those of the deer 
in procamelus we find the first tooth reduction in that the first and second upper incisors are lost in the adult stage the feet have advanced for the metapodials are beginning to fuse to form the cannon bone this is especially true of the hind limb the first desert adaptation is shown in the diminution of the distal keels in the foot bones of this genus in size procamelus must have exceeded the dimensions of the modern llama a very notable fossil locality in western nebraska of lower miocene age has yielded a large number some 40 or more of a slender camel-like form known as stenomylus the gazelle camel delicate in its proportions and much smaller than any of its contemporaries its oligocene ancestry has not yet been traced nor do we know aught of its subsequent history and the inference is that it soon became extinct it has an apparent anomaly in its dentition as there are ten incisor like teeth in the lower jaw six true incisors and in addition the canines and first premolars which have assumed a similar form and function the low crowned molars imply a browsing habit the head is small the neck long and delicately built and the limbs and feet extremely slender with very thin walled bones there are but two toes on each foot and the metapodials are not fused apparently fleetness was stenomylus's only defense which may have accounted for its brief racial career the known specimens of which a group of three individuals is mounted at yale are almost without exception from a single quarry where they occur in profusion some dismembered others in completely articulated condition as though the carcasses had drifted downstream in time of flood to be caught in the backwater of some large cove and buried by sediment this is in accord with the belief of the discoverer professor loomis based upon anatomical grounds that stenomylus was an upland form the only associated remains other than those of the camel found in the quarry pertain to a large wolf-like creature known as amphician diphenodum superbus probably one of the forms which preyed upon camels the name giraffe camels does not imply relationship with the giraffes which so far as known without exception have been confined exclusively to the old world but is applied to creatures which from community of habit converged very strongly toward the existing giraffe in size and proportions two miocene genera have been discovered which pertain to this family and in the aberrant oligocene paratelopus we recognize the first recorded ancestor of the group in the lower miocene the representative is oxydactylus remains of which have been collected in eastern wyoming and western nebraska this form is much smaller than its successor alticamelus and has a shorter neck and limbs the metapodials do not fuse to form a cannon bone and the hoofs are sharp pointed and deer-like with little indication of the sand adapted feet of the later camels the teeth of oxydactylus are rather short crowned as though fitted for browsing rather than for grazing and they are yet forty-four in number alticamelus of the middle and upper miocene although clearly derivable from oxydactylus is much further advanced in more than one way for we find that the feet show the same desert adaptation that its contemporaries of the grazing phylum do cannon bone loss of keels depressed phalanges and indications of pads a remarkable instance of parallelism the like response of unrelated phyla to a similar climatic change alticamelus was a very large animal although the head was small and the short crowned browsing teeth of its predecessor are still retained the neck and limbs are very long as in the giraffe and were probably as with the latter an adaptation to permit the animal to browse upon the otherwise inaccessible foliage of high and thorny shrubs such as the african mimosa which forms the staple of giraffine diet but while the result of this remarkable convergence was to produce the same effectiveness for such a method of feeding the way in which it was brought about was not the same matthew nineteen o one 
says that the giraffe is derived from the early antelopes and alticamelus from early camels and the difference in origin has caused the attainment of the desired result in a somewhat different manner Quote, in the antelopes the fore quarters are usually higher than the hind quarters and especially so in the group most nearly allied to the giraffe ocapia the femur and tibia are comparatively short the metapodia is comparatively long the greater height of the forequarters causes the anterior part of the back to slope upwards towards the neck and thus increases its height the elongation of the anterior dorsals will increase the stature of the animals as well as will the elongation of the cervicals accordingly we find that in the giraffe the forequarters are much higher the elongation of the limbs is greatest in the metapodials which are much longer than either femur or tibia and the elongation of the cervicals is continued into the dorsal region in the camels on the other hand the fore quarters are not any higher than the hind quarters the anterior cervicals are long while the posterior ones are quite short and the tibia is unusually long while the metapodials are comparatively short correspondingly we find in alticamelus that the anterior cervicals are enormously elongated the posterior ones are but little increased in length while the anterior dorsals are both short and small the elongation of the last cervicals and anterior dorsals would have only increased the length of the body without altering the stature because the forelegs are not longer than the hind legs and consequently the backbone does not slope upward towards the neck also the great elongation in the limbs of alticamelus has been in the femur and tibia while the metatarsus is shorter the giraffe camel was not so bulky an animal as the giraffe and scarcely equaled a moderate sized northern giraffe in height End quote. the skull is similar to that of procamelus the specimen of alticamelus altus which matthew describes is from the loop fork formation of northeastern colorado the complete skeleton is as yet unknown pliocene and pleistocene Pliaukenia, the principal genus of Pliocene camels, belongs to the main grazing phylum and is the direct descendant of Procamelus, from which it hardly differs at all. Progress is seen, however, in tooth reduction, in that the second lower premolar has been lost. This and the Pleistocene camels, Camelops and Eschatius, are not very well known owing largely to the fragmentary character of the material thus far collected the pleistocene camels however are very numerous and future discoveries are sure to bring better specimens to light not all of the pleistocene forms are true camels in the sense of being like those of the old world but are cameloid creatures possibly more llama-like in appearance some of them attained an enormous size as certain bones preserved at Yale are half again as large as equivalent elements from a Bactrian camel Typical camels of the genus camelus differ from procamelus in the further loss of one premolar in the upper and two in the lower jaw and this genus is apparently the first to brave the cold of the northern route and pass to the old world presumably by way of the bering isthmus for we have the first recorded remains of it in the famous sewalic formation lower pliocene of india the two indian species of camelus c sivalensis and c antiquus show a peculiar tooth character found in the new world llamas but lost in the living camels indicating that in some respects the new world types are the more primitive Fragmentary camelus fossils have been found in the Pleistocene of southern Russia and Rumania and in Algeria not far removed from the living habitat of the race The extinction of the North American camels is as inexplicable as that of the horses and may well have been due to the same unknown complex of causes End of chapter 36 B
Chapter thirty seven of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tech Savvy. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Chapter thirty seven The Evolution of Man. Ontogeny and Morphology. Part one Man's Place in Nature we have come to the culmination of our course and the approach the highest state of man the loftiest pinnacle of the evolutionary fabric but one to which all the laws governing the survival of the other creatures have nevertheless applied in our research we cannot consider man that is physical man as a being part from his fellows of the animal kingdom but whatever our prejudices we must look at the facts in the face and consider him merely as one perhaps a very special one among the great hosts of animal life as in the case of the other creatures whose evolutionary history we have endeavoured to understand so with the man we must inquire into his place in nature learning what his nearest relatives are and whence and why he came man a vertebrae a brief diagnosis of a vertebrae mentions a number of characteristics such as the notochord hollow dorsally situated nerve cord perforated pharynx and the like all of which without exception are possessed by man the individual during some period of his career just as surely as by the horse the dinosaur the amphibian or the fish the evidence of man's vertebrae inclusion is therefore unquestionable man as a primate of the several classes into which the vertebrates are divided man shares with the horse the elephant and even the saber-tooth the several characteristics hair warm blood midriff or diaphragm separating the chest and abdominal cavities young born alive and nourished by mammary glands which make them mammals he cannot therefore be debarred from that group any more than the others within the class mammalia he is excluded from the egg-laying monotremes and the pouch-bearing marsupials and included with those whose unborn young are nourished by the placenta he is therefore a placental mammal and of the four cohorts of placentalia he is by the process of elimination narrowed down to the nailed arboreal forms or primates for he can be neither a clawed unguiculate nor a hoofed unguiculate nor a finned cetacean primates this name was given to the group by linnaeus who wished thereby to emphasize the headship of the animal kingdom the first in the sense of the highest the word has however a deeper significance than this for the primates are also among the first of the placental mammals in their antiquity and primitiveness along the chosen line of specialization the feet the horses and camels are it is true vastly further advanced than are the primates and the same thing can be said of the tooth modification in elephant and smilodon it is only in the brain and such correlated modifications as mental development entails that the primates may justly lay claim to superiority for in other respects they are as humble and generalized a group with very few exceptions as the mammalian class contains definition primates may be defined as nearly all arboreal with prehensile limbs having a more or less opposable pollex thumb and a hallux which is great toe the five digits usually terminate in flattened nails rarely claws there is a clavicle the orbit is completely surrounded by bone the stomach simple and the mammary glands are nearly always thoracic classification the classification of the primates has of course been subjected to the same vicissitudes as those of the other orders especially when fossil forms are found which link together apparently isolated living groups an admirable study of primate interrelationships is that of w k gregory nineteen sixteen from whom the following classification somewhat abridged is taken order primates suborder lemuridae lemurs or half apes suborder anthropoidea series platerini or the new world apes family hapalidae or mammosets 
family sabide or capuchins howler monkeys spider monkeys etc series caterini or the old world apes and monkeys family circopathicide or monkeys baboons macaques etc family siminide or man-like anthropoid apes family hominide or men limeroidea the lemurs are the most ancient of living primates and as such having departed least from the ordinary quadruped they are however exclusively arboreal mostly nocturnal and of comparatively low organization which is manifest not only in the body but also in the brain as the cerebral hemispheres are not very highly developed nor do they completely cover the hind brain as in the higher primates the second digits of the foot bears a claw the rest terminate in nails the present home of the lemurs is above all madagascar of which they are highly typical that they constitute perhaps one half of the local mammalian fauna lemurs are also distributed through the tropical forests of africa and the oriental realm they are found fossil in the eocene rocks of north america and of europe two interesting relic animals belonging to this group still survive chiromes the i i now living in madagascar but having near allies among the long departed fossil forms of north america and tarsius the tarsier now confined to sumatra borneo celebs java and the philippines but which also had relatives in the american eocene anthropoidea the anthropoids are the most highly organized of primates with thirty two to thirty six teeth a completely closed orbit two pectoral mammal feet usually prehensile and generally the hands also pollex sometimes vestigial and cerebral hemispheres richly convoluted covering the cerebellum this suborder includes all primates other than the lemurs and this of course means man as well as the monkeys and apes it is divided into two sharply marked series the old and new world primates and these so far as our evidence goes represent parallel evolutions which because of the long period of south american isolation must have diverged from a common ancestry in early eocene time the platyrine may be distinguished by the broad nasal septum hence the name broad and nose the thumb is not opposable and sometimes reduced the tail may be prehensile there are no check pouches nor ischial callosi the family hapilade the marmosets or squirrel monkeys are small monkeys with a long hairy non prehensile tail the pollex is elongated but the hallux very small the latter bears a flat nail while all of the other digits are armed with curved and pointed claws these creatures are no larger than squirrels and are active forms living among trees in small groups their food consists of fruit to which eggs and insects are added a very common dietary the sabidi the common south american monkeys differ from the marmosets in the possession of an additional molar tooth in each jaw making thirty-six teeth all told and having flat nails instead of claws and frequently a prehensile tail these forms none of which is as large as the larger old world monkeys are exclusively confined to the tropical forests notably those of brazil among the more remarkable are the slender spider monkeys whose prehensile tail is an organ of the greatest use the howler monkeys mycetes whose prodigious voice arises from an especially modified vocal apparatus and the capuchins whose pathetic figures garbed with human habiliments are so often seen with itinerant musicians the group caturini includes all of the old world apes and man 
excluding of course the lemurs they are characterized by possession of a narrow nasal septum with the approximated nostrils directed downward thirty-two teeth as in man and a non prehensile tail which may however be vestigial or entirely absent the hallux except in man is fully opposable and the pollux as well although often less developed end of chapter thirty seven recording by texavi www.texavi.wordpress.com Chapter 37, Part B of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Metzler. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lowell. Part 3 The Evidences of Evolution. Section 3 Paleontology. The Evolution of Man ontogeny and morphology man's place in nature the cercopithecidae are the monkeys and baboons exclusive of the man-like apes from which they differ in the fore and aft elongation of the molar teeth the presence of ischial callosities on the rump occasional cheek pouches a narrow breast bone and in the absence of the vermiform appendix the baboons cynocephalus are practically the only primates with the exception of man which have forsaken the arboreal for a terrestrial mode of life but unlike man this has not resulted in an erect posture but a typically quadrupedal one their head is more dog than ape-like hence the generic name greek kuon dog and kephale head with powerful jaws bearing immense canine teeth which added to the equally powerful hands enable competition with the terrestrial creatures to be readily met. The old male mandrels are remarkable for their ferocity. These creatures are colored most gorgeously on the cheeks and ischial callosities, but colors which in themselves are beautiful, blue, scarlet, lilac, are in combinations which seem grievously misplaced. Thus while the fur is often beautiful and the colors lovely, the general effect is such that, as Cuvier says, il serait difficile de se figurer un être plus hideux que le mandril. The mandrils, which are typical baboons, like the rest of their race, appear to be rather indiscriminate eaters, feeding upon fruit, roots, reptiles, insects, scorpions, etc., and inhabit open rocky ground rather than forests, flower and lydicker. Their present range includes Africa and Arabia. The macaques are rather stoutly built monkeys, the tail being variously developed. They are both arboreal and terrestrial in habit, but their principal interest lies in the fact that, whereas almost all are Asiatic, extending as far as Japan, one species, the so-called Barbary ape, Macacus inuus, is North African, and is the only living primate other than man which is found within the confines of Europe, as it has spread from northern Africa to Gibraltar. Semnopithecus is another characteristic genus, containing very long-tailed, slender forms, short-muzzled, without cheek pouches, and typical of a subfamily, the Semnopithecinae. This group is both African and Oriental in its distribution. The manlike or anthropoid apes, family Semiidae, lay greatest claim to our interest, since they of all creatures come nearest to mankind, not only in similarity of structure, but in actual relationship, for they are our next of kin in that they and humanity spring without question from the same bough of the tree of life, and though the relationship is very remote according to human standards of consanguinity, from the evolutionary point of view it is very close. This does not mean that man arose from any known ape, or that any ape could ever in the course of evolution give rise to a man, but that man and the ape had at some not very remote time geologically speaking, a common ancestor. It is, however, highly probable that were we to see this common progenitor in the flesh, we would be at a loss for a descriptive term to apply to it, if we excluded the word ape. The primates which we have discussed play a subordinate part, in that they serve to link man with the lower animals. 
The Semiidae, on the other hand, are all important, for only by an understanding of them and their habits can we come to a true appreciation of our immediate pre-human progenitors. The Semiidae are thus diagnosed. Man-like apes, tailless, no cheek pouches or ischial callosities, except in the gibbon, arms much longer than the legs, an opposable pollex, a broad sternum, a vermiform appendix, hair on the underside of the trunk and limbs. Several extinct genera of Semiidae are known, while among the living there are four. Hylobates, the gibbon, Simia, the orang, Anthropopithecus, or Pan, the chimpanzee, and Gorilla, the gorilla. Of these the first two are oriental, the last two African in their present distribution, although all are apparently Asiatic in origin. The gibbons are the smallest of the man-like apes, rarely exceeding three feet in height, but have relatively the longest arms, for the hands reach the ground when the creature stands erect. Ischial callosities are present, true of none of their allies, and they are variously colored. The jaws and dentition, as in all other Semiidae, are adapted to a frugivorous diet, and the molar teeth are more primitive than in their relatives, although the upper canines are enlarged and saber-like, either for defense or, more probably, as a dietary adaptation. The skull is rounded, lacking the high sagittal crest for muscle attachment seen in the adult males of the other genera, and the head is posed upon the vertebral column more like that of a man, doubtless a response to the erect posture which the ape assumes both at rest and in motion. This upright pose may have originated in connection with a change in the mode of locomotion. The primitive lemurs ran and jumped on the tops of the branches, and hence were quadrupedal, whereas the gibbons swing beneath the branches, the arms being held above the head. This acrobatic mode of locomotion, which has been appropriately called brachiation, Latin brachium, arm, by Professor Keith, very probably took rise in the earliest anthropoids and has been carried to an extreme specialization in the excessively long-armed gibbon. Thus the habit of sitting upright, which first set free the hands for prehensile purposes, very probably preceded the habit of brachiation and the loss of the tail, as has also in the genus Indris among the lemurs. Gregory. Huxley's description of the gibbons contains the following. They are true mountaineers, loving the slopes and edges of the hills, though they rarely ascend beyond the limit of the fig trees. All day long they haunt the tops of the tall trees and though toward evening they descend in small troops to the open ground, no sooner do they spy a man than they dart up the hillsides and disappear in the darker valleys. The voice is prodigious, much more powerful than that of any singer, and yet the animal has hardly half the height of a man and far less proportionate bulk. They walk erect with the arms either down, touching the knuckles to the ground, or above the head. The gait is quick, waddling, with no elasticity of step, and they are soon run down. In the trees, however, their locomotive powers are quite another matter, the hands and arms being the sole organs of locomotion, clearing spaces of twelve to eighteen feet with greatest ease and uninterruptedly, for hours together. Duval says they can clear forty feet, which may be readily believed. They start and stop instantly with no appreciable slowing down or acceleration of speed. Moreover, their leaps not only require great strength, but the nicest precision. The significance of this mode of progression cannot be ignored, because of its educative value to the creature concerned, for every time such a hand leap is undertaken it requires the instantaneous solution of a mathematical problem, since an accurate estimate of distance, trajectory, direction, and the ability of the objective branch or branches to bear the impact of the creature's weight must all be estimated and upon the correct solution of this problem depends the amount of muscular force to be used in order that the creature may neither under nor overshoot the mark, and the penalty placed upon the incorrect solution of the problem and its practical application may be death. Nature has abundant opportunity, therefore, for the weeding out of the unfit, and she places a high premium upon mental preparedness, 
more perhaps in the gibbon and other brachiating primates than in any other group of animals, and this undoubtedly was also true of the arboreal ancestors of man. Osborne thus summarizes, The gibbon is the most primitive of living apes in its skull and dentition, but the most specialized in the length of its arms and its other extreme adaptations to arboreal life. As in the other anthropoids, the face is abbreviated, the narial region is narrow, i.e. catarine, and the brain case is widened, but the top of the skull is smooth, and the forehead lacks the prominent ridges above the orbits. Thus the profile of the skull of the gibbon is more human than that of the other anthropoid apes. When on the ground, the gibbon walks erect and is thus afforded the free use of its arms and independent movements of its fingers. In the brain there is a striking development of the centers of sight, touch, and hearing. It is these characteristics of the modern gibbon which preserve with relatively slight changes the type of the original ancestor of man. The orang, Simia satyrus, the second of the oriental apes, is confined to the somber, swampy forests of Sumatra and Borneo. It is reddish in color and rarely exceeds four feet in height, but, unlike the gibbon, it is very bulky, measuring two-thirds of its height in circumference. The arms are immensely long, the creature spreading from seven feet two inches to seven feet six inches. The head is short, round, and of great vertical diameter, with very closely approximated orbits. The skulls of the old males show a sagittal crest, and the face is surrounded with a remarkable flaring rim of flesh which gives it a very ferocious aspect. The jaw is deep and massive, and the canines are very efficient either for the opening of fruits or for fighting. The principal weapons, however, when used against other animals, are the hands. The great size of this ape renders it less agile than the gibbon, and while highly intelligent it is sluggish in disposition, reposing with the back curved and head bowed until hunger stimulates it to activity. By day the orangs climb from one treetop to another, and they descend to the ground only at night. They climb slowly and carefully, more like a man than an ape, and are nest-building in that they break off branches and lay them in a convenient crotch of a tree, thus forming a sort of platform whereon they repose, utilizing one nest until the food in the immediate vicinity is exhausted, when they move on and build another. These nests are ten to twenty-five feet above ground. On the ground the orang runs laboriously and shakily on all fours, and is soon overtaken by men. It never stands erect. Dyaks tell of old orangs which have lost all their teeth, but which find it so difficult to climb that they maintain themselves on windfalls and juicy herbage. Huxley. Normally the food consists of figs, blossoms, and young leaves, never living animals. The intelligence is very great, the hearing acute, but the vision less so. The chimpanzee, Pan Pygmaeus, or Anthropo Pythicus troglodytes is the first of the African apes and may readily be distinguished from the orang by its black hair, although the skin of the face and ears is apt to be light in color. In size they never exceed five feet, but are not so bulky relatively as the orangs, and as a consequence are much more expert as climbers, swinging from tree to tree with great agility as do the gibbons. They rest in the sitting posture and sometimes stand or walk on the hind limbs but run on all fours. The head of the chimpanzee is larger than that of the orang, and the brow ridges above and outside of the orbits are especially prominent. There is a sagittal crest for muscular attachment in the males. The brow ridges and the prognathus or forward sloping teeth and the receding chin strongly resemble those of the more ancient species of prehistoric man. In their nest building the chimpanzees resemble the orangs, in their activity and biting propensities, the gibbons. There may also be more than one species, as with the latter. They are confined today to west and central equatorial Africa, from Sierra Leone to the Congo. Gorilla Gorilla, by far the most formidable of the man-like apes, is also restricted to tropical Africa, extending from the Cameroon in the west across the Congo basin to Uganda and German East Africa. There is apparently but one species. 
a specimen killed in the cameroon and now mounted in the museum of the academy of natural sciences in philadelphia stands five feet one and a half inches in height and weighed in the flesh four hundred and eighteen pounds the torso and upper limbs are immense but the legs are short compared with those of man if the latter were of human proportions the height would probably exceed seven feet and the weight would approach five hundred pounds even as it is one cannot but view this creature in terms of humanity since he becomes to the imagination one of the most terrible creatures upon earth far more impressive than a much larger quadruped would be in describing the skull gregory says the gorilla carries to the logical extreme the frugivorous and fighting specializations which are foreshadowed in the chimpanzee the head is lengthened by the forward growth of the muzzle and by the extreme backward growth of the skull top thus the gorilla skull to a certain extent parallels that of the baboons the supraorbital protrusion is now extreme the sagittal crest and widely flaring occipital crests attain an excessive development in old males and are conditioned by the massive size of the muscles of the jaws and neck the canines form great tusks and hence the muzzle and lower jaw are very wide in front thus the fundamental resemblances to the human skull are largely disguised in the male gorilla which is distinguished by the great tusks and massive cheek teeth the divergent tooth rows the baboon-like muzzle and protruding orbits in contrast to the opposite specializations in man the young female gorilla on the other hand except in the dentition more distinctly approaches the human type than any other anthropoid the gorilla is the negro of the anthropoids with the skin a dark brown approaching black and coarse black hair which becomes gray with age there is a high crest of hair along the midline of the skull and a transverse ridge the scalp moves freely forward and back and when the animal is enraged it is contracted over the brow bringing down the hairy ridge and pointing the hair forward thus giving an indescribably ferocious aspect the limbs and body of the gorilla are markedly adapted to its gigantic and clumsy stature it has departed from the primitive slender-limbed and arboreal type and exhibits a more or less transitional stage leading to bipedal ground-dwelling habits as in the ground sloths the long arms stout short legs and widely expanded pelvis are adapted for the support of the enormous thorax and abdomen the hands of the gorilla are more human than those of any other anthropoid although the thumb is relatively smaller than in man and has not acquired the power of opposing itself to the other digits so also the foot of the gorilla distinctly approaches the human type in several ways the great toe however is still of the old grasping type which is characteristic of all primates except man and which as keith has shown although it assists the anthropoids in attaining a fully erect posture and balance while in the trees is rather a hindrance in, to the upright position on the ground gregory the gait is therefore shuffling the body never upright and rolling from side to side the body is half swung half jumped between the arms as in the chimpanzee in the walking posture the arms are held upward Gorillas run in bands containing but one adult male of proved physical prowess. They are exceedingly ferocious, always on the offensive, and never run from man. They fight both with the hands and teeth. The family to which man belongs, the Hominidae, bears the stamp of close relationship with the Semiidae, the differences being mainly the direct outcome of terrestrial life, the assumption of the erect posture, and the development of the brain. The erect posture has coordinated with it the alternation in the curvatures of the spine, the more complete adaptation of the hind limbs to bear the weight of the body, the loss of power of opposition of the great toe, and its more complete development in the thumb, and the greater length of the hind as compared with the forelimbs. The anthropoids are chiefly frugivorous and typically arboreal. When upon the ground they run poorly and, except in the case of the gibbons, use the forelimbs in progressing. Thus they are confined to forested regions. Man, on the other hand, is omnivorous, entirely terrestrial, erect, bipedal, and cursorial, an inhabitant primarily of open country. The anthropoids use their powerful canine tusks and more or less pre procumbent incisors for tearing open the tough rinds of large fruits and for fighting. Primitive man, on the contrary, 
uses his small canines and the more erect incisors partly for tearing off the flesh of animals, which he has killed in the chase with weapons made and thrown or wielded by human hands. These implements and weapons also usually make it unnecessary for man to use his teeth in fighting, and functionally they compensate for the reduced and more or less defective development of his dentition. Gregory. There is but one living genus, Homo, included with the family Hominidae, and all existing men of whatever race or creed are given but a single specific name, sapiens, i.e., the wise. The divisions of this species into its various races or varieties are, perhaps, unnecessary to our purpose, other than to enumerate the following. Australian race, skull long, dolichocephalic, extremely prominent eyebrows, large teeth, especially the canines, tall, long-limbed, skin chocolate brown, hair black, long and woolly. Habitat, Australia, Deccan, Hindustan. Negroid race, dolichocephalic, forehead round and childish, nasal bones flattened, teeth sloping, dental prognathism, skin and eyes brown or black, hair the same color, short, woolly, not abundant. Habitat, Madagascar and Africa, from the Sahara to the Cape of Good Hope. Mongolian race, brachycephalic, short-headed, flat nose, small and oblique eyes, short and thick-set, golden brown skin, sleek, coarse black hair, scanty beard, dwell east of a line drawn from Lapland to Siam, Chinese, Tartars, Japanese, Malays, Eskimos, North and South Americans. Caucasian race. A. Mediterranean, short, slender, long-headed, hair and eyes dark brown to black. B. Alpine of medium height, stocky, round-headed, hair and eyes dark brown to black, eyes often hazel or gray in Western Europe. C. Nordic, tall, long-headed, hair flaxen, red, light brown to chestnut, eyes blue, gray, or green. Habitat, mainly Europe and North America. Includes also Moors, Berbers, Egyptians, Kurds, Persians, Afghans, Hindus, Turks, Armenians, Afrikanders, and Australians, non-natives, for natives see above. Flower and Lydicker and Grant. End of chapter 37, part B. Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America. Chapter 37, Part C of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Metzler. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lowell. Part 3 the evidences of evolution section three paleontology chapter thirty seven c part two the evolution of man ontogeny and morphology anatomical and ontogenetic evidences for human evolution anatomical evidences limbs as with the elephant man's body shows a number of primitive characteristics in addition to his specializations the latter being, as we have seen, within comparatively narrow limitations. The radius and ulna, in contrast with those of the horse, are both well developed and freely articulated, so that the range of movement is ample. Not only the hinge motion at wrist and ankle, but the rotary one known as supination as well. In the wrist the several bones are distinct, such as the scaphoid and lunar of the proximal row, which in the carnivora, for instance, tend to coalesce into a single bone. Moreover, the os centrale of the wrist is also present. The fibula of the lower leg is well developed, and the foot has the primitive plantigrade position of the most archaic mammals. The number of digits is unreduced from the primal five, nor are the phalanges either increased in number as in the whales, or diminished, so that the primitive formula of two, three, 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 for the number of bones in both fingers and toes still prevails. Skeleton. The shoulder girdle yet retains the clavicle, 
linking the scapula with the sternum in contrast with all ungulates and with the carnivores. The atlas which bears the skull, the sacrum or that portion of the vertebral column which lies between the hips, and the scapula or shoulder blade all show certain reptilian characteristics. Merriam. Teeth. The teeth are also primitive, short-crowned, of simple structure and pattern, bearing relatively few low cusps. The two premolars which are present are simpler than the molars, all of which is in marked contrast to the forms we have studied, the horse, elephant, and camel. Soft anatomy. Man's soft anatomy also bears the mark of great antiquity, especially those organs having to do with his prenatal nourishment, placenta, and the means whereby the intestine is attached within the body cavity, the mesenteries, have still the same arrangement seen in the quadrupeds. Specializations. These are, first, the erect posture, which has reacted upon the skeleton in several ways, for instance, the four curvatures of the spinal column which are reduced in number and degree in infancy and extreme old age. Second, the basin-shaped pelvis in contrast with the flattened form seen in the anthropoids. The form of the human pelvis aids in supporting the viscera while the body is in the erect position. The pelvis of human embryos is at first flattened, ape-like, and only gradually assumes the basin form as they approach the time of birth. Third, relatively short forelimbs, the hands rarely extending below mid-thigh when the body is held erect. This shows the opposite extreme of a series as compared with the gibbon. With respect to foot specialization, in comparison with the foot of the anthropoid the human foot shows loss of opposability of the great toe, offset in some primitive types of man, development of the shock-absorbing arch, tendency toward monodactyly, the axis of the foot running through digit one which thus becomes the great toe, the others diminishing in size and length. In the fifth digit reduction in the number of phalanges is in progress as the two outermost tend to fuse in a certain percentage of human subjects. Still another specialization is the loss of hair from the body, possibly as a result of the acquisition of artificial clothing. The evidence for this belief cited by Matthew, 1915, follows. 1. It is accompanied by an exceptional and progressive delicacy of skin, quite unsuited to travel in tropical forests. I do not know of any thin-haired or hairless tropical animal whose skin is not more or less thickened for protection against chafing, the attacks of insects, etc. 2. The loss of hair is most complete on the back and abdomen. The arms and the legs and, in the male, the chest retain hair much more persistently. This is just what would naturally happen if the loss of hair were due to the wearing of clothes. At first, and for a long time, a skin thrown over the shoulders and tied around the waist. But if the loss of hair were conditioned by climate, it should, as it invariably does among animals, disappear first on the underside of the body and the limbs, and be retained longest on the back and shoulders. A high specialization is the loss of pigment in the skin of fairer races. The normal human dentition contains the same number of teeth, thirty-two, as that of the other Catarini, so that the reduction from the original forty-four is a primate and not a human characteristic. The human teeth, however, are reduced in relative size as compared with the anthropoids. The canine no longer exceeds the other teeth in length, and it is tending to become incisiform. There is also a loss of the diastema between the teeth into which, in the ape, the opposite canines fit. In the anthropoids the movement of the lower jaw is obliquely transverse, ruminant-like. In the human being it is in all directions and partly of a rotary character. This is correlated with the reduction of the interlocking canines. That tooth reduction in humanity is still progressing is shown by the fact that the first premolars and second incisors are often reduced and sometimes wanting and the same is true although to a less extent of the third molars, the so-called wisdom teeth. The tooth reduction is in turn correlated with the shortening of the muzzle and jaw symphysis, the facial portion of the skull that, concerned with the senses and appetite, in contrast with the enormous expansion and deepening of the brain case, the seat of mentality. 
This change in the proportions of face to cranium is expressed in terms of the facial angle that is formed between two lines lying in the sagittal plane of the skull, one of which is drawn from the lower margin of the nasal aperture to the ear opening, the other from the forehead to the maxilla. In the higher races of mankind this facial angle approaches a right angle, averaging 85 degrees. In the anthropoid, such as the chimpanzee, it is much less, not more than 45 degrees. The human brain is one of nature's marvels, exceeded in actual size only by that of the elephants and of the greater whales. In relation to bulk, man's brain exceeds that of any other creature except some excessively small vertebrates, such as the hummingbirds and smaller mice. In these forms there has been a dwarfing as a result of evolution, as an increase or decrease in bulk physically seems to be more rapidly attained than a change in brain size in the same animal. Growth of body unaccompanied by equivalent brain growth was seen in the dinosaurs Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus. Aside from its mere increase in size, the human brain is also of the highest vertebrate type, the huge cerebrum entirely covering the cerebellum, so that the latter is invisible from above greater area of the external cortex, the so-called gray matter which is the real seat of intellect, is obtained by deepening and further complication of the depressions between the convolutions. And the great development of the frontal lobes, particularly, gives ample opportunity for the expansion of the higher intellectual faculties. In its subtle fineness of detail, in its ability to record and often to reproduce an almost infinite number of mental perceptions, and in all those other resident faculties which together make up the higher intellectual characteristics of humanity, the human brain stands pre-eminent as the most complex structure evolution has produced. But a comparison with the brain of an orang shows the self-same fundamental characteristics. The proportions differ, but in a broad way the shapes are similar, and the major convolutions are alike. In other words, the two brains differ not in kind but in degree, and that of man is physically merely a relatively larger and more refined example of the same fundamental type. With regard to mental retrogression in the apes, Bibi says, young orangutans in their talk as well as in their actions are the counterparts of human infants. The scream of frantic rage when a banana is offered and jerked away the wheedling tone when the animal wishes to be comforted on account of pain or bruise, and the sound of perfect contentment and happiness when petted by the keeper whom it learns to love, all are almost indistinguishable from like utterances of a human child. But how pitiless is the inevitable change of the next few years! Slowly but surely the ape loses all affection for those who take care of it. More and more morose and sullen it becomes, until it reaches a stage of unchangeable ferocity, and must be doomed to close confinement, never again to be handled or caressed. Mr. Beebe adds to this observation in a letter as follows. I find that while sexual maturity is attained at about six years, the females seem little affected, and remain gentle and affectionate. The males, however, begin at about five years to become morose and sullen. This applies both to chimpanzees and orangs. These statements apply only to several animals which have attained their sexual majority in the New York Zoological Park, and even among them there is great variation. The final human characteristic which lifts man high above his fellow creatures is articulate speech, the means whereby communication, especially of higher abstract thoughts, is made primarily possible for the development of a mature written language is clearly the outgrowth of an antecedent speech. This human faculty has had great influence in the development of the higher mental traits. Thus it will be seen that comparative anatomy shows very emphatically our fundamental resemblances to the other anthropoids, and that if we would look for differences we must compare details of structure and development rather than distinctions of a larger sort. As Huxley truly said, the structural differences between man and the man-like apes certainly justify our regarding him as constituting a family apart from them, though, inasmuch as he differs less from them than they do from other families of the same order, there can be no justification for placing him in a distinct order. Perhaps no order of animals presents us with so extraordinary a series of gradations as this, leading us insensibly from the crown and summit of animal creation 
down to creatures from which there is but a step as it seems to the lowest smallest and least intelligent of the placental mammalia it is as if nature herself had foreseen the arrogance of man and with roman severity had provided that his intellect by its very triumphs should call into prominence the slaves admonishing the conqueror that he is but dust End of chapter thirty seven part c recording by eric metzler albuquerque new mexico united states of america chapter thirty seven part d of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eric metzler organic evolution by richard swan lowell part three the evidences of evolution section three paleontology chapter thirty seven d part two the evolution of man ontogeny and morphology anatomical and ontogenetic evidences for human evolution vestigial organs drummond mentions no fewer than seventy such relics which he most appropriately calls the scaffolding left in the body relics of old-time conditions and needs for which the modern human economy has no further use they are veritable historical documents enclosed within the limits of each human frame during part or the whole of its existence and may be viewed in no other light certain of these features disappear with growth and maturity and hence are ontogenetic others persist during the lifetime of their possessor one of these persistent vestigial features is the direction of hair on the body that upon the arms for instance runs from shoulder to elbow and from the wrist upward and outward in such a way that were the hands clasped above the head with the elbows pointing downward a posture often assumed by the orang the hair thus arranged sheds the falling rain in all anthropoids except the gibbon the same direction of hair prevails as with mankind hence the conclusion of a bygone community of habit between man and these apes is irresistible then too the absence of hair on the terminal phalanges its scarcity on the second and greater abundance on the first are true of the anthropoids as well as of man the vermiform appendix has been mentioned as a diagnostic characteristic of the family hominidae and also of the semiidae in man it is not only apparently useless but is sometimes a veritable death trap with herbivorous mammals on the other hand its homologue is large and of high digestive value even in man the appendix has the same structure as the large intestine peritoneum muscular coat and mucus layer in the embryo it has the same calibre as the rest of the bowel but soon ceases to grow and is actually as long in the newborn babe as in the adult the darwinian point to the ear is a little conical projection from the inwardly turned margin of the ear more frequent in the male than in the female as are all atavistic features this is in man a relic of the pointed ear found in lower mammals and is as darwin says a surviving symbol of the stirring times and dangerous days of his animal youth thin bands of muscle formerly of value in moving the shell of the ear to aid in the appreciation of sound are still present but usually functionless as are also the present but involuntary hair erecting muscles of the scalp most of the dermal muscles in fact so well developed in lower animals for twitching the skin are retained in the human face only where they are used for the expression of the emotions doubtless their retention is in part of defensive significance as they may well have been used to strike terror into the breast of an opponent in addition to this they also aided in the expression of the emotions as of pleasure or pain and together with the voice formed the first elemental speech a further vestige is the plica semilunaris a crescentic fold of membrane in the inner corner of the eye which represents the very efficient third eyelid or nictitating membrane of the eyes of many mammals and of birds the pineal body of the brain is connected in reptiles notably hatteria with a third eye really the first primordial vertebrate eye in man this is present as a vestige deep hidden beneath the mass of the forebrain in other mammals that portion of the upper jaw 
which bears the incisor teeth is separated off by a suture and is known as the premaxillary bone in man and the chimpanzee the suture is normally obsolete yet the poet goethe predicted that some day the separate premaxillary would be found in man and so it has been moreover the frontal bone single in man paired in the dog is paired in an abyssinian skull in the yale collection ontogenetic vestiges embryology teaches us much of the past life of any race and this is just as true of humanity as of any other created being for the unfolding of the miniature man shows precisely the same one-celled condition of the ages remote protozoan ancestry the same cleavage stages morula blastula and gastrula as any other metazoan the gradual assumption of chordate characteristics of notochord of hollow nervous system of gill slits the budding of limbs at first as ill-formed as those of the earliest slime-born amphibian emergent from the old limiting aquatic environment the perfected limbs and the well-developed tail of an ancient placental mammal and the ultimate loss of this and other embryonic structures until a man is born into the world thus these wonderful changes wrought in the dark reproduce as in a pageant the historic changes brought about by the evolutionary process during the long night of the geologic past certain of the ontogenetic features may be more specifically mentioned such as the gill slits of which there are four in the embryo sometimes certain of these fail to close so that openings remain on the sides of the neck through which fluids taken in at the mouth can trickle or the slits may have closed but white patches on the skin betray their former position the first gill slit the so-called spiracle of the fish normally persists and forms the eustachian tube connecting the inner ear with the throat for the purpose of equalizing the air pressure on either side of the drum the ear in fact is developed from this first gill slit and the hearing organ may be subsequently repeated down the neck as drummond says in some human families where the tendency to retain these special structures is strong one member sometimes illustrates the abnormality by possessing the clefts alone another has a cervical ear while a third has both a cleft and a neck ear all of these of course in addition to the ordinary ears the tail is indicated in the human skeleton by the four or five bones at the loro terminus of the spine coalesced in the adult into the coccygeal bone which is concealed beneath the flesh but in the embryo not only is it present but is free movable and has muscles for wagging it these are usually reduced later to mere ligaments but may permanently retain their muscular character the external tail may also persist the lanugo or clothing of long dark hair which covers the entire body except the palms and soles up to the sixth month of prenatal life usually disappears before birth but in rare circumstances may persist and give a permanent hairy aspect to both face and body this fetal hair is also found in other hairless mammals such as the elephants and whales and can have but the one historical significance harking back to the day when hair was a racial necessity and not a superfluity as it is today in all three groups the awful grasp of a baby as drummond puts it is also significant for the power of grip notably great during the first few weeks of its life when it needs the most constant care sensibly weakens later as experiments have shown these consisted in the suspending from a stick or from the finger by the power of their hands alone some sixty infants which were under a month old and in at least half of these experiment was tried within an hour of birth in every instance with only two exceptions the child was able to hang on to the finger or a small stick three-quarters of an inch in diameter by its hands and sustained the whole weight of its body for at least ten seconds in twelve cases in infants under an hour old half a minute passed before the grip relaxed and in three or four nearly a minute when about four days old the strength had increased and nearly all when tried at this age could sustain their weight for half a minute about a fortnight or three weeks after birth the faculty appeared to have attained its maximum for several at this period succeeded in hanging for over a minute and a half two for just over two minutes and one infant of three weeks old for two minutes thirty-five seconds invariably the thighs are bent nearly at right angles to the body 
and in no case did the lower hymns hang down and take the attitude of the erect position. Furthermore, the child showed no sign of distress and no cries uttered until the grasp begins to give way. Drummond. This is, of course, one of the many instances, mainly structural, however, which point to the old-time arboreal life, not perhaps that the infant of that day clung directly to the tree, but that the mother did and had to have her hands free for brachiation, hence it was necessary for the infant to cling to her. Another phenomenon which has received a similar interpretation, that of arboreal life, is the occasional dreams one has of falling through space with the violent instinctive effort often undergone to prevent disastrous consequences. And the strange thing about it is that in the dream the fall never ends fatally, for that is an experience which could not be transmitted to offspring, for such would not exist, while that of the fall could. Jack London, in his book Before Adam, makes much of this. Roosevelt says of nightmares, although without necessarily implying an historical interpretation to them, civilized man now usually passes his life under conditions which eliminate the intensity of terror felt by his ancestors when death by violence was their normal end and threatened them during every hour of the day and night it is only in nightmares that the average dweller in civilized countries undergoes the hideous horror which was the regular and frequent portion of his age's vanished forefathers and is still an everyday incident in the lives of most wild creatures Scribner's Magazine, May 1910. These examples out of many, Wiedersheim says 180, are sufficient to show that the human body cannot be considered as a perfect final work of creation, but rather the ultimate product of eons of evolutionary change, resulting in a very imperfect being from the physical point of view, a veritable museum of antiquities. End of chapter 37, part D. Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America. Section 3, Paleontology. Chapter 38A, Of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Section 3 Paleontology. Chapter 38A. The Evolution of Man. Paleontology. Part 3. Paleontological Evidence of Human Evolution. Our evidences for human evolution thus far discussed are such as were derived from the existing. We have now to trace, in so far as we may, the actual evolutionary history of the primates and of man as derived largely from paleontological records. Origin of Primates Stock There is but little doubt that two important orders of modern mammals, the carnivora and the primates, had a common origin diverging mainly along lines determined by a dietary contrast. As the former have become more strictly flesh-eating or predaceous, the latter largely fruit-eating and as a consequence more completely arboreal. Back of each group lie as anectant forms, the insectivora, not perhaps such as are alive today, as all these are highly specialized along diverse lines, but generalized insectivores, possessing, because of their primitiveness, a wider range of potential adaptation. Matthew is disposed to think of these, our distant ancestors, at the dawn of the tertiary, as a sort of hybrid between a lemur and a mongoose, rather Catholic in their tastes, living among and partly in the trees, with sharp nose, bright eyes, and a shrewd little brain behind them, looking out, if you will, from a perch among the branches, upon a world that was to be singularly kind to them and their descendants. Thus we can define the stock as a relatively large-brained arboreal insectivore, of primitive but adaptable dentition, and especially of progressive mentality. Time The time of primate origin must have been not later than basal eocene, 
as primates clearly definable as such are found in the lower eocene rocks of both europe and north america place the simultaneous appearance of the primates in the old world and the new gives rise to the same conclusions as to their place of origin and their migrations thence as with other modernized mammals it suffices now to say that their ancestral home was boreal holarctica probably within the limits of the present continent of asia whence they migrated southward along the three great continental radii see map figure two forty six the impelling cause of this migration was the increasing northern cold before which the boreal limitations of the tropical forests retreated carrying with them the primates which in general are utterly dependent upon such an environment for their sustenance geologic record primates are found in the north american sediments from lower to upper eocene time when they became extinct thus while their remains constitute a relatively large percentage of the total fauna of the eocene primates are utterly unknown on this continent from that time until the coming of man in europe the record is similar except that the extinction occurred at a somewhat later date the oligocene furthermore they reappear in europe in the lower miocene at the time of the proboscidean migration out of africa whence these primates may also have come their second european extinction was in the upper pliocene shortly before the first appearance of mankind but in southern asia africa and south america the evolution of primates seems to have been continuous since the first great southward migration the evidence however is not so much the historical documents as the presence of primates in those places at the present time the fossil record is not entirely lacking although highly incomplete the south american monkeys may have had their origin in the ancient north american primates or more doubtfully the stock may have come by way of africa scott inclines toward the latter view although he says the evidence is by no means conclusive origin of man stock according to w k gregory the stock from which man arose was some big-brained anthropoid related most nearly to the chimpanzee gorilla group an assumption based upon anatomical evidences in spite of wide differences in habitus and consequent adaptation place evidences point to central asia as the place of the descent from the trees of the human precursor the reasons for this belief being several first it was central for migrations elsewhere Europe, on the other hand, where the most conclusive, in fact almost the exclusive evidence for fossil man is found, is too small an area for the divergent evolution of the several human species. Second, Asia is contiguous to the oldest known human remains, which, as we shall see, were found in Java. Third, it was the seat of the oldest civilizations, not only of the existing nations, which, like the Chinese, trace their recorded history back to a hoary antiquity but of nations which preceded them by thousands of years and whose records have not yet come to light this antiquity vastly exceeds that of the nations of europe or of the americas or of africa fourth central asia is the source of almost all of our domestic animals many of which have been subjected to human will and control for thousands of years and this is equally true of many of our domestic plants this is not due to the fact that man first reached civilization in asia but rather that he chose for his companions the highest and best of their several evolutionary lines and asia was the place of all others upon earth where the evolution in general of organic life reached its highest development in late cenozoic time williston fifth Climatic conditions in Asia in the Miocene or early Pliocene were such as to compel the descent of the pre-human ancestor from the trees, a step which was absolutely essential to further human development. Impelling Cause We look for a geologic cause back of this most momentous crisis in the evolution of humanity, and we find it in continental elevation and consequent increasing aridity of climate especially to the northward of the himalayas 
with this increased aridity and tempering of tropical heat came the dwindling of the forested areas suitable to primate occupancy Burrell has suggested that this diminution left residual forests comparable to the diminishing lakes and ponds of the Devonian, which upon final desiccation compelled their denizens to become terrestrial or perish. The dwindling of the residual forests would have an effect upon the tree-dwellers which may be expressed in precisely the same words. Once upon the ground, the effect upon even a conservative type and the primates in general, where constant conditions prevail, are slow of change, would be the rapid acquisition of such adaptations as were necessary to ensure survival under the new conditions. The other man-like apes had unfortunately for their further evolution reached a region where tropical forests continued to be available, and hence have retained their arboreal life, and with it a stagnation of progress. The result has been, at any rate, on the part of the three larger forms, a degeneracy from the estate of their common ancestry with mankind. The gibbons seem to have deteriorated less, while terrestrial man has risen to the summit of primate evolution. Time. The time of the descent is not later than early Pliocene, nor earlier than Miocene time when the terrestrial ape-man became what we would call human, was perhaps later, but certainly during the Pliocene, which makes the age of man, as such, measurable in terms of hundreds of thousands of years. Significance of the Descent from Trees As a result of the descent from the trees, certain definite factors were called into play, each of which had its effect on the further evolution. Briefly enumerated, these are number one assumption of the erect posture number two liberation of the hands from their ancient locomotor function to become organs of the mind number three loss of the easily obtainable food of the tropical forests necessitating the search for sustenance both plant and animal and man became a hunter number four need of clothing with increasing inclemency of the weather especially during the long winters Number five, freedom from climatic restrictions when an omnivorous diet and clothing were required. When an omnivorous diet and clothing were acquired, man was no longer limited to one definite habitat, and the result was dispersal. Number six, the development of communal life rendered possible by the terrestrial habitat. Primates are at best gregarious, submitting, as in the gorilla, to the leadership of the strongest male but it is only by communal life with its attendant division of labor that man can rise above the level of utter savagery. Evolutionary Changes Human evolutionary changes which are recorded are more erect posture, shorter arms, perfection of thumb opposability, reduction of muzzle and of size of teeth, loss of jaw power, development of chin prominence, increase in skull capacity, diminution of brow ridges, diminution in strength of zygomatic or temporal arch, increase in size and complexity of brain, especially frontal lobes, development of articulate speech, fossil man. Fossil remains of man are found under two conditions, in river valley deposits and in limestone caverns, which served first as a dwelling place and later as a sepulture. Of these, the caverns have been by far the most productive, but they contain only the remains of the later races, as the caverns, according to Penck, did not become available for human occupancy before Middle Pleistocene time. The rarity of human fossils may be explained, first, by the various burial customs, which seldom are sufficiently perfect to preclude the possibility of alternate wetting and drying, or of rapid oxidation both of which are prohibitive of fossilization if man lived and died in the forests the chances for his fossilization in common with other forest creatures was very remote for the remains of such are almost invariably destroyed by other animals by dampness or by fungi and rarely attain a natural burial in sediment if on the other hand he dwelt in the open 
the chances of so shrewd a creature being caught in the flood-waters and thus buried in sediment were not very great however we account for it the fact remains that relics of ancient man are rare and are valued accordingly in north america repeated instances of seemingly ancient man have been brought to light in north america such as the calavera skull of the california gold-bearing gravels which was satirized by bret hart the nebraska loess man and those of the trenton gravels none of which with the possible exception of the last mentioned has proved to be really old in the geologic sense indirect evidence of human antiquity that is the association of north american man with animals which are now extinct while very rare has been reported in at least two highly authentic instances the first of these was at attica new york and is attested by dr john m clark the new york state geologist four feet below the surface of the ground in a black muck he found the bones of the mastodon mastodon americanus and twelve inches below this in undisturbed clay pieces of pottery and thirty fragments of charcoal the charcoal may have been of natural origin but the presence of the pottery seems conclusive the other instance was that of the remains of a herd of extinct bison bison antiquus found near smoky hill river logan county kansas and thus described by professor williston an arrowhead was found underneath the right scapula of the largest skeleton embedded in the matrix but touching the bone itself the skeleton was lying upon the right side the bone bed when cleared off contained the skeletons of five or six adult animals and two or three younger ones together with a fetal skeleton within the pelvis of one of the adult skeletons the animals had evidently fell perished together during the winter there was no possibility of the accidental intrusion of the arrowhead in the place where found it must have been within the body of the animal at the time of death or have been lying on the surface beneath its body what at this writing is claimed to be another genuine case of such an association this time of the actual human bones has just been announced from florida this find which has been reported by state geologist sellards was made at vero eastern florida in nineteen thirteen the fossil human bones are from two incomplete skeletons and are found in strata which also contain remains of the following extinct species elephus columbi equus ladii a fox a deer the ground sloth megalonyx jeffersoni and the american mastodon in south america a number of finds have been recorded from south america notably by the late florentino amagino of buenos aires who contributed so largely to our knowledge of south american prehistoric life an expert from washington dr alas harlica has studied with the utmost care the locality and character of each of these finds in the western world and has expressed the opinion that none is of an antiquity greater than that of the pre-columbian indians further evidence lies in the uniformity of type except for minor distinctions of all native american peoples there is no such racial differentiation as that seen in the old world and the argument is that there has not been time for such a deployment the area and conditions as an adaptive radiation center are surely ample in africa the only african relics thus far reported are those of prehistoric cultures comparable to those of southern europe in certain caverns of the barbary states there has also been reported from oldaway ravine german east africa a human skeleton of undoubted antiquity it is described however as being neither a very early nor a primitive type in asia asia has given us in pithecanthropus the oldest known relic of the hominidae found at trinal in the island of java osborne says it is possible that within the next decade one or more of the tertiary ancestors of man may be discovered in northern india among the foothills known as the sewaliks such discoveries have been heralded but none have thus far been actually made yet asia will probably prove to be the centre of the human race 
we have now discovered in southern asia primitive representatives or relatives of the four existing types of anthropoid apes namely the gibbon the orang the chimpanzee and the gorilla and since the extinct indian apes are related to those of africa and of europe it appears probable that southern asia is near the centre of the evolution of the higher primates and that we may look there for the ancestors not only of pre-human stages like the trenal race but of the higher and truly human types in europe it is in europe however that the tale of human prehistory is the most complete not only through the happy accident of preserval but because it has been much more thoroughly explored than has the asiatic evolutionary centre the latter however holds the greatest hopes for future exploration since as we have emphasized europe is too small to be an adaptive radiation centre and european prehistoric men represent waves of migration from the greater continent nevertheless the european record has enabled us to name and define a number of distinct human species and here the record of the cultural evolution of man is also unusually complete hence european chronology is taken as a standard in describing discoveries from any portion of the world chronological table adapted from osborne nineteen fifteen post-glacial time twenty five thousand years upper paleolithic culture cro-magnon man fourth glacial stage worm wisconsin fifty thousand years close of lower paleolithic culture neanderthal man third interglacial stage one hundred and fifty thousand years beginning of lower paleolithic culture piltdown and pre-neanderthaloid men third glacial stage ris illinoisan one hundred and seventy five thousand years second interglacial stage three hundred and seventy five thousand years heidelberg man second glacial stage mindel kansan four hundred thousand years first interglacial stage four hundred and seventy five thousand years pithecanthropus ape man first glacial stage goons nebraskan five hundred thousand years Pithecanthropus, the Java ape man, Pithecanthropus erectus, figure 247 and plate 30, A, was discovered in Trinal on the Solo or Bengawan River in central Java in 1894. The type consists of a calvarium or skull cap, a left thigh bone, and two upper molar teeth. The skull is characterized by its limited capacity, about two thirds that of man and by the low flat forehead and beetling brows hence not only was the brain limited in its total size but this was especially true of the frontal lobes which as we have seen are the seat of the higher intellectual faculties thus as osborne says although touch taste and vision were well developed there was a limited faculty for profiting by experience and accumulated tradition the femur associated with the skull is remarkable for its length and slight curvature as compared with the primitive neanderthal race of europe and indicates a creature fully as erect and nearly as tall as the average european of today. the height being estimated at five feet seven inches as compared with five feet three inches for the neanderthals and five feet eight inches the average height of modern males the erect posture of course implies the liberation of the hands from any part in the locomotor function the teeth are somewhat ape-like but are more human than are those of the gibbon and the human mode of mastication has been acquired certain authorities have tried to prove that pithecanthropus is nothing but a large gibbon but the weight of authority considers it pre-human though not in the line of direct development into humanity it is nevertheless a highly important transitional form associated with the pithecanthropus remains are those of a number of the contemporary animals which fix the date as either of the upper pliocene or lowermost pleistocene period which being rendered in terms of years gives an estimated age of about five hundred thousand end of section three paleontology chapter thirty eight a Recording by Pamela Krantz
Section 3, Paleontology, Chapter 38b of Organic Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Section 3, Paleontology, Chapter 38b, The Evolution of Man. Paleontology, Part 3. Paleontological Evidence of Human Evolution. Heidelberg Man. Homo heidelbergensis, the Heidelberg Man, represents the oldest recorded European race, geologically speaking. The type was discovered in 1907 in River Sands, 79 feet below the surface, at Mauer, near Heidelberg, South Germany. The relic consists of a perfect lower jaw with a dentition, figure 248c. The description by the discoverer, Dr. Schotensack, follows, from Osborne. The mandible shows a combination of features never before found in any fossil or recent man. The protrusion of the lower jaw just below the front teeth, the chin prominence, which gives shape to the human chin, is entirely lacking. Had the teeth been absent, it would have been impossible to diagnose it as human. From a fragment of the symphysis of the jaw, it might well have been classed as some gorilla-like anthropoid, while the ascending ramus resembles that of some large variety of gibbon. The absolute certainty that these remains are human is based on the form of the teeth. Molars, premolars, canines, and incisors are all essentially human, and although somewhat primitive in form, show no trace of being intermediate between man and the anthropoid apes, but rather of being derived from some older common ancestor. The teeth, however, are small for the jaw. The size of the border would allow for the development of much larger teeth. We can only conclude that no great strain was put on the teeth, and therefore the powerful development of the bones of the jaw was not designed for their benefit. The conclusion is that the jaw, regarded as unquestionably human from the nature of the teeth, ranks not far from the point of separation between man and the anthropoid apes. In comparison with the jaws of the Neanderthal races, we may consider the Heidelberg jaw as pre-Neanderthaloid. It is, in fact, a generalized type. Associated with the Heidelberg jaw is an extensive warm climate fauna, straight-tusked elephant, Latin antiquus, Etruscan rhinoceros, primitive horse, bison, wild cattle, urus, bear, lion, and so on, all of which aid in establishing the date of the jaw as second interglacial, and its age, conservatively estimated, at from 300,000 to 375,000 years. The cultural evolution of Heidelberg man is indicated by the presence of eoliths, flint implements of the crudest workmanship, if indeed their apparent fashioning is not merely the result of use. Neanderthal Man the original specimen of the Neanderthal man, or primigenius, figures 249, 250, 252, and plate 30, b, was discovered in 1856, not far from Dusseldorf in Rhenish Prussia. Here the valley of the Dussel forms the deep Neanderthal ravine, whose limestone walls are penetrated by caverns, in one of which the remains were found. What was doubtless a perfect skeleton at the time of its discovery was so injured by its finders that only a portion of it, which is now preserved in the Provincial Museum at Bonn, was saved. This prophet of an unknown race was for a time utterly without honor, though of course the subject of a most heated controversy, being considered as non-human, or, as Firko believed, owing its distinctive characters to disease. The sagacity of Huxley threw true light upon the problem, though it was not until the mute testimony of other representatives of the race, the men of spy, was offered that even Huxley's masterful conception of the Neanderthal characters was taken as an accepted fact. Professor Huxley's description of the Neanderthal type is classic. He says, the anatomical characters of the skeletons bear out conclusions which are not flattering to the appearance of the owners. They were short of stature, but powerfully built, 
with strong curiously curved thigh bones the lower ends of which are so fashioned that they must have walked with a bend at the knees their long depressed skulls had very strong brow ridges their lower jaws of brutal depth and solidity sloped away from the teeth downwards and backwards in consequence of the absence of that especially characteristic feature of the higher type of man the chin prominence lull subsequently several more specimens have come to light at spy in belgium at crepina in croatia at le moustier la chape à Luçon, and la ferrasi in france and at gibraltar which while differing in various details effectually serve to establish the race whose main characteristics are heavy overhanging brows retreating forehead long upper lip jaw less powerful than that of heidelberg man but very thick and massive chin generally strongly receding but in that of a living native australian b homo extraordinarily massive in the la piao the latter the lowest misting race la chapelle specimen whereas small the skull in many characteristics is nearer to the anthropoids than to modern man the brain is large and its volume is surely human but the proportions are again less like those of recent man than like the anthropoids the chest is large and robust the shoulders broad and the hand large but the fingers are relatively short the thumb lacking the range of movement seen in modern man the knee was somewhat bent the leg powerful with a short shin and clumsy foot clearly not of cursorial adaptation the curve of the bent leg was correlated with a similar curvature of the spine so that the man could not stand fully erect as he lacked the fourth or cervical curvature of homo sapiens the average stature was five feet three inches with a range from four feet ten point three inches to five feet five point two inches partly sex difference neanderthal man lived in europe from the third interglacial stage through the fourth glacial a duration of thousands of years and then became extinct from twenty to twenty-five millenniums ago he seems to have been an actual lineal successor of the man of heidelberg but was throughout his long career an unprogressive static race one of the most remarkable features in connection with this race however was the very reverent way in which the dead were buried with an abundance of ornaments and finely worked flints this can have but one interpretation the awakening within this ancient type of the instinctive belief in immortality piltdown man in 1912 was announced the discovery of a very ancient man from the thames gravels at piltdown sussex england here again the skull was injured and partly lost so that the question of its proper restoration has been the subject of considerable controversy the material consists of portions of the cranial walls nasal bones a canine tooth and part of a lower jaw the brain case in this instance is typically human except for the remarkably thick cranial walls the forehead is high and lacks the supraorbital ridges of neanderthal man and pithecanthropus while the skull is of comparatively high human type the associated jaw and canine tooth clearly are not and some difficulty was met in explaining their evolutionary discrepancy that has apparently been answered however by the conclusion that the association of the material is purely accidental and that the jaw not only does not belong with the skull but that it is not even human but is that of a fossil chimpanzee that being the case there seems to be no reason for the exclusion of the piltdown man who has been named eoanthropus dawsoni from the direct line of human ancestry the specimen is not perhaps so surely dated as are those of the other european races but it is associated with a warm climate fauna and is generally considered to belong to the third interglacial stage from one hundred thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand years old and hence vastly more ancient than the more primitive homo neanderthalensis see figures two forty eight b and two fifty one cro magnon man the original finds of the men of the cro magnon race figure three fifty three plate thirty c homo sapiens were made at gower wales and at aurignac france in the latter place seventeen skeletons came to light in eighteen fifty two 
but were buried in the village cemetery and thus lost to science and not until eighteen sixty eight when five more skeletons were discovered at cro magnon france was the race established these individuals an old man two young men a woman and a child are thus the types of the race this magnificent race is thus characterized skull large but narrow with a broad face hence disharmonic facial angle equaling the highest type of homo sapiens jaw thick and strong with a narrow but very prominent chin forehead high and orbital ridges reduced brain not only of high type but very large that of the women exceeding the average male of today the stature of the old man was six feet four and a half inches the average for males being six feet one and a half inches footnote the tallest living races of men are the highland scots and the patagonians whose height averages five feet eleven inches to six feet and footnote for women five feet five inches a great disparity the lower segments of the limbs were long in contrast with the neanderthal type hence the men of cro magnon were swift-footed while those of neanderthal were slow osborne says the wide short face the extremely prominent cheekbones the spread of the palate and a tendency of the upper cutting teeth and incisors to project forward and the narrow pointed chin recall a facial type which is best seen today in tribes living in asia to the north and to the south of the himalayas as regards their stature the cro magnon race recall the sikhs living to the south of the himalayas in the disharmonic proportions of the face that is the combination of broad cheekbones and narrow skull they resemble the eskimo the sum of the cro magnon characters is certainly asiatic rather than african whereas in the grimaldis of which specimens have been found in association with cro magnons at the grotte des enfants mentone the sum of the characters is decidedly negroid or african the cro magnons again show by their elaborate burial customs how old and well founded is the belief in life after death they are supposed to be the people who left on the walls of the caverns of france and spain the marvellous examples of upper paleolithic art of which professor osborne's book gives so adequate a description they lived for a while contemporaneously with the men of neanderthal and may have contributed somewhat to the final extinction of the latter in the course of time however they too declined although to this day survivors of the race may be seen in dordogne at lund near the garonne in southern france and at lanyon in brittany osborne says the decline of the cro magnons with their artistic culture may have been partly due to environmental causes and the abandonment of their vigorous nomadic mode of life or it may be that they had reached the end of a long cycle of psychic development we know as a parallel that in the history of many civilized races a period of great artistic and industrial development may be followed by a period of stagnation and decline without any apparent environmental cause europe was repopulated after cro magnon decline by later invaders from the asiatic realm the so-called mediterranean narrow-headed and the alpine broad-headed types etc probably differentiated in asia in early paleolithic times the repopulation took place in the upper paleolithic evidences of human antiquity great variation these briefly summarized are first great variation if man is monophyletic that is derived from a single prehuman species and there is no reason to believe otherwise he must be old for while the adaptations to ground-dwelling after the descent from the trees were doubtless relatively rapidly acquired the differentiation into the various races due perhaps largely to climatic influences rather than to any notable environmental change must have been slowly attained as cooperative evidence we have but to point to the mural paintings on egyptian monuments dating back several thousand years in which are depicted the ethiopian caucasian and the like which are in some instances striking likenesses of the present-day egyptians universal distribution is in animals another mark of antiquity in man it is probably less so because of his greater intelligence and yet before transportation had become a science man's spread over land and sea was extremely slow 
high intelligence as compared with that of the anthropoids is also a mark of antiquity for the brain especially the type of brain found in the higher human races must have been very slow of development our study of fossil man shows this communal life division of labor and all of the complicated interactions which it brings about and the development of law and religions all have taken time when we realize that babylonian texts twice as remote as the patriarch abraham give evidence of highly perfect laws and of a civilization which must have antedated their production by centuries we gain another yet more emphatic impression of human antiquity add to all this the paleontological evidence of man's association with various genera and numerous successive species of prehistoric animals of which he alone survives and the evidence is complete future of humanity because of his intelligence and communal cooperation man is no longer subject to the laws which govern the adaptation of animals to their environment osborne's law of adaptive radiation which as we have seen applies equally well to the insects reptiles and mammals fails in its application to mankind and yet man has become as thoroughly adapted to speed flight to the fossorial and aquatic as they but his adaptation is artificial and to a very small extent only affects his physical frame while theirs is natural and the stamp of the environment is deeply impressed upon the organism man's physical evolution has virtually ceased but in so far as any change is being affected it is largely retrogressive such changes are reduction of hair and teeth and of hand skill and dulling of the senses of sight smell and hearing upon which active creatures depend so largely for safety that sort of charity which fosters the physically mentally and morally feeble and is thus contrary to the law of natural selection must also in the long run have an adverse effect upon the race man is hardly as yet subject to malthus's law for while he is increasing more rapidly than any other mammal owing largely to the care of the young which makes the expectation of life of the newborn relatively very high his migratory ability but above all his intelligence save him from the application of the law a single new discovery such as that of electricity may increase his food supply and other life necessities several fold his future evolution in so far as it is progressive will be mental and spiritual rather than physical and as such will be the logical conclusion of the marvelous results of organic evolution end of section three paleontology chapter thirty eight b recording by pamela Krantz. part four epilogue of organic evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Organic Evolution by Richard Swan Lull. Part 4 Epilogue The Pulse of Life. The stream of life flows so slowly that the imagination fails to grasp the immensity of time required for its passage. But like many another stream, it pulses irregularly as it flows. There are times of quickening the expression points of evolution, which are almost invariably coincident with some great geologic change, and the correspondence is so exact and so frequent that the laws of chance may not be invoked by way of explanation. The geologic changes in the pulse of life stand to each other in the relation of cause and effect. This statement does not, however, imply the acceptance of the Lamarckian factor any more than that of natural selection, for whether the influence of a changing environment acts directly upon the creature's body, or indirectly through induced habit, or whether it merely sets a standard to which animals must conform if they would survive, matters not. The fundamental principle remains that changing environmental conditions stimulate the sluggish evolutionary stream to quickened movement many of these pulsations have been described in the foregoing pages and in each instance we have attempted to define the physical change which served to accelerate the flow of life 
and in almost every successful attempt we have found the immediate influence to be one of climate either of temperature or moisture variation due sometimes to topographic at others to general atmospheric conditions back of these climatic changes lies as one of the great fundamental causes earth shrinkage with a consequent warping of the crust which produces mountain ranges and enlarges the lands thus it will be seen that the most momentous changes so far as influence on life is concerned may have geologically speaking a very simple basic cause in so far as we can recognize cause and effect the record of the crises of evolution stands as follows for the origin of life itself there is no known geologic cause other than the gradually attained fitness of the earth as the abode of organic beings nor do we surely know of any geologic event which impelled the lime secreting habit of animals and plants and thus made possible an adequate fossil record of their life this habit was attained however by the animals in the upper cambrian and much earlier by the water living algae among plants the origin of vertebrates another event of high importance occurred much earlier than mid ordovician time for in rocks of that period are preserved fossils which indicate that chordate evolution was already well along upon its course as the creatures recorded are highly specialized armored offshoots of a primitive stock the main dynamic and hence anatomic distinction between vertebrates and invertebrates lies in the fact that the former are principally active motor types while the latter with some striking exceptions such as the predaceous cephalopods are sluggish non-motor organisms many of which are actually sedentary in their habits and adaptations that this evolutionary distinction is largely the result of habitat seems evident the vertebrates being a response to dynamic waters the invertebrates to static the origin of vertebrates therefore implies no more than quickened rivers and inhabitants of right potentiality it could not in all probability have occurred either in the sea or in land waters borne upon a flat topography hence we should look for a great diastrophic movement or elevation of the lands such as would accelerate the flow of terrestrial rivers for in all probability a potent stock possibly worm-like forms had peopled the sluggish waters for a long period antecedent to the actual change several such movements are recorded during pre-cambrian time but that of the epiproterozoic interval seems to fill the time requirements best of all as the others are immeasurably remote another event of immense importance to future evolution was the emergence of the vertebrates from their limiting aquatic environment that this emergence was by way of the strand from sea to land seems hardly probable for no phylum of animals has ever chosen this readily available route isolated genera or even species which collectively form rare exceptions to the lebensweise of their allies have traversed this road but there is not sufficient stimulus to produce a notable migration the vertebrate emergence was from the rivers to the lands and the impelling cause the increasing aridity consequent upon the silurian uplift this reduced the abundant rivers to sluggish streams and finally to residual bodies of water imperfectly oxygenated which placed a premium on lung breathing on the part of the contained fishes when the final dwindling of their habitat left them stranded such as could become exclusively air breathing survived giving rise to the amphibia but those which could not perished except that in some remote asylums where a vestige of their habitat persisted the lungfishes also survived, for their descendants, few as to kinds, are still extant. With the recurring moisture of the coal measures, amphibia throve and multiplied, returning to the ancestral waters seasonally to bring forth their young. But toward the latter part of the Mississippian, increasing aridity and reduction of temperature are again manifest, making this annual return less readily possible and stimulating the evolution of the exclusively air-breathing reptiles in early permian recurs the same chain of events continental rise increased aridity and this time glaciation especially in the southern hemisphere the following triassic period was also a time of aridity 
amelioration of climate coming only after its close. Reptiles being already established, the climatic conditions stimulated an event in the evolution of terrestrial animals, second in importance only to their emergence, the origin of mammals. Aridity paved the way by developing active types among the reptiles, and this was apparently a necessary antecedent to the establishment of warm blood, through quickened metabolism and raising of the body off the ground. Increasing cold then placed a premium on ability to maintain this activity beyond the limits of the shortening summers, and this could only come about through the acquiring of a constantly maintained temperature, in other words, of warm blood. Out of one reptilian stock arose the warm-blooded quadrupedal mammals, and out of another the warm-blooded bipedal birds. The former, however, were kept so effectually in check during the Mesozoic, apparently by the dominant reptiles, that their known evolution amounts to but little until Eocene time. Aridity in the Triassic, necessitating swiftness of motion, seems to have given rise to the bipedal dinosaurs, just as aridity and bipedality among modern lizards are the result of similar association of cause and effect. Climatic oscillation, giving rise to humid conditions during the Jurassic, furnished an amphibious habitat, which tempted the increasingly large Sauriscian dinosaurs to forsake their ancient dwelling places and abandon the strenuous life of a carnivore for the slothful ease of an amphibious herbivore and their extinction in the later Comanchean may have been due in part at least to a restriction of their habitat. The cause of dinosaurian extinction at the close of the Mesozoic is yet unknown, but the fact that it was coeval with the worldwide Laramide revolution, which must have given rise to a far-reaching chain of results, gives evidence that here we have again a basic geologic cause. It cannot be doubted that the cause or causes of dinosaurian extinction were an indirect stimulus to the first great deployment of the archaic mammals after their age-long suppression during the Mesozoic. The archaic mammals, in turn, met their fate largely through the competition induced by the incursion of the modernized orders, and this again had for its prime cause the fluctuating climate in the north which drove the modernized hordes from their ancient radiation centers along the several continental radii to the south. It is not without the realm of possibility that the somewhat severer and more variable climatic conditions of their northern home stimulated the modernized mammals to higher evolutionary attainment than did the more equable habitat of the archaic forms. Increasing aridity during the Oligocene and Miocene due again to continental uplift, gave great impetus to the grasses, which now became the dominant floor of the temperate realms. The effect of this on mammalian life was far-reaching, as it caused the restriction and extinction of many browsing types and a wonderful deployment of the grazing forms, horses, camels, deer, and antelopes, which are so important a part of the earth's mammalian fauna today. Finally, we have the increasing elevation of late Miocene and Pliocene, especially in Central Asia, the culmination of the evolution of the various races of mammals which man has adopted as his fellow workers, the domestic animals. And not only were the wolves and cats, the cattle, buffalo, sheep, and goats, the horses and camels, and all the host of the friends of man here finally evolved, but man himself, as a response to the same series of geologic changes by which the others were brought to their final fruition. For variation in amount of moisture and increased cold in the Northland, with the consequent restriction of tropical forests, brought the primate south, and still further cold and aridity reduced to residual tree-clad areas the forests within which dwelt the pre-human. These areas were finally destroyed, or at any rate so changed in their old tropical prodigality, that the human precursor, as a means of preservation, descended from the trees and became man. Increasing severity of climate during the periods of glacial advance had a profound influence upon primal man, necessitating clothing and a search for and adaptation to diverse sorts of food. Man thus became, in a large measure, independent of climate, and this was his first conquest of the forces of nature, 
a conquest which has led to others so that now he has not only become the dominant form of animate creation but has subjected to his will many of the very forces which through long ages have stimulated his evolution thus time has wrought great changes in earth and sea and these changes acting directly or through climate have always found somewhere in the unending chain of living beings certain groups whose plasticity permitted their adaptation to the newly arising conditions the great heart of nature beats its throbbing stimulates the pulse of life and not until that heart is stilled forever will the rhythmic tide of evolution cease to flow end of part four epilogue recording by pamela Krantz. end of organic revolution by richard swan lull